Can you hear me, Mauro? Can you hear me through the broadcast? Through the broadcast? Hello, hello, testing one, two. Yeah? Yeah, I just got that. So how does it if I share my screen, what is what happens? If I do that, do you still see my my uh, headshot somewhere, or do you just see the PowerPoint? What do you see? I'll be one of the speakers, yeah. Testing testing one, two. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Do I louder or think okay? I think it's okay. You guys okay back there? Can you hear me in the back? Oh, 
Nice. I like your stick. It's cool. Yeah. <laughs> Looking back to like six and seven, when I was six and seven, and everyone had one of those little flip decks. So it should be uh, the most recent file on the uh, that one right there. Yeah, that's great. Right. You want to just you want to see it? Oh, oh sorry, no. sorry, Alex. Uh, just to make sure it works. Yep. Yeah, it's good. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Great. Thanks, okay. Kevin. Yep. For your 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 uh, for this time slot, the morning one. Which one is it? Is, is I renamed it to that. But, but did you upload a new version again last night or? Yeah. I, oh yeah, you renamed it to that, and I renamed it to yeah. Oh, there's an idea. The upload is looking sure. the, Yeah, the final. Yeah, that's the final one. That's the one I uploaded last night. We'll just uh, save it, and then you can look at it and tell me if it's right. Or not. Yeah, I saw you had uh, put the names with the slot uh, numbers. There were a couple that I had to follow the order to make sure we had the, I think, like, I think the afternoon one was number 10 or something like that. So. Um, Internet's pretty good, actually. We have a positive identification. Oh, it's over here. Here. Yep. Okay. Okay. I, re I adjusted all the stuff that was full screen for Dave. Thank you. And then does Sean have one after you? Does he have a deck that he's shown? 
like here or, or what? There's one that he's distributing. Uh, I I think he's just going right into the demo from his uh, from his laptop. Well, he if he's doing that. He, he needs to have an RGB cable or VGA cable. Here.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started in a few minutes, so if you can make your way to uh, this side of the room, which is where the uh, presentations are going to be occurring. And also, I noticed nobody's sitting in the front row, which is a problem because the screen is small. So if we can have some people sitting in the front. That would be great. Thank you. 
Okay, good morning, everyone. I think that was a couple of minutes, fair warning. If we could have the uh, everyone uh, take their seats and find somewhere to sit on, the, on this side of the room, that would be great. So uh, just quickly, so my name is uh, Kevin Jones. I'm the Director of Marketing here at PCI Geomatics, and it's a real pleasure uh, for all of us here at PCI to welcome you to our user group meeting uh, today here in Ottawa. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great uh, crowd that we have. I'm really pleased to see the turnout, um, the, uh, uh, the people that are here. I haven't had a chance to say hello to all of you. I've managed to say hello to a few of you. Um, but uh, we have a, a mix of uh, people from the uh, education sector, people from the government sector, a lot of different departments, um, Environment Canada, CCRS, uh, NRCAN, um, Parks, I think, is here as well. So there's quite a few different uh, uh, people from the, from the government sector. There's also a few people from the private sector uh, that are here. So it's a nice mix. And, uh, and really what, um, what I'd like to encourage you, as, as has been happening before I interrupted you to start the day, is to continue with the networking. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, good synergies um, in, in the room. So hopefully if, uh, if you see someone you don't know, don't be shy to go and introduce yourself. We're a small enough group. Hopefully you have a chance to uh, say hello to, uh, to everyone. Um, the, uh, the, the purpose of today is, is really to, uh, we have a few different goals. Um, one of the key goals that we have is to provide you, uh, PCI customers and partners, with an update on our technology and where we are as a company and where we're going. Uh, that's very important to, uh, to let you know where we are, where we're going. Um, we also, as I mentioned, uh, breaks set up throughout the day. We had breakfast together. We'll also be having lunch together. And really, this is meant to stimulate uh, some networking opportunities. So. Uh, we have quite a few people from PCI in the room. We have uh, probably over 10 people from our company that are here. Uh, we're, most of us are wearing these name badges uh, with, with the logo of the company on there. So uh, if you have any questions about anything and, and you're not sure um, who to go find, just find one of us and we'll point you in the right direction, whether it's a customer support issue or you have a question about a particular software package that you're interested in or anything like that, just find one of us and uh, we'll be happy to help you. Um, as I mentioned, we have people from our, uh, we have developers in the room, we have some uh, product marketing uh, staff in the room, some of our pre-sales people, so the people who are uh, experts in our technology and help customers uh, see if there's a fit with our technology, with the challenges that they're having or the, the business problems that they're trying to solve. 
Um, we have uh, uh, salespeople. So one one person I want to just point out because it's probably the most uh, uh, the person you should you should go to is your number one go to person in in this region of the world is uh, Freddie. So Freddie, if I can ask you to stand up. So Freddie Paya is our uh, regional account manager for uh, for the Americas, and uh, he heads up a team uh, that focuses on uh, helping you, our customers, to uh, find the right solutions to the business problem. So if you have any questions about, um, you know, different modules, kind of, you know, you want to set up a demo, you want to talk to uh, anybody at PCI, he's your primary focal point for this uh, this region. Thanks, Freddie. Um, just a few logistical items. So uh, I think by now you've uh, made your way into the room and you're, uh, you've seen our setup. So uh, this side of the room is for the presentation part and then the breakfast and the lunch is on the other side of the room. Um, so uh, there'll, be, uh, there'll be lunch coming in and then uh, we'll, we'll have uh, lunch on this side. Uh, the washrooms, if you haven't found them, are through the door, down the hallway and then sort of towards the back of the building. Uh, that's where the washrooms are. We have Wi-Fi, as you as you saw when you walked in. There's a there's a free Wi-Fi here, um, and um, yeah, we're glad to have you, and we look forward to spending the day with you. Um, so what I'll do now is I'll introduce our first speaker uh, of the day. So our um, our first speaker is uh, is our CEO. Uh, so Terry uh, Maloney uh, has been with uh, with uh, PCI for a number of years, and he's been our CEO for. A relatively short period of time, he uh, he became the CEO in 2010, um, and he has a long history with the company. He has been he was actually part of a company that was acquired by PCI quite a number of years ago called Tidac. For those of you who know the history of the geo space, you'll re you recognize that name, product called Spans. And um, uh, Terry has a, a rich set of experience in the in the geospatial business. He's uh, traveled around the world. He's met with all our customers around the world, and uh, he really offers a wealth of insight into um, in, into the geospatial business. So we're glad to have him as our CEO, and he's going to give you a quick overview on uh, where we are and where we're heading. So, Terry. Thanks, Kevin, and uh, let me welcome you as well. I've uh, only had a chance to get around to see a couple of you, but it's interesting to see people that have been around the industry longer than I am. So, Jeff, not to embarrass you, but Jeff Harris from uh, GSC. Um, it's uh, great to see old friends and uh, some new people. I just met Laurie, an uh, independent consultant here in the city, uh, doing a lot of interesting stuff uh, with Worldview 3 and other sensors uh, to solve real problems. and. Uh, so I'm here very quickly to, to welcome you, but also give you, as Kevin said, a little insight on and I on PCI. And I said, well, how am I gonna do this? So I thought, okay, well, I've only got 15 minutes. So it's gonna be the who, what, where, when, why, and how um, of PCI. And uh, some of you know us, you're longtime customers, uh, in the industry a long time. Some of you are relatively new, but so very quickly, I'm gonna take you through this. Um, so who are we? We're a bunch of uh, passionate people who uh, love to collaborate with you as our customers, uh, with each other, with in industry partners, and provide solutions. And through it all, uh, we're, integrity is at the soul of what we do. So people have often said, you know, who's PCI? Um, we're a bunch of guys that love this industry have been, if you look at PCI as a company, uh, Kevin was given away, but if you count the years I was with Tidak, it's been 28 years. Uh, I started as the seventh employee of uh, the small company, a startup called Tidak. I grew that company to about 135 people, then we were acquired, won't give you the whole history, about four times. Uh, and uh, as uh, Kevin referred to, unfortunately, Dr. Moses passed away uh, five and a half years ago, but we had a succession plan in place, so uh, here I am today, and we're having fun. And we hope that you're having fun, fun doing what you're doing and solving real world problems. Uh, it's an exciting technology. It's ever changing. It's, uh, it's real, and it applies in so many different ways. And I'm gonna talk about, I shouldn't talk too much about just the who, but 
uh, you know, PCI is a company that's been around for almost 35 years, a long legacy in Canada here, but very successful all over the world. And I'll talk more about that as well. So what do we do? Uh, and this is uh, Arnold Huffam, my uh, sales VP and uh, sales marketing VP. When people ask you, what's the elevator pitch? So what do we do? You know, as you know, if you know PCI, we, we create software products, platforms, and systems. So in the early days, it was just a desktop software. But as you know, over the last 10 to 15 years, we've developed some uh, fairly high-end uh, systems that uh, fully automate uh, processing from capture on a, whether it's on an international space station, uh, through work we're doing with Earthcast or regular uh, satellites or aerophotography or now uh, UAVs, capture that, bring it down into uh, and create uh, real data products that can be used to solve real world, world problems. So we have demanding customers all over the world. That's uh, some of you here locally, but uh, PCI does more than 80% of its business throughout the world. And we've installed the system in over about 150 countries around the world. And the idea is to create information rich data products that can be used for data analysis and uh, processing. So that's that simple elevator spit pitch that if you were to go um, many years ago, it was always hard to describe what imagery is and getting more from imagery. But ever since the advent of Google and Bing Maps and what have you, you can easily do it. Hey, you've seen that stuff on Google, Google Earth, Google Maps. We're the company that creates the imagery that would be the backbone of those systems. So where do we do it? As I just said, all over the world. Uh, as Kevin mentioned, I, I'm a, a guy that travels almost continuously. I'm leaving for China in a week and a half typically spend three to four weeks a year in China, but uh, you name a country and I've pretty well been there. Um, back in 2008, we had identified the BRICS as very important countries. That's Brazil, Russia, India, China, as well as uh, South Africa as growing markets. I can tell you we've done ex incredibly well in, in uh, India and China. We actually have an office set up in China with a number of people over there. Uh, India, we have an exclusive partner throughout the, uh, the whole uh, Indian subcontinent and surrounding small countries. So doing very, very well throughout the whole world and, and have a network of partners that help us do that. So when? Uh, obviously, we've been around a long time. Uh, we've evolved from, as I said, a desktop company into a, uh, a systems platform and desktop solutions um, and into the future. Um, it's getting more and more exciting. Uh, Lori asked a question just as we didn't get a chance, I didn't get a chance to answer it for her, but what are you doing with UAVs? But we are continuing to innovate. Innovation is our lifeblood. So uh, if we don't continue to innovate, we're dead. And so there isn't a sensor out there that PCI does not want to support. And I briefly touched on the fact that we worked uh, exclusively with uh, Earthcast to create the sensor model that was used on the International Space Station for the two cameras they have there. Um, you're going to be hearing later from Blackbridge. We work very closely with Blackbridge, uh, now called uh, Planet Labs, but even before that, they were called Iomcus Geomatics. We worked with them going back probably 15 years, developing, uh, working originally with Spot here in Canada, then the Rapid Eye Birds. But we work very closely with every sensor manufacturer uh, provider throughout the world. Uh, to provide best of breed sensor support to enable you to uh, get the best information that you can, that information rich data that you need to do analysis and modeling. So you can count on PCI. We've been around a long time and we've got a, a, a plans to be here well into the future. Uh, we're one of the, probably the only independent in, imagery companies in the world. We're privately held and the plan is to stay that way. How are we doing it? I briefly touched on this. Uh, as Kevin said, we've got a, a fantastic labor force, an employee base. Uh, get around, get to meet uh, those people. Uh, one other person that's very important to you here in Canada, uh, Kevin didn't mention, but uh, Deborah Panagopoulos, who, Deb, where are you? 
she loves to be uh, pointed out. Where are you, Deb? Stand up, Deb. There she is, right at the back. So Deb does all the uh, maintenance and support for your customers to make sure that you're up to date with our latest software. So Lori, that's another person you want to get to know um, to ensure that uh, you have our latest and greatest technology. But through the employees, you, our customers, uh, agents, resellers, and partners around the world. As you know, PCI is uh, doesn't work independently. Um, we sort of sit, and I'm not going to go into I don't time today, but in that kind of the middle of the value chain. So we work with people uh, creating the data through the sensor development, but we also work with people upstream, people like uh, ArcGIS creating uh, Esri, Esri Canada. Jay Terrell is here th uh, today. Um, so that we can provide solutions that go up and down the value chain uh, so that you can not only use uh, PCI technology for, you know, using it for whatever application you are within our uh, system, but integrate that uh, technology data results up and down that value chain very seamlessly uh, to other systems. And uh, you'll hear a lot today about how we've uh, enhanced the use of Python and other languages to create a a fully automated system that can uh, do have a workflow within PCI's uh, Geomatica and go directly into uh, ArcGIS or other uh, systems. So again, trying to create uh, a complete solution for your customer. Probably the most important question is why do we do it? And if anybody knows this industry, there's probably 50 to 60% of the world's uh, business in this uh, field is for defense security intelligence. I'd like to be able to provide a technology that enables people to create a planet that we can leave behind for our children and their children and into many generations into the future. And as you know, there's a lot of troubles throughout this world, but um, we wanna enable people to use our technology, get more value out of the technology, improve the use of the technology so that we can create that world that we always want to have. And how do we do that? We do that through you, by making you successful in, in your particular uh, individual responsibility and the job that you have. So that's why we're here. And uh, lastly, I'd just like to thank you. Um, because we're a privately held company, we don't sort of disclose uh, you know, our financials and those kinds of things, but I'm, I'm here to say that the graph, that little uh, diagram on the, on the right shows uh, the growth that we've had. And uh, just to give you some insight, over the last three years, we've grown 59% as a company worldwide. So that's thanks to uh, your great efforts and the, the efforts of all of our individual employees uh, and agents and resellers throughout the world. Uh, PCI is a very successful company it's doing very well, and we have plans to uh, be even more prosperous into the future. So that's my very quick who, what, where, when, why, and how. Um, you've got an exciting agenda for the day. I hope that uh, you take the time, as Kevin said, to during the break times and lunch time to network, uh, learn from each other, um, because there is so much uh, intelligence in this room here today that uh, we would like you to leave today with learning and knowing a lot more about how you can use our technology and leverage us as people uh, to be more effective in what you do. So thanks very much. Enjoy your day. All right, thanks, Terry. Our next presentation is going to uh, focus on uh, where we where we've been and, and sort of where we're going. So our next presenter is uh, David Pickney, and uh, David Pickney is our product marketing manager, and he is uh, the person that really leads up the uh, market requirements um, and brings that back to our team to understand how we can fit that on the roadmap to develop the next generation of software. So if you want to influence the roadmap, you talk to this guy. Thank you very much, Kevin. Right, so we've got a uh, 
kind of three parts to the presentation this morning. I'd like to bring everyone up to speed on what we've done over the past couple of years. I know we've got a pretty uh, uh, varied audience uh, today and uh, may focus on, uh, on one or two technologies, but we've, we've got pretty broad uh, offering uh, in a variety of different areas. So covering the major additions over the past three years and then following that, uh, bring everyone up to speed with the current release that we're coming out now. And then we'll invite our CTO, David Stanley, to come up and uh, he's gonna be talking about the exciting uh, things we're working on now, the innovations. Uh, I hope you can take away from the end of this uh, confidence that uh, we've got this very aggressive development and innovation schedule that we've been pursuing over the past two years. Uh, and. Hopefully this is uh, making everything uh, you know, better, exciting, and bringing more tools and more opportunities and making you think about more things that you can be doing uh, with the software and, uh, and in the geospatial community at large. So a quick review of some of the, uh, the additions that we do have. One, for instance, is the uh, atmospheric correction. So with uh, dynamic atmospheric modeling, here we've got a Landsat 8 image uh, where we've uh, removed the haze. It's just uh, swiping back and forth. You can see there's the haze image. Uh, through this automatic process. Um, we've got uh, spectral libraries that we're able to compare and model. So as you adjust your atmospheric parameters, you can, uh, you can actually apply this to other images and, uh, and for larger and larger projects more easily. Another area where we've uh, had major additions in the past couple of years has been mosaicing and color balancing. So what you're looking at here is a complete mosaic of Mexico, and this is uh, made up of over 25,000 uh, rapid eye images that were collected at five meter resolution. So the image selection, uh, the ortho mosaic kings was all completed by a single operator using the GXL system. Uh, and this is installed at uh, Canavios facilities in Mexico City. Uh, the system allowed the operator to choose the images that were the best match in terms of uh, cloud cover, uh, seasonal variation, and then put together uh, the best about 4,000 or so into this, uh, into this larger mosaic from the original uh, 25,000. The key here too is that this entire process could be iterated in about four hours. So anytime a new imagery came in, uh, the entire country could be regenerated in a very, very short time span by a single person. And that's the kind of power and innovation uh, that, uh, that we've been focusing on. Another area are high resolution digital elevation models. So bringing uh, more accuracy, more speed, and, uh, and better looking DEMs with, uh, with fewer errors means less editing time and uh, a smoother process overall. So this, of course, ties into orthomosaicing uh, and uh, elevation analysis itself, um, various applications. Uh, what we have here is a GOI2 image. And we started with a um, regular process in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, we'd get about a two meter DEM uh, accurately and, and reliably. And with the effort on the speed and the accuracy, we're now up to full one-to-one -one resolution. So from a high resolution satellite sensor, 50 centimeters in this case, we're able to extract that elevation at, uh, at the 50 centimeters. Another addition uh, that we've been focusing on over the past few years has been cloud processing. So this started with the geoimaging accelerator, which is our, our high uh, performance, high throughput system. We started with this, this raw imagery that you see here. Um, just as an example, you know, various swaths over a large area able to put this together into, again, national and, and regional mosaics, in this case for the entire globe. Uh, so we've got an uh, image here of over uh, almost 10,000 icono scenes at one, uh, one meter resolution. It's 15 terabytes of data. It's almost a million square kilometers. Um, we're able to do this uh, on a, every couple of weeks, generate a coverage of this magnitude uh, and eventually cover the entire globe. <coughs> So I'd like to focus now a little bit on the actual uh, the release that we're working on now. Uh, the current technologies, so this brings us up to date to about 2015. Now for 2016, what are we talking about? New sensors and new systems. Uh, Terry mentioned earlier uh, Earthcast. It's a company in Vancouver and they've put cameras on the International Space Station. Uh, PCI has been involved with uh, Earthcast to create both the sensor models and the processing workflow to be able to process this imagery. The camera you see here is called Iris. Uh, it's about as big as this uh, table that you see down here, and it's taking 4K video from outer space mounted to the space station. Uh, just off to the left on the image is a, um, is a scanner, uh, line scanner as well, a four band uh, push broom uh, sensor called uh, TEA. 
So with the PCI technology included in this processing workflow, Earthcast has won the Geospatial World uh, Technology Company of the Year Award for 2015. We're very honored and very proud to have been part of this collaboration. Uh, the innovation that went into this, uh, and this, the speed which we were able to uh, create this uh, technology and, uh, and help this company uh, succeed in the, in the market. Just a quick picture there. I like this one of the, of the space station itself. Probably better there. Uh, you can see the camera strut uh, highlighted down there at the bottom. It's the uh, Zvezda uh, resource module. Uh, kind of neat picture. Okay, uh, let's get into some of the actual technologies in the software. Compact Polarimetric SAR. We've got a dedicated presentation on this uh, in the afternoon. But what we see here is a Radar Sat 2 image. This is uh, from uh, the Ottawa area. Uh, we've got a Claude Potier decomposition on the left with a unsupervised classification on the right. So processing, analysis, classification of, uh, of compact polarimetric SAR data, as well as our uh, uh, non-compact polarimetric SAR data. Um, new updates, a lot of work put into this uh, area of research and into the product for, uh, for 2016. Another new addition is uh, the ADS, the Airborne Digital uh, scanner. So this uh, this airborne camera is a large part of the global market. Almost half of the camera systems in operation, or half the companies operating uh, with the, within the Air Florida market, are using uh, ADS uh, sensors. This is part of the uh, now part of Ortho Engine with new workflows. Uh, import of the data allows ortho rectification and mosaicing for uh, for this sensor. As Terry said, if there's a sensor out there, we want to support it. Uh, very broad use uh, for a variety of different markets so that you can uh, bring this information together, synthesize it, analyze it, and, and get the work done that you need. In addition to uh, the air photo sensors, a variety of new satellite sensors, uh, PCI is pretty well known for supporting new satellite sensors very quickly, uh, very accurately. There's a list of just a few of them here. I'll call out a few highlights, for instance, the uh, Resat 1, uh, is uh, PCI was the first uh, company to support the, the model for this uh, new sensor. Uh, we've got SAR sensors, we have optical sensors, um, and close collaboration with all of the uh, satellite companies themselves to ensure that the models are correct and, and we're getting this information uh, into the product quickly. So as I said, I wanted to try and focus on the, the momentum uh, that we've had during this uh, schedule. Since April of last year, uh, Counting up to April this year, we're going to have what, four or five uh, significant releases. We started uh, with Geomatica 2015. We had advances in all those areas that I showed earlier, uh, particularly the color bouncing methods and the new tools. Uh, in July, we released a major update, which had uh, very significant uh, speed and accuracy improvements in DEM extraction specifically. In September, uh, we launched uh, a new package called the Geomatica Developer uh, Edition. Uh, this is for people who want to experiment with Geomatica uh, outside of the, uh, the, the commercial license, perhaps for developing applications. We've got some more presentations on this uh, in the afternoon. We're pretty excited about that as well. Uh, and coming up next, very soon, Geomatica 2016 with, uh, with the additions that I've just shown you. Uh, leading into that, I mean, we're continuing this momentum as we move along. Uh, throughout 2016 and uh, and into the future with new innovations, new technologies, and uh, and those will go into the uh, the products that uh, that we have here. So, just as a quick recap, uh, again, I know we've got a, a wide audience here, uh, but the, most of you are probably using the uh, the professional edition of GXL or part of me of uh, Geomatica. So this is the desktop Geomatica uh, that you're all familiar with with various modules. In addition to that, we have a dedicated education package and education program. I know we've got a lot of uh, students here today as well. You're probably familiar with that. But there's a few more that uh, you're maybe not as familiar with, with and I'll just give you a, a quick overview of those. I mentioned the geoimaging accelerator. Uh, so the high performance computing, it's, it's highly automated. Uh, and as uh, example from that, uh, the Canabio mosaic, you can see a single operator can do uh, very, very large projects in very short amount of time. Um, we're getting into, uh, in this uh, uh, product, aspects of cloud architecture, um, data throughput, um, high volume processing, and being able to tackle these challenges that are outside of the, the pure spatial analysis where we bring the expertise of the uh, Geomatica uh, development already. 
We've got another product, uh, not sure if you're familiar with HAP. This is historical air photo processing. If you have archives of uh, scanned imagery, um, digitized, this could be in, in libraries, at universities, various uh, national mapping organizations. A lot of this imagery is, uh, is essentially rotting away. Uh, the film is decomposing. There's a limited time frame here to be able to get this, uh, uh, this fantastic historical imagery into the, uh, into the digital environment. And historical air photo processing, this HAP product, uh, allows uh, you to do that, again, with a high degree of automation and, and a lot of accuracy, given that uh, some of these images may not have uh, control sources or, or even uh, fiducial marks as we go back far enough. And finally, as I mentioned, the uh, Geomatica Developer Edition. So uh, a low, lower cost entry for developers specifically to be able to build and sell applications built on Geomatica and integrated with uh, other packages. Okay, so that brings us up to date uh, on the soon to be released Geomatica 2016. Uh, I'd like to provide you with some insight in our development activities. Uh, so everything that you see from this point forward uh, is uh, essentially in research mode. So release dates, release dates have not been set. These items may change uh, depending on the circumstances, but what we're showing you are the, are the big research topics, the big items that, uh, that we're working on. So with that disclaimer out of the way, I'd like to introduce our Chief Technology Officer, David Stanley, uh, to, uh, to talk about the future. Well, it's nice to be here, and thank you all for coming. Um, I head up the research team at PCI, uh, so the things that I'm talking about are going to be the bigger topics that we're working on. Not, you got to remember, there's go always going to be lots of little improvements all the way through the system. So these are just more or less the bigger picture items. Plus, there'll be lots of little things too. Um, PCI has a dedicated staff of about 40 full-time people working on product development. So we do have quite a, a resource base to work with. And uh, we also have 35 years of history in this particular business. So we kind of know what we're doing and we've been doing it for a long time. Uh, my team has, uh, is about eight or 10 people that are actually working on the sort of the deeper problems. And I have six PhDs there. I just want to point out that we have some depth here and we also have the uh, team to actually provide some momentum. So the bigger topics, one thing that we're working on uh, and you saw we had done a, a SAR package. We also have done recently polar metric SAR, then we did compact polar metric SAR. And now we're doing that last piece that has been missing out of the SAR processing, interferometric SAR. And uh, the interferometric SAR is going to be developed in such a way that you can do particular applications. I'll talk about one or two of those. But also, it's a, it, it's a, a whole bunch of PPFs that's available within our toolkit. So it's also fully possible to do research and development of different application areas within the SAR. And I'd like to point out here that John Wessels is our lead on this. And uh, he is here. If you stand up there, John. So there are some SAR people interested here. And please do talk to John. Interferometric SAR, well, there's an interferogram. And uh, you can see there, of course, that the planes or the wide bands and the valley with lots of uh, detail or uh, elevation changes are there. This is an example of some of the processing that we're doing within the research group right now. And uh, the real application area that we're hitting on this, in this release will be land subsidence. So that's the killer app for interferometric SAR. You can do lots of other things, but this is the one that we will have special tools and interfaces to support as well. Um, and you can see here, once again, some examples uh, of the, inter the base interferogram, the flat earth correction, and then the final analysis of the actual land movement. So interferometry is on its way. Another area that we're interested in, and this is more at the deeper little systems level, is uh, working with data stacks. We now have in this industry a uh, history, archives that go back 10, 15 years of satellite data. 
And there are things you can do when you have 100 images over the same area. But it is a lot of data, and it is not necessarily easy to manipulate and work with. So that, but there is information that can be extracted out there, uh, change detections, improvements to classification, for instance. And so we are working at the deeper level now to start trying to put in uh, tools and mechanisms within our software to more easily manipulate this type of data and the volume of data that we're talking about here too. For example, some of the things that we're looking at it just at the file level is the being able to well handle terabyte uh, individual files. Imagine you can have a mosaic that's you know four or five terabytes large, and then you may have a stack of these, and we should be able to handle them. And so we are doing that, plus better compression techniques within our software so that they uh, don't have to be done at just uh, particular output stages, but that during the processing that you can work well with uh, compressed data. Okay, so these are the deeper things. Another thing that we're working on, uh, and you've, we heard about DEM extraction, we want to be even better at it than we just were. So we haven't stopped the work on that area. And what I have here, for instance, is a DEM that was of a volcano in the South Pacific. Uh, this, and the next sequence of slides will show you a, a, a zooming in, progressively zoom ins. I want to point out here that the water here, if you take a look at the land, the water was edited to flatten it out, the, uh, the ocean. But the rest of the DEM was left exactly as is, no filtering, nothing. This is the product that comes out. And this is using the uh, new semi-global method. So we'll have two alternative methods for DEM extraction. Uh, both have their place, but the semi-global method gives even greater detail. So for instance, uh, there's our uh, DEM, or image. This is the DEM zoomed in a little further, and this is what we're getting now. Um, and this is at the pixel level. So you get to see here the detail that we can extract, and this is 35 centimeter resolution from space of the DEMs. And right here is the, whoops, go back there. That's the image at one to one resolution, 35 centimeter. And there's the DEM that we extracted from it. So if you flip back and forth a little bit, you can see that there's a real registration and the detail is really jumping out at you. Once again, unfiltered, research topic still, but should be out in the next year or so. Um, how do we apply that to Airphoto? Well, there is an example of a DEM from Airphoto, once again, at one-to-one -one resolution. This is seven and a half centimeter data. And uh, then you have the, uh, and you can start to see the details in all the buildings that are coming out. And there's the actual Airphoto. And it's always fun to drape the data on top of the DEM that you extracted. So here you actually have the example of the uh, imagery draped over the DEM that was generated. This is unfiltered, raw data, and you get to see how well it models on top of the buildings now that we actually are picking out all of the little features there, the dormers and the, uh, the uh, chimneys and everything are coming out. So DEM extraction, even better than what we have now, is on its way. What's really nice about this, for people who are interested in aerial photography, the quality of the DEMs that we can get, the detail that's coming out, will allow us to start looking at doing automated true ortho production. We'll actually be able to register and move the buildings into place because the building models are so good. We also aren't stopping our work on bundle adjustment, the modeling of sensors. It's very important to us to continue to be better and better at it and faster and more accurate. So we've been putting a lot of effort into this for the last five or six years, and we're putting even more in now. Uh, one of the bigger areas that we'll be looking at is improving our ability to collect GCPs and tie points because if we can get the tie points better and faster, and we're talking about 10 to 50 times faster than we're doing now, um, this is a big lead in to uh, point clouds. Okay, so it helps us in the classical modeling and it helps us looking at 
the UAV modeling. So um, you can see here then um, an example here of a bundle adjustment we were doing with UAV. I know a lot of people will ask about UAV and the answer is yes, we're playing with the UAV. We're adding it into our sensor modeling. Um, it's not coming out in this release, but we expect to have things in, in the future. And in fact, here is a DEM that we extracted from that, uh, that uh, UAV data set, right? So you can see here that we have the capabilities, but they're not, they're not fully commercial yet. Okay, it's coming. Another area that we've been look, looking at is a renewed emphasis on classification. I, you know, the last five or 10 years, we haven't put a lot of effort into the classification. We're putting effort into it again now. So we're looking at a bunch of new classifiers coming in. Um, the support vector machine, C5, random forest. We're looking at refreshing our neural net uh, capabilities and self-organizing maps. So all of these things are in, in the works. Don't guarantee they're coming out in the next six months, <laughs> but bits and pieces will be coming out over the next little while. Now I want to show you one thing that uh, up here is an example of some of the stuff that we've been doing. We implemented the support vector machine as a classifier. It's done. It didn't make it into the release coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, we, the research team did not finish it quite in time for them to allow to put it into the release. But we do have it and we are running it. So what we have here is an example of a very complicated or difficult data set. The data set we were running was a polarimetric decomposition. So polarimetric SAR data as input uh, and about 52 channels of uh, polarimetric uh, decompositions out. Then we used training data sets and we classified the image using the maximum likelihood technique on the left and the support vector machine on the right. Right. And what's really interesting, these are, in fact, I, I, when, when I got this one from the, um, uh, for my researchers, I said, no, 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 I need to have apples to apples comparison. This, this, doesn't be, this is meaningless. What's interesting about this is it is an apples to apples comparison. The same classes were used to train and the same colors were used. And you can see on the, on the right how much better with this difficult data set the support vector machine was working over the maximum likelihood classification. So a renewed emphasis on classification. Um, so over the next two years, you'll see some really interesting stuff coming out of PCI on that. And uh, those are the four biggest topics, and I'd like to thank you. Uh, by the way, I want to reemphasize one thing here is that these are research topics. They come when they come, and they may change. Um, and normally, we don't usually talk about what we're coming out with, but in this, this meeting, they asked me to just give you a hint of what we're working on. Thank you. Okay, thanks, David. Our next speaker is uh, Sean Malamed. Sean has been with PCI for as long as I have, because we started, I think, a week apart. Uh, so something like six years. And Sean is, uh, um, is, is an expert in all of our different technology, and he travels around the world, and he helps customers um, figure out if our technology can help solve their business problems that they're having. Um, so he's a great resource. And, and Sean is, uh, uh, has been teaching himself how to program. I, I have to admire his uh, tenacity and uh, willingness to learn, uh, I think for the last couple of years or so. And he's leading up internally our uh, efforts to uh, have our developer edition and all the documentation. So he's gonna be giving another talk later on. If you wanna talk about development stuff, uh, talk to Sean for sure. So I, I think I just grabbed this, oh, sorry. We did not test this before, so. I don't know if it's set up yet. Yeah. 
we, uh, we, we are setting up a spot on our website where you can download presentations. Uh, Mauro, who's at the back, is doing it kind of live. So if you just go to pcigeomatics.com slash UGM2016, you should get a digital version of the agenda with some links to the PowerPoints. So. Sorry about that. That looks like it's to reboot the machine. Um, why don't you start talking about your presentation and I'll <laughs> do that. Uh, I guess I could actually use this moment to just introduce myself. Uh, so my name is uh, Sean Malanda. I'm a technical uh, sales specialist or solution specialist with PCI. Uh, the reason we're doing this exchange of the computers is because I'm actually going to try to avoid using PowerPoint and show you some live demonstrations and actually begin playing with the software. So, in order to do that, I need to get my computer set up. Uh, I think we're good. Good. Windows 7, take a long time to boot up. The mic. Really appreciate you all bearing with me for uh, that slight technical glitch there. Uh, so my job here today is to basically give you an overview of some of the technology updates that we have coming into Geomatica 2016, as well as some of the work that we've done over the last year. Now I'm size in this particular presentation about the work that we've done on our ortho mosaic workflow, which includes DEM. And of course, uh, we have a presentation or a session later on that's dedicated on our SAR, uh, work that we've, we basically, or development that we've done in the last uh, last year or so. And then of course, at the end of the day, developer network capabilities and some of the new work we've done with Python and with uh, some of the resources that are going to become available for you. So, as mentioned, we have done a lot of work in the past year, year or two, and even before that, to continuing to develop our core technology. So our our, one of our primary offerings and one of the thing, uh, one of the aspects or facets of our uh, technology that continues to drive 
sales and that continues to be world class around the world is basically our ortho mosaic and workflow. So I'm going to show you the bits and pieces of this workflow that we have updated and actually show you some of the live, uh, with live demonstrations, some of the new capabilities that we have coming out into this technology in the upcoming Geomatic 2016 release. So as mentioned, in the last 12 months, we've done a lot of work, a lot of emphasis on these particular areas. And the specific areas of this workflow that we've touched on is actually quite significant. So you can see that we've done a lot of work. We're continuously developing our GCP and bundle, uh, bundle adjustment capabilities. We have uh, done a lot of work on our DEM extraction, as David uh, Stanley and David Pickney have both shown you. Uh, we're continuing to develop this. So I'm going to show you what is currently available in our technology as of Geomatica 2016. And then, of course, we have a lot more exciting capabilities and future development uh, coming up down the road. And then I'm going to finish off with some live demonstrations of our new auto mosaicing capabilities. We have a new color balancing capability that was released in uh, Geomatica 2015. I'm going to emphasize and also demonstrate some of those capabilities, show you a gallery, and then show you some of the new mosaic editing tools that are coming out in uh, 2016, which are actually it's, uh, quite exciting to, uh, to show you these things. So I just want to begin by touching on some of the arrow triangulation or some of the GCP and bundle adjustment capabilities that we've added. And then I promise I'll go through this relatively quickly, and then I'm going to get to the live demonstrations with the uh, more visual aspects of the workflow. So as mentioned, one of the areas that we've been really continuing to work towards is to create a complete arrow triangulation package uh, where we can support a variety of unstable sensors such as UAV and uh, non-metric aerial sensors. So this is an area that we're continuously driving towards and in this 2016 release we've made some additional progress towards this and are releasing some new features. So in Ortho Engine, we have the ability, this was added in 2015, is the ability to automatically collect stereo ground control points. So this is quite useful for obviously for UAV, for air photo projects where before a user would be required to manually add uh, ground control points and then uh, automatically or manually add them to all of the different images that might overlap a particular region. So one of the things that we've done is with the auto stereo GCP collection is if you are working with uh, multi-temporal data or you're collecting over the same site on multiple occasions, you can use your previous data that you've collected as a ground uh, reference source and run it through our automatic GCP collection to get better convergence, create a better bundle overall with the automatic stereo ground control point collection. Also in 2015, we improved the tie point collection both the quality and the speed. So we now, from a quality perspective, we get deeper tie point arrays. So for the most part, we're, we're in the past, we might have been successful on collecting between two or three images. We're now getting much deeper arrays within the tie points and areas of overlap, which in the end create a much more, uh, much stronger, much, uh, much more stable uh, model. I'm not going to go through all this uh, capabilities, but these are some of the new things that we've added in 2016. Uh, so we have the ability to do enforced fitting. This basically means that we can work within, if you have GCPs collected and tie points collected, when you perform your bundle adjustment, you can choose whether you want to include the GCPs or not. So it allows you to be a little bit more uh, flexible with how you perform your model in terms of either if you're doing testing or if you just want to see the quality of your GCPs. And it helps you identify where some issues or where some problems in your model maybe uh, might be introduced. So we also have improved tie point distribution. So whereas previously we would collect tie points uh, perhaps between all the different overlapping images, we might get a lot of redundant tie points between these images because we don't either have deep arrays or because we just weren't taking the previous tie points into account. So now we're able to do that so we can collect less tie points, which means faster processing. And we have much uh, deeper arrays, as I mentioned, so we get overall uh, better models in the end with less tie points to have to refine, which for two things makes it faster and makes it a more reliable model. Now, this screen capture probably doesn't show off very well there, but basically uh, we have the ability, so one of the aspects that has been requested by our customers 
is to show the XYZ residuals as well as the biases and the standard deviation. So we now report this directly in our error, uh, residual errors uh, handling within OrthoEngine. We also have improved uh, reporting statistical reporting capabilities. So this, uh, this will give users more information and help make better judgments, better decisions going forward. So these are all incremental steps towards creating, towards our, our goal of creating a full error triangulation uh, capability within GeoGebra. <coughs> Another nice little feature, now this is something that I personally really, uh, really like, is every once in a while you get an image in a project that you just, it's either it's not working or there might be a problem with the image and it's nice to just deactivate it from the model. Well, now in the past you had to completely remove it from the project. Now we have a simple toggle where you can just turn it off so it just ignores it in the project. So that's a, a very simple but also a very useful feature that's been added. And also now we're providing better flight line information. So we have, when we import the EO, it'll actually calculate the flight lines uh, from the EO information based on the GPS as well as the image scene sensors. And it gives you the user the ability to configure sort of the break angle at what point a new flight line would be established. So this is just a breakdown a table of basically where we're currently at, the progress, progress we've made since we've uh, created a project or dedicated ourselves towards AT uh, capabilities. So in 2014, you can see that we had very limited capabilities. This is basically what we had also previous to 2014. We've added some additional capabilities in 2015. We've now further improved some of those additional capabilities and added a few new ones. And obviously with our partner Bingo, we have a full AT package offering. But our goal, of course, is to continue working down this list and in future releases, provide, get to the point of a full AT package. Okay, so now I'm gonna get to the point where I'm gonna begin to break away from PowerPoint. I know we've probably had a little too far. So I'm gonna give us all a break here. So I'm gonna show us, I'm gonna show this room some of the DEM updates that have made it into the Geomatica 2016, as well as some of the capabilities that are with some, or some of the tools that we have, some of the interactive tools that we have added in previous releases and further refined in the last couple of uh, releases. So going back to our workflow, we can see one of the other areas that we've addressed uh, in both 2015 SP1 and 2016 is our DEM extraction and DEM editing capabilities, so this particular module of the workflow. So one of the things that we can note is that we have significantly improved the quality of our DEM extraction, especially since Geomatica 2015. So you will notice a marked improvement from Geomatica 2015 versus the SP1, uh, Geomatica 2015 Service Pack 1. And we've even further improved the quality in Geomatica 2016, and this release coming up. So we have improved correlation, so fewer blenders and failed areas, sharper edges, so more detailed. We have better handling of rapid changes, new smoothing filters, and then we have improved merging of tri-stereo DEMs, and one of the areas I'm going to show you is handling low contrast imagery, so snow cover and sand cover, where we have very little contrast for correlations. We are getting very high quality, high detailed digital elevation models out of these regions. So just to show you some of the results and some of the improvements we've made, if you look here, this was a DEM, DSM that we would have extracted from Tri-Stereo Pleiades imagery with our previous algorithm. That when it came out in Geomatica 2015. And as of the Service Pack 1 release, we're now able to create this. So if we just look back and forth between the two, you can see that in this region here, there was much more noise. We've now smoothed in those areas. We have more detail on the, these specific features here. And then you can also see this in the building regions. We have more structure and detail in the buildings. Keeping in mind this is satellite imagery, not aerial. You can see in the previous one, we had a lot of failed areas and lack structure in these regions. We now get a lot more detail. We can actually see detail on the roofs of the buildings. We have a lot more structure and a lot less failed regions here. So this is some of the quality improvements you're gonna be able to expect and see in Geomatica 2016. Here's another example. Now this one's already been shown previously. This was the 
DEM that we would have extracted in our previous, in say 2014 or 2015, then as of the Service Pack 1 release or Geomatica 2016, we're now able to extract this. And as David Stanley showed you in his presentation, it's even further improved, or we have further improvements that we're working on towards the future. Another area of improvement with our DEM is the speed improvements. So one of the things that we've focused a lot on is not only being able to extract a higher detail and more accurate digital elevation models, but it's also to make sure that we can do it faster. So we've got a marked improvement in the extraction process and the, and the actual extraction time of about four to three times for whether you're working with uh, smaller frames, air photos, or much larger data sets such as high resolution satellite imagery. So I can actually tell you recently I worked with a spot, uh, spot six tri-stereo uh, scene where on our old algorithm it was taking approximately uh, 12 to 13 hours to generate the DSM at full resolution. When I worked with the new algorithm or the new capability, we got that down to less than two hours. So significant uh, performance improvements in this, uh, in this area. So what I want to do now is I want to just spend some time to show you some actual DEM results. And then I'm going to, act, and then I'm going to show you some of our capabilities with our uh, live DM editing tool and how you can actually apply this to uh, various analytical applications as well. <coughs> the first one I'm going to open up is uh, Greenland. It's extracted from Worldview 2 data. So why I find this one particularly interesting is obviously because of the snowfall or the snow cover of the region. So if we look at the area, it's a bit panchromatic, but it's snow anyway, so it might as well be colored. So you can see the region that we have here. You can see the dimples in the snow. You can see that this would be a very challenging area to extract uh, or make correlations automatically from. Now with our DEM extraction, the new DEM extraction algorithm, this is the quality of the DEM that we're extracting. For some work that we've done recently, Actually, there are new ones to work on the shadow areas, but overall you can see that even with very limited contrast and very limited uh, uh, radiometric information, we can get a lot of detailed information. And then the other beautiful thing about this is that we're also extracting these DEMs significantly faster too. So this one's an interesting one as well. This is the uh, air photo, high resolution air photo. So Dave Stanley showed a few uh, screen captures of this area. I'm gonna just take you on a bit of a tour around. So this is also done with the current DSM extraction capabilities that we have coming out in Geomatica 2016. But you can see just by toggling back and forth the detail that we're getting, we're getting sharper edges now. Even in the, uh, there's actually been some, this is actually generated with the 2015 SP1 version. So in 2016, we're actually getting even, uh, even better results as of now. So just some very exciting capabilities. And then this is like obviously, and when I mentioned that this is the core technology, it's because a lot of this information, the deriving this information and accurately is essential to doing a variety of different analytical operations. Uh, moving forward, whether it's simply creating orthorectified images or whether it's doing a three-dimensional classification or three-dimensional change detection. So there's a lot of different capabilities here um, that you can build upon with these, with these layers. So it's, a, it's absolutely important and imperative that we continue to develop and improve this technology. So later on, if uh, you're interested and you want to see some other examples and you want to come up, up close and actually see them on a, on a proper screen, uh, you can see me during lunch or any of the networking breaks. I'd be happy to show you. I have more examples to show, but we need to move on. And I want to show you a live application uh, with our one of our tools known as the Live DEM Editor. <laughs> So 
So what I'm doing now is I'm opening up a digital surface model that we've extracted from a high-resolution air photo imagery. And I want to show you a technique that if you've been to some of our webinars, you might have seen this, a similar technique. But we've just basically been refining it. So I want to show you how we can semi-automatically, very quickly, extract the outlines of stockpiles using this tool called Smart Geofill, or sorry, the Live DEM Editor. So this is our area of interest. We have a variety of stockpiles that we've extracted from, uh, as mentioned, from aerial imagery. And we want to quickly and accurately outline these, uh, these stockpiles so we can do, say, volumetric calculations on them or a variety of other tasks. So the Smart Geofill, or sorry, the Live DEM Editor is a very advanced tool that allows us to do a variety of uh, important tasks. So the first task I'm going to show you is just we want to detect the accuracy of this DEM. So before we're going to go and extract these stockpiles, it's important to make sure that the digital surface model that we've extracted is accurate. So I'm going to just draw a region of interest over an area. And what we're doing is we're drawing or we're orthorectifying on the fly the pixels that I've outlined with that bounding box. We're doing this for all the different images that cover that area. And what this allows, and what this allows us to do is, by orthorectifying it using the current elevation information in this DSM, it allows us to compare the stereo imagery, or the different orthos, from different viewing geometries or different vantage points to make sure that they have that they have sub pixel accuracy or that they line up nearly perfectly. So just to give you an example, if I were to edit this area and make a blunder, say we're just to simply flatten this area. If I draw my one-to-one -one window over it, there's an inaccuracy where you're going to see the shift. So this very quickly gives a visual idea of the accuracy of your digital surface model. Now obviously I can undo that change. We can go back to our window. We're going to regenerate the orthos on the fly, which based on the new information in here, and then when we flicker back and forth, you can see that it's completely stable, which gives us the information, gives us the insight that this is an accurate digital surface model. So now we can go and begin exploiting this tool to begin to do some analysis. So just get rid of this polygon. I'm going to now draw a polygon that outlines my area of interest. So I can very quickly extract all these stockpiles with just a few quick operations. Before I do that, I actually want to take make a copy of this because I want the original one <coughs> to still be valid. So I'm going to use this tool. I'm going to, we have a variety of different filters here. So this tool is wonderful for if you want to filter out digital surface models and convert them to digital terrain models. We have a variety of different operations that you can choose from. In this particular case, I'm going to choose the terrain filter flat. I'm going to set my filter size to 250 pixels. My gradients I'll keep as is. And I'm just going to click Apply. So just take a few seconds. So we've already filtered out most of the features here while retaining the actual ground. And I'm going to do another one. OK, I'm pretty happy with this overall. And then we can even go and be a little bit more specific. So say we see a particular area that we just want to filter out a little bit more. We can generate this. We have some other operations in here. For example, remove bumps. So I'm going to just go apply here. 
you know, quite a number of times until it's flat and dead open. So now with that being done, I'm going to save this uh, save this result. So now I have my area, my DSM with filtered out stockpiles. Start a new. So now I'm going to load that one with the copied result. So you can see that if we compare the two, so you got the one with the filtered out stockpiles and the DSM with the filtered stockpiles. So now we go to our analysis tool, change detection. I'm going to choose the image with the stockpiles. I'm going to make sure I choose just the digital surface model layer or channel. I'm going to choose the image with the filtered out stockpiles and also make sure I'm just choosing the digital surface model. We're going to do a simple difference. And now we're going to extract the height differences of these stockpiles and then perform the final operation which is to extract them as vectors, as polygons. <coughs> Going to go to Algorithm Librarian. You'll find my XPLORAS. This is one of my favorite extraction algorithms that we have. I'm going to choose the layer that's in memory right now, the change layer. I'm going to set my threshold minimum. So this is the minimum area that we want. So just to avoid having a little bit of noise, I'm going to set it to 35 centimeters. And that minimum area will just create as 500 pixels. So I think this is 10 centimeter resolution. So that's about 50 meter area. And we'll let this run. So relatively quickly, we should get our polygons surrounding this region. Do it. You can see that we very quickly have extracted polygons around our stockpiles and with some good detail too. And then we have further tools that if you want to further refine them, so sometimes you might get certain stockpiles that blend into each other. So we have some very simple vector editing tools, for example, the split here where I can just simply close this off. And now I have two separate stockpiles. And then we can take it into a further workflow, either through Python or however you may wish to do it. We have some statistical tools that you can do it with as well and begin to calculate the volume under these stockpiles with this information. So these are just some very quick tools and automated or semi-automated processes that you can begin to uh, consider using. And the live DM editing, while its main purpose was to convert a digital surface model to a digital terrain model in a uh, and a very uh, efficient and high quality uh, workflow, it's also very valuable for a variety of volumetric and anal analytical operations using digital surface models. So just to basically end on the digital surface model concept is that we have improved quality of our digital surface models. We have faster extraction times. We have very high quality tools for doing filtering. And we have a variety of analytical operations that you can use in order to get your final results. So this is going to bring me now to my final aspect of this workflow, which is some of the updates in our mosaic capabilities. So this is another area that actually David Stanley's team has worked very hard on in order to create a much more or a high quality automated color balancing for high quality uh, for high quality mosaic results and better automation, as well as tools that allow us, interactive tools that allow us to go in and improve the results of the, uh, of the mosaic if there are areas that require editing. So once again, this is another area, automatic mosaicing, as well as the mosaic editing and post-editing. These are some areas that we've done significant enhancements to within the last, uh, within the last year. So we have a new color balancing algorithm that was released in GMATIC in 2015. So I just want to quickly show you some of the results. Just a quick gallery of uh, results that we've been getting from this. I don't know what the quality of that uh, monitor is. Unfortunately, when we're showing dynamics of color and we're showing results, obviously you want to have a good monitor to explain to show it. 
So right here, I'm uh, basically showing we have an air photo. So you can see within the individual strips or the flight lines, you can see that they're relatively well balanced, but then you get this sort of ramping effect as you go from one side to the next. So to, uh, the new color balancing algorithm that's uh, been developed handles this quite well. We have much better results in water. We handle the ramping, we have decent blending as well. So you can see the significant improvements where the seam lines are essentially removed. And then obviously when we go into like satellite imagery, same thing, these are the different orbital tracks. Obviously we have good color balancing and radiometric uh, similarities between the images within a particular track. But then between the different orbital tracks, we have very poor balancing. So this is the mosaic that was generated with color balancing set to none. And then when we compare it to our color balance, or the bundle method, you can see that right out of the box, we get a significantly better result. And I need to emphasize for these uh, examples here, I have not done any manual editing to these. are just purely the results out of the box from the, uh, from the new algorithm. So this is one of Canada, obviously, we're all familiar with this country. So we have a, it's a, it's a relatively uh, dynamic land cover, challenging land cover with snow, with uh, water, with barren areas, with vegetation. So as you can imagine, the challenges of color balancing this, so right out of the color balancing, or right out of the, uh, uh, the new color balancing algorithm, this is, this is what we get. Not perfect in all areas, but it gives you a much better starting point so that you can really minimize the editing that you need to perform. And just a few other quick examples. So we have this one with uh, rapid eye imagery over North Korea. This is before and after. So one of the things, not only are we getting better color balancing results, but we're also maintaining the natural fidelity of the images, the color themselves, uh, with a uh, better than we were ever able to do before. And I want to just quickly delve into just a high level explanation of what this new color balancing algorithm does and how it compares to our previous uh, methodologies. So let's first take a look at a traditional color balancing approach. So what we would generally do is we would use a single set of coefficients to calculate what we need to adjust for the gain and for the bias for each image. And we would adjust those, we would calculate them for each image and we would adjust them as a, uh, for the entire image as a whole. And what this often produced was, in some cases, very high quality results, but as we got into very challenging uh, projects, we'd often get this sort of checkerboard approach result, where to some of the images, because of seasonality, uh, seasonal variations, or uh, atmospheric constituents that might be in the images, we often were not able to completely color balance them with uh, and, and avoid or remove the seam lines and, and maintain the natural color fidelity. So the new color balancing approach, which is called bundle, and this is because we've sort of stolen some concepts from the bundle adjustment uh, approach uh, with, within airflow or within uh, photogrammetry. So this was also developed and is a brainchild of uh, our R&D team. <coughs> So it consists of two major steps. We have a coarse balancing step and then a local balancing step where we begin to fix and do a more aggressive uh, balance along the edges of the image. So the first thing we do is we, similar to the traditional approach, we calculate these global coefficients for the images based on the entire area. And we do a very coarse correction, but we're also maintaining the global mean and sigma of these images, or of the whole project rather, so that we are able to maintain to the best of our ability the natural fidelity or the natural color of the images because we don't want to overbalance the images to make sure that we have no seam lines and remove the natural appearance of the imagery. So then the next step, which is a very innovative step, is we automatically add these dodging points along the, along the, uh, the cut lines and we begin to do a more not necessarily aggressive, but we do another balancing step to make sure that we color balance the individual cut lines to their neighboring images and blend it into the rest of the image. So that way we're able to remove the seam lines better than we were ever able to before, as well as preserve the natural color. So if we have to do a more aggressive adjustment along the seam line, 
well, it's going to be a little bit more localized and therefore in a blend in and it will not affect the entire image. And this all leads into some of the new automated tools that we also have for doing uh, manual color interactive uh, mosaic editing. So this will lead to my last and final demonstration, a very quick one. <coughs> So I'm going to bring up this tool called the Mosaic tool. The same capabilities are available in Ortho Engine. I'm going to load a simple project, but this is effective in showing you the kind of edits and how these new tools work. So we have here a set of rapid eye images over Spain that we were performed through our uh, through the mosaicing. There's a lot of water in the scene. Without using a water mask, we got a bit of an over-adjustment on this image. Now, the first concept that I want to show you is, now this is a common issue that happened with our tools previous to these dodging points being added. So, for example, if you had this image here, and you wanted, you wanted to adjust it with this image, but say, for example, you wanted to adjust this image and you want to make sure that you do not make a mistake or that you do not uh, worsen this uh, seam line, because perhaps this seam line over here is already quite accurate or well balanced, but you want to adjust it along this seam line without negatively affecting this one. Sorry, that's the wording I was looking for. So what we can do with these dodging points, as you can see, there's already one that's adjusted, that's added. So this was added in 2015 release. So we can grab these dodging points and we can manually adjust, say, the color of this area, the brightness and the color. And as we adjust this, you can see that it blends. So it's not going to go over and affect this other cut line over here. Now, with these tools that were added, Previously, we were able to adjust the brightness of the channel or the brightness of the image overall or of individual channels, and you could do a good job to get a nice balance on that, but it was a lot of work because it was pretty much uh, you have to play with it and it's a bit of a trial and error e effort. So, what we've added recently in this new release, which we're very excited about, is the ability for you to place a dodging point on the image and let it automatically calculate how it should be balanced. So we can go down to our dodging point here. We have the option to go auto match both sides or auto match single side. So say for example, I prefer move it back. So I want this image to look more like this one because it'll blend in well. So I can go to this image here, select it. I'm going to go to auto match single side, and I can just place my dodging point along this line. It's going to automatically match it and calculate it. And then, of course, I actually didn't really need to do that. I just wanted to show you what I could have just simply done. Is I could have just grabbed this single dodging point that's already there. It's automatically placed there. And I can click here, and you go to single side, and it should fix this entire area there. But if you want to go in and you want to be more specific, so say we zoom into this. I don't know if this edge is showing well on the screen, but you can see. Oh, yeah, you can see it. So you can see that while it did a good job overall, there's still some localized issues. So I can just grab another dodging point here, place it over there. And if you want to make sure that it selects this image. And we can just add more as we need to just get us that final result that we're looking for. If we get rid of that, you can see we have a seamless mosaic very quickly along the side. And we even have some abilities. It's got some improved abilities in water. Water, it's a little bit, uh, doesn't work all the time perfectly in water. But I'm just going to show you how it can also work. So I'm just going to. Go use surface. I'm going to play to place a dodging point here, 
in the land to act as a constraint. And then I'm going to go to uh, auto match single side and click on this image because I want to brighten up this image over here. And I'm just going to add a dodge and point in there. As you can see, it makes it much better. So we can continue to do that to just, and as I said, it doesn't always work uh, perfectly, but we've just very quickly, we've improved the seam along the water as well. So we can do that over here if we want. So then the same thing too, you want to just go here, go to use surface first to create a constraint so it doesn't blend into the land. Because it'll only now, if I add a new one, it's only going to correct it along the seam up to this point. And I'm also going to add a few floating points because I don't want it to go into the land over here as well. So I'm going to select this image. I'll just place a few along here just to prevent it from going into there. And then same thing. And let's change this back down to auto match single side. I'll just add one in here. Sometimes you can add a few. Very quickly, we just get a much better result. Okay, so that's some of the new tools. We also have the ability to manually adjust the contrast as well as the brightness and the dodging. So these are just some of the new capabilities that have been added. But I think uh, the thing I really, or the feature I really want you to take away from this is just these new automatic dodging point and the calculation of them. It just uh, just how much improvements this is, how many or the improvements that this can add to your overall mosaic workflow, and just getting out, uh, getting the final product out out the door faster. Now, the last and final thing before I finish my talk, because I believe I'm might be already two minutes over, is I just want to show you some of the improvements we make to our geofill. So the Smart Geofill is a tool that we can use. It's kind of like a Photoshop style tool that allows you to make uh, specific or localized uh, adjustments in your imagery, in your mosaic, to really fine tune it to the result that you want. So say for example, I'm going to show you this one capability where say we have a high resolution aerial image. If we adjust the lookup table, so apply a bit of an enhancement. Over the map here. So zoom out. I'm just going to apply a bit of an enhancement to it. Say we like, say this is a color that we like, and then we might get an area like this, which is overexposed, and we just want to clean this up a little bit. Well, I can go to my can add a vector layer here. Zoom back in. And then I'm going to just draw this vector layer, draw just around the area that we want to fix, including this house that's obviously too bright. And you go to my tools, Smart Geofill. I'm going to copy the pixels from the image. So I haven't, we haven't done anything yet. I'm going to go to our exposure correction, so this is new in the Smart Geofill. I'm going to go to end adjustment, so it's going to provide a localized exposure correction correction to that area. So if you look at what we did, so we'll just undo it quickly, you can see that looks like I draw it. So if we apply it one more time, you can see that we've improved the contrast in some of these high uh, exposed or overexposed areas, but we did not negatively affect these other areas. So, so you can see the areas that were already dark, we we're happy with the color previously, we did not affect those areas. So when I do this, and then when I paste it, so when I paste it in, it also applies a blending width. So when I move my vector, you really won't see any seams where you've made the edit. So this tool can be used for a variety of other things, whether removing clouds with other images, 
uh, improving anomalies that you find after you've created your mosaic that you just uh, that you might want to filter out, such as wobbles in buildings if you didn't properly remove the digital surface model. So this tool is very valuable as a post mosaic editing tool. So this is just a recap of some of the capabilities and additions that we've made to the ortho mosaic and workflow within uh, Geomatica for that you can look forward to in 2016. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, we're going to go for a break now, so uh, make sure you grab some coffee and a little snack, and uh, we'll reconvene in, uh, in 15 minutes. So I'll get up here and start making noise again when it's time to start. <laughs> Oh, we mean plug in the computer. No, oh, it's not. So, what about that angle? No, the tools are really fantastic. Uh, no, I'm moving back on uh, the weekend, so I'll be in Toronto on Monday. Are you going to be in Toronto as well? Okay, yeah. I'll be in Oh, it's good to see you again. Yeah, absolutely. How are you? I guess the dominance from Queen's University. Yeah, no, we've met the uh, Azure's. Uh, Where? In Halifax, yeah. Oh, Halifax, yeah. yes. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Could be. Yeah. Object oriented? Could be. Yeah. I've not been involved with the object oriented stuff. It's been more due to pick me and some other people. No, I mean, I think there is Could be. Probably yeah. was going to. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, I mean, I, I'm sorry. Mazur has been telling me a lot about your interaction, so yeah. thank you for being here. Yeah. Um, just the truc. Uh, yeah. Just on the end slide. Okay. Tu l'as déjà sur Facebook. Tu l'as t'as remplacé ou non, c'est juste que quelque... j'avais je marquais point d'interrogation fa. C'est tout de rebelier. Ma roue l'a enlevé parce qu'il va distribuer le truc. C'est sur, euh, sur Basecamp, ta présentation? Ok, laquelle? Je vais juste faire un refresh. Tu l'as remplacé? C'est la vieille version? Ok. Qui a enlevé la vieille version? Oui. C'est la slide 53 pour avoir la suite. 53. Tu es capable de, de rentrer tout ça dans une demi-heure? Oui, il y en a pas mal. C'est juste des images. Ouais. No. So, uh, je dis 10h40. Uh, 10h15, maybe. I'm going to make it so that I'm going to make
Il est où? Quand, quand c'est fini, je vais juste drop là, là, dans ce okay. Mais là, c'est où? Regarde, ben, regarde. Excuse. Pousse toi Si tu l'as même vérifié.
First person that spoke was David Pickey. He's a bit okay. younger. Okay. Second person is David Stanley. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. It's a good friend. Thank <laughs> you. 
So we're going to start in a few minutes, so if you could start to make your way back to the, uh, the presentation side of the room, please. Folks, if we can uh, make our way back to the uh, other side of the room, please, that would be fantastic. We could get going, try to respect the schedule. So we have a, we'll have some more chance to uh, network. We've got two more networking breaks. So there'll be the lunch, of course, and there'll also be a networking <laughs> break this afternoon. And you can wander over to some pubs down the road here after, even after the event. So hopefully that uh, continues. So uh, our next speaker is uh, is one of uh, what I consider to be our brain trust with respect to synthetic aperture radar. Uh, we have two people in, uh, in the room. So uh, John uh, Wessels, who uh, uh, was mentioned earlier by David Stanley and Gabriel Gosselin. Uh, both uh, John and Gabriel have uh, uh, a lot of expertise with radar, uh, a lot of uh, knowledge, and uh, and uh, have been uh, crucial in terms of uh, uh, keeping PCI at the at the forefront of developing radar technology. As you know, uh, Canada has a, a leading role and has had a leading role in terms of developing. Uh, radar technology with the uh, RadarSat uh, mission, RadarSat 2, and the RadarSat Constellation mission coming up next. And uh, John and, uh, and, and Gabriel have been critical in terms of making sure that our, te our technology is, uh, is, is as functional as possible, as easy to use as possible. And that's what Gabriel is going to walk you through. He's going to give you a, an overview on the latest and greatest and, and, and what's coming next with uh, compact polymetry and, and some other technology that we're working on. So, Gabriel. So, welcome everybody. Now I will do a presentation about the SAR development and SAR technology that we have in Geomatica. We have two primary goals. We really want to provide within Geomatica a complete set for SAR solution that includes workflows and that also includes uh, algorithm. And we really want also to stay on the state of the art uh, technology. So we always try to improve and make our algorithm more diverse. We also wish and we work hard into being a one-stop shop solution for all the SAR processing. And this is always an ongoing process. What we are doing, multi-sensor support, we support the georeferencing. We have lots of tools for radar grammetry. We also work in the radar calibration. And of course, one of the main strength, the polarimetry, and we have just introduced, and we'll talk at the end of this presentation about the compact polarimetry. And coming soon, we'll also have the INSAR technology to do lens subsidence and deformation maps. So we really want to have all those great tools inside our software. So within Geomatica, you can do all sorts of analysis. 
and one of the goals also is to promote the use of SAR technology. And we see there is more and more mission, more and more SAR satellite. And we really have to, to participate also to this, uh, to this adventure. And we also, we work hard into developing the algorithm, but we also work with the industry and the university in Canada. And we have had several partnerships also in the past with different universities. And that's can usually to pick apart their brain and we then translate their development into our software. So this is also a partnership. We have done a great deal of innovation over the over the, the decade, but we'll focus mainly on the on the last four or five years. What we have done so far is we have greatly improved the automatic extraction of GCPs for SAR sensors. Because we we have today to work with more and more imagery, so the automation part of the workflows is really important. So we also have implemented or improved the accuracy of the RP rectification. We'll have a couple of slides about that. And we have also introduced the SAR polarimetry target analysis. We have also introduced some new change detection technique. We have improved the, uh, the processing of quad pole imagery. We also keep going on improving SPTA, this, the target analysis tool. In 2014, we have improved and added the calibration to a lot of uh, sensors because with SAR, and especially if you want to do change detection analysis, the calibration of a good calibration is really important. And we always keep adding new function, like new classifier, new decomposition. When they are published, we, we scan the scientific literature, we scan papers, and when there is a, a really new and interesting algorithm, we do a feasibility analysis to know if there is a market for it, and also if this gave good result, and we implement it. And in 2016, we'll have also a lot of of new tools to work with. Compact polarimetric, like I've mentioned, there is new viewing capabilities that we'll talk about, and better DM extraction. And in the future, in a near future, we'll have the interferometry, and again, more tools, because this is always an ongoing development. What is the sensor data support and what kind of improvement we have made? Every year there is new sensor. Every year there is new satellite and new SAR satellite. So we always try to keep a list of sensor up to date. And in the last year and or the last year and a half, we have added the support for satellite like, like Sentinel-1, CompSat-5, uh, CompSat we have now a full support for the LS Pulsar 2 satellite, the Indian RISAT satellite. And we will start soon working on the RCM mission as soon as we will have test data. Our software is sensor agnostic in a sense that every sensor that we support, we can apply depending on the matrix type, of course, but we can apply a different kind of analysis and we can also do some cross sensor analysis so you're not tied to a particular sensor so for instance you can do a change detection based on terrace of x imagery or radar set to imagery and we'll see some examples we have worked very hard to improve the visualization of sorry imagery and one of the key features is this complex data support that i will introduce and that have been introduced in the 2014 version. What is the complex data support? It's a way to visualize the complex number of SAR imagery. So we interpret on the fly the SAR imagery. So the SAR imagery remaining complex if you look, if you're working with single looks complex data. 
And on the fly, you can change the interpretation of your imagery. So this allows you to have multiple copies of your of your data set, of, of your many data set. So you can do your processing on the background on your complex imagery, but you will you're able to visualize your imagery in different representation, intensity, amplitude, and magnitude. So this is really a flexible way to support the data. And we will have also a new view where we can display the magnitude and the phase. This will be more for the INSAR analysis part. And we are still and always improving the support of existing sensor. One good example I want to introduce quickly is the LS Pulsar one. This mission now ended in, I guess, in two, if I remember, in 2011. But there is a lot of ELAS Pulsar archive. So even if this mission is not flying anymore, we have still we have improved a lot the support of the ELAS Pulsar one imagery by adding the calibration and also by adding the support of the georeference. Because the archive are there, we know that our user really likes to work with free archive. There is a ton of data that can support your analysis. And this is also because LS Pulsar 2 is the continuity. So this allows you to do your analysis over a decade work of data. So we're also keep maintaining and improving the support of existing sensor. One of our strength regarding SAR, uh, regarding SAR processing is the arc rectification and radar grammetry. Before the SAR scientists were working mainly in a non coded environment. We were used to work a couple of years on the same image, trying to extract as much information as possible from uh, the same data set. But this is, we're not in those days anymore. We have to work with many data sets. We often have ground truth associated to your data. So the accuracy is really important. So there is a lot of improvement that have been made also about the accuracy of the auto rectification, about the automatic collection of, of GCPs, and also about the DM extraction from radar imagery. And we all we work also really hard to provide seamless workflows that can really automate the pre all the pre-processing steps so you can focus on your analysis and not spend time on just do all the pre-processing. And just an example about the auto rectification of SAR and all the sensor that comes with orbital models, we have a solution for those to provide a high accuracy auto rectification, sometimes without having to collect GCPs, sometimes with, with collecting few GCPs. Here is an example of a reference radar set to image and with a second image and there is a pixel shift. But with the automatic GCP collection, if they may share the same viewing geometry, it's really easy to reach a so pixel accuracy. And this technology is really important also, not only to get good quality uh, uh, auto-rectify imagery, but this, this, is, this was also really important in the <laughs> development of her INSAR technology, because you need this accuracy in order to get accurate interferograms and a good correlation. So one of the side benefits of the improvement of this technology, of the auto rectification, also of the matching, is that we're now able to extract a good quality DM out of, out of radar imagery. Here, this is an example that we have done over the Centurini Island in Greece. I wish I would have done the, the field work over there, but <laughs> I only processed the image, maybe next year. And here, with a pair of, with a pair of uh, stereo imagery, Reader Sat 2, we have been able to extract 
here a good digital elevation model. And of course, we have verified the accuracy of our model by doing transect, and we have compared the accuracy of our model with an Aster DM at 25 meter of resolution with also an SRTM DM. And we are pretty accurate in their model now. And another benef benefit of the auto rectification and on the complex data support that I really want to emphasize here, often during your workflows or during your work, there is always a question, should I have to rectify first my data and then proceed to the processing? Or should I process my data, get a bunch of results, and then auto rectify them? Now the purist among us, like I was, we will always say it's always better to, to process our data first and after that to do our auto rectification. But this gives the problem of you have after that to or to rectify or to geocode all your results. And this can be a really tedious process. But in some cases, when you are doing land classification or if you want to do mosaicing, it's we offer now the possibility to, to mosaic or to auto rectify the imagery in, uh, in the complex domain. And then you're still able to do your processing after. So that's mean that you can geocode your data only once, and after that, pr uh, proceed to all your analysis. And what is the impact of auto-rectifying your data first? What is, the, what is the impact on the accuracy of your result we'll get afterwards? Here, this is just a simple example that on your, on your left, you have a single looks reader set to image, and this is a boat. And the boat is around 200 meter wide. And what I did here in that case, I ingested the data, I applied a boxcar filter, and I applied a decomposition. So you see here the scattering type. And I did the same test, but by auto rectifying first the data on the two other, uh, on the two other images, and I applied the same filtering the same filter and then proceed to the decomposition and you can see that even from point target the difference between your the image that have been auto rectified first or after or minimal if you're already doing a fine or a detailed analysis of your data maybe it will be a good idea to auto rectify only at the end in those cases you can get rid of the pre-processing because of the complex data support that we offer and this is the same case for extended targets. So you can see that the impact of auto-rectifying opt first is, is minimal on the data. So we see not a lot of change. So basically, this complex data support in all the steps of your workflow in Geomatica, that allows you, for instance, of mosaicing your complex imagery and then to extract your parametric parameter, for instance. And this will avoid you to, to, to like auto rectify after that all your result independently with all the shift you can imagine if you're doing a manipulation error. So this is really to, to add flexibility. So, what kind of other tools we are offering? We we won't get. Uh, we I want to give you an example for every um, for every how can I say for every algorithm we have, and you can all I'll, after that look into the presentation and see what we have to offer. But we have a great set of tools, a lot of diversity, that goes from the pre-processing, the ingestion, the calibration, also for classification. And I will show some example of classification of star imagery, not with a super vector machine, but with specifically dedicated classification tools. There is many ways you can use to classify your star imagery in, in Geomatica. You can always use the conventional classifier if you're doing 
some thresholding of your image. For instance, if you're adapting your star imagery by filtering them heavily, you can always use conventional classifier, like the nearest neighbor uh, or the maximum likelihood classifier. But we have, we have developed tools for parametric imagery and for which the statical distribution of a classifier, for instance, the wish chart classification is adapted to the distribution of sorry imagery. So we have different, different uh, classifier that are supervised or unsupervised. And here, this is an example of unsupervised classification of one reader set to scene of the Lexapia area. And that kind of unsupervised classification give you a first approximation of the information content of your image in terms of backscattering mechanism. So you have your imagery that you have ingested, you, you have your decomposition parameters, in this case, the Cloud and Poitiers and the Freeman and Durban decomposition. And, but those decomposition are hard, are not your final result, of course, because you want to have, or you want to add a value with added information to those. And you can use the unsupervised wish chart classification to get the first approximation of your scattering type. And we can, we accept for this classifier many kind of decomposition. Here, this is two example with the Freeman and Durden and the Cloud and Pozzi decomposition. And of course, the scattering mechanism will change according to the date of acquisitions. And here, this is a higher resolution mm -hmm. example of an unsupervised with short classification. So you see, you can easily get a very good approximation of the scattering mechanism type. And the color code that we have used for the classes is entirely customizable. Another great tool that we have for SAR analysis in Geomatica is the SAR parametric target analysis tool. In Geomatica or in focus, the goal is to process or pre-process the entire image. But what if you want to do an in-depth or in-depth analysis of your of some area of interest? Normally, what you will have to do is to extract many different parametric parameters from different decomposition for all your image, draw a bitmap, extract all the statistics, but that takes time. So we have another ND tools called SPTA that allows you to load any imagery in complex format. And this is much more powerful when you have a fully parametric imagery. And on a single click, you can extract a lot of information about your image. Let's say the total power, the, the total power, the value of different decomposition parameters over a target. Here, this is the example of a ship. You can also extract the parametric signature of your of your object. But this tool is meant to do an analysis for targets, so for specific area of your imagery. And here, this is an example for a ship analysis when you can infer about the orientation of the ships and also about the structure. Another example of the usefulness of SPTA is we'll give an example here of a classification here, this is the Lac-Saint-Pierre area. We have seen this area a couple of times in our presentation. This is a place where I've done my PhD on. I have, in that, in that case, a lot of ground truth. Every square here represents an area of ground truth. So we can export from focus, uh, focus to SPTA. We can export the ground truth. And in the target manager, we'll have all the target listed. And what we can do in that case is for every target that represent a wetland classes, let's say, we can in a single click extract all the parametric properties of this particular target. So what is the goal here is to get rapidly and in a convenient way, an in-deep analysis of all the parametric properties. So you can build a really in-deep knowledge of the parametric behavior of your classes and really easily. And then you can translate this knowledge into rules and code them in using Python or using Geomatica and apply your, 
your classification. In that case, this is a rule-based classification that, that you can do. But because you have acquired the knowledge about each of your classes easily. Just an example of a change detection here. There is many workflows for which you can do a change detection analysis in Geomatica. Here, what I will show you is an incoherent change detection analysis based on the Wishart distribution. This is an algorithm called CCD Wish, and this algorithm will take two imagery acquired from different dates. And in that case, they don't have to be at the same resolution. Of course, closer that your imagery are in terms of viewing geometry, better it will be because you will detect real changes and not changes related to different viewing geometry. But this tool is a window base. You will extract what you have here, a change matrix that represent the change. So the area of change are bright and the area that don't represent change here are dark. And these two radar set to images have been acquired a month apart. But again, getting this change matrix is not the end of your workflow because you have now your, your change, but what can you do after that? The surprise. Now we'll just show you a quick example about how you can use the other tools of Geomatica in conjunction with your SAR analysis tools to, to get the final result. <clears throat> so you can threshold, of course, your, your change metric into, uh, into different array. Here, this is the histogram of change. And you have now your bitmaps that represent your area of change. You can threshold it for different values and then convert using different tools, you can convert your bitmap into vectors. And then you can filter your vectors based on size. And after that, for each vector that will represent an area of change, you can do an overlay analysis. And with this overlay analysis, you will collect many statistics from your imagery. And the statistics can, can come from a decomposition that will have applied on the same imagery from which we'll have done their change analysis. And after that in Geomatica, not only you will have detect your area of change representing by the polygons here, but with your tools, you can also interpret this change. Are those change bays are in power or are those change represent a more a change in a basket ring mechanism? <clears throat> and you can continue. And the last part of this presentation is about compact polarimetry. And I won't do a deep dive into compact polarimetry like I've done in the ASR conference, but just to show you the, some highlights about our new tools. <clears throat> Why compact polarimetry? <clears throat> this is mainly because one of the main limitation of full quad imagery is the SWAT width because we have to send a signal twice and we will receive twice a signal, the footprint of the imaginable area is limited. But for most application in natural resources, we need a large coverture. <clears throat> so compact polarimetry is a trade-off between dual pole and, and the quad pole imagery. <laughs> and we have developed those tools also because a lot of sensor in the near future will come with compact polarimetry capabilities. Like the, the existing RISAT satellite, this is from India, Pulsar 2, SAOCOM, and more important, the RCM mission that will be launched in December 2008. There is several workflows for compact pole imagery and quickly I will resume it in two big uh, workflows. In a research, from a research point of view, you can, you can be interested into using a fully quad, a full quad polarimetric imagery and then extract a polarimetric mode out of it. You can, after that, reconstruct a full quad imagery from your compact pole data set 
and then see what information you have lost in the process to prepare yourself for uh, the day when the compact pole satellite will be in orbit. But you can also want to explore what are the different compact pole mode and explore tools that have been specifically dedicated for processing of compact pole imagery. And we have developed tools for to cover all those situations. We, we have, for instance, uh, another thing called PS Compact that can generate the main compact pole mode. We have other tools that can generate any pair of coherent channels, so you can simulate all the compact pole mode you want. And we have developed also tools, PS Comdesk, PS or PS Comdeck, that are decomposition that are specifically dedicated for the, the compact pole imagery. And there is also another tool called PS Recons that allows you to reconstruct a compact pole image into a pseudo quad pole image. And here, this is to conclude this presentation. This is some example that we have. You have here a radar set to image over the Ottawa region. And here, this is the, sketch, the dominant scattering type extracted from the original full, uh, fully quad imagery. And here you have the scattering type extracted from different compact pole mode. Here the pi over four, the CTLR, or the DCP mode. And we have here another example for the cloud alpha, the scattering type. So depending on your compact pole uh, mode, like you have sometimes a lot of similarities and a lot are we can also have a lot of difference. In general, the agreement with the original quad pole image is really good. But of course, you always have to remember that a compact pole image does not contain as much information as your quad pole image, but you cover much more ground. And those difference you can observe between your, the original, let's say, parameters extracted from your uh, quad pole image from the compact pole image can be explained by different orientation from the line of sight, etc. And we have also different results. Here, this is a result from PS Comdesk. So this is uh, tools that are specifically dedicated for the processing of compact pole imagery. We are not here reconstructing the information. So we don't try to simulate a quad pole image. And now we can see that sometimes, depending on the different air, this is the scattering type, and depending on the compact pole mode you are using, CTLR, pi over four, DCP, you can have, you can be close from quad pole or a little bit apart. And we have a last tool that we want to present, PS Comdeck. This is uh, the composition that will emulate a little bit the Freeman and Durden decomposition. We can extract the double bound surface or volume fraction for all compact pole mode, DCP, CTLR, and pi over four. So we are ready for the compact pole analysis and for your same mission and for all the other sensor that are have compact pole abilities. So I would like to thank you for this, uh, to have assist for this like overview of our store capabilities. Thank you. I, I just realized that we haven't been very interactive. So I'd invite the audience to ask Gabriel any questions uh, so that we can all benefit from anything that you're curious about and, and, and what he can provide us in terms of clarification. Does anyone have any questions about what Gabriel presented? Should have prepared you before. Now you're prepared, so start being prepared for questions. Okay, thank you. Um, and the other thing too that I want to mention is uh, we are all of these presentations. We realize that audio visual isn't the best, uh, but if you have your laptop or your tablet or what have you, you can just head to PCIGematics.com/UGM2016, and all of the presentations that you're seeing here today are are live and they're available there right now. Uh, in the agenda format. Um, 
So our next uh, talk, I'm really excited now. So, so far, hopefully what we've done is we've given you a sense of uh, where we are, PCI, what technology we've developed, um, where we're going next in terms of our roadmap. Um, we, we'd like to turn our attention now to, to, to you, to the end users. And um, in preparation for this meeting, I reached out to a number of different people and uh, I'm really uh, excited and happy to, uh, um, to have some uh, people who use our software that will be presenting. So uh, we've got a few case studies coming up. The, the next one is on disaster response service, but from CCRS. And then we have one on uh, country scale mapping from uh, Blackbridge uh, slash planet. So those two users are using different parts of our technology. The first one is core Geomatica plus the developer aspect. And then the second one is our GXL, our large uh, volume production system that uh, David Pickney mentioned this morning. So I'd like to uh, say a few things about our next presenter. Um, Geneviève Marquis is the section head within the uh, disaster response group at uh, CCRS. And uh, Geneviève is going to be presenting on the disaster response tools that they have developed and that they use on an operational basis to provide information to end users, uh, mainly the uh, public safety, um, the Department of Public Safety within Canada. They leverage Greater Sat 2. They're also planning on leveraging RCM when it becomes available. Uh, these are operational tools that that are producing products uh, every day, or sorry, when when they're when they're being called up, they're operational tools depending on the emergency, and uh, it's it, hopefully you get a sense of what can be done in terms of extending Geomatica and and uh, uh, connecting it to other tools. Um, so I'd like to invite uh, Geneviève. So um, thank you everyone for your, well, thank you for your invitation for, yeah, is it the right, uh, all right, I'm not that, all right. Thank you for this invitation, uh, PCI, for uh, this opportunity to CGS. Aujourd'hui, je ferai cette présentation en anglais, mais n'hésitez pas, si vous avez des questions, à les poser en français, ça me fera plaisir de répondre. So uh, here's a PCI use case with the Emergency Geomatic Service providing satellite-derived information to the emergency management community. And I'm from NRCAN, uh, CCMU, Canada Centre for Mapping and Earth Observation. So the content of my presentation, very simple. What is EGS? How it works with PCI and EGS future state. So, um, what I would like to start with, it's something that happened many centuries ago. Many, many centuries ago, the uh, Italian cartographer wanted to depict on a chart, on map, the concept of Risco. We had so, at the Sala San Marco, so I'm practicing my Italian. So they wanted to, to, to have on a map the, for navigators the concept of a, a Risco. The Risco is a risk. So here we are in 2016, again, talking to people uh, doing earth observation for having the possibility to depict, have a depiction of a risk on a map. So a risk, the concept of a risk, the etymology of risk was not for, meant for uh, insurance company or was not for economists, it was for cartographer. So the EGS vision is using Earth observation to provide emergency mapping product and service, and in particular, to have a depiction of those risks. Obviously, now we, all, we don't do only a depiction of uh, sharp rocks under the water, we, but we have like a series of uh, risk or potential danger that we want to put on a map so we can make sound decision make, making. So what is EGS? Since 20, uh, 2006, the EGS team has provided emergency response mapping across Canada and has responded to international emergency mapping requests from the end. Primarily, we provide, we, what we do, we have um, two big streams. It's for floods and ice jam. 
So what's new this year, what we added, it's uh, an increased automation for floods. Uh, we are still conducting a pilot project for the ice condition in northern Ontario. And we also have another stream of activities for wildfires, but we're not using PCI for wildfires. So I'm not going to focus on that today. So we have, um, uh, well, we have two sites. One uh, site is located in Sherbrooke and another site is located in Ottawa at uh, the 560 Rochester, not far from here. Uh, the, the two sites, one is primarily for the operation for floods. So this is the Sherbrooke site and I have a team over there and I have another team in, in Ottawa as well for, uh, for ice. So we have one, one team all together, two location and one system. So here's my slide with box and arrow. In every slide, we find at least one with box and arrow, and this is one. So how it works, the governance of it, what's the beast? Okay, so it's located within an arcan, so this we know. We have two possibility to be activated. One possibility, like the first arrow is called a domestic, so for Canada requirements, from public safety, and the other arrow on the other side is the international. So what's in this big box? Maybe that's the piece, the portion that is a bit dry in my presentation, but I'd like to go back to basic and look at the Emergency Act. In the Emergency Act, the minister responsibilities include, and I will like tell you what it does include so we know like exactly what we have to do. It includes, it includes it at point four, section I, providing other than financial assistance to a province if the province requests it. Emergency Act point four, section K, participating in accordance with Canada's foreign relation policy in international emergency management activities. All right, this, we're, we'll, we'll do that and I'll, I'll show you how we do that. Emergency Act point four, section P, conducting research related to emergency management. And this is also what we do at CCRS. And Emergency Act point six, section three, and that's like, that explain the governance. A government institution may not respond to a provincial emergency unless the government of the province requests assistance or there's an agreement with the province that requires or permits the assistance. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that, for instance, a couple of days ago, there was the Gatineau River with uh, some uh, ice jam. Can we can we task our team to say, okay, we will do uh, imagery acquisition, we'll, perform, we'll develop uh, some map with uh, the, uh, this ice jam? No, we cannot do that because the, of the emergency act. This is not the communication channel. So the communication channel is whenever there is a flood or an ice jam or a emergency situation, the municipality will contact the provincial uh, department of uh, uh, safety security, and then the provincial. If then they cannot, if they cannot manage this situation or the incident, then they will contact public safety, and public safety then will contact me. When they contact me. I change boss. I like I have my boss. My boss is David Henry. So whenever I get a call from public safety, I switch boss. I go with I go with another boss. But uh, it's not too confusing. The boss is also called David. So I just switch. So we have like three possibility: ice jam, floods, wildfires. We all since we have to conduct research related to emergency management. We are. Uh, thinking about expanding um, other, other um, natural disaster other than ice jam floods and uh, wildfires. So how it works. So whenever I get an activation, so I drop everything and we have the team there, they drop all their floods and they, they are activated. So we don't, we don't do that every day. We have a, a, uh, a season, a peak season in the spring. So how it works is, uh, okay, the satellite is tasked, um, we have a, plan for that. So once the image is acquired, the um, then what will happen is the image is processed. So I put PCI here in magenta and the intelligence is extracted. It takes uh, four to six hours from reception of the image and to, uh, to produce and deliver the, uh, the final mapping to public safety.
I said public safety here. Most of the time, it's public safety. Four to six hours. Um, it could be much shorter than that. It, it really depends. But this is also our uh, kind of level of service, if uh, if we can say so. This is the, we have two recipe: one for river ice and one for floods. So how it works: PCI and radar sat imagery. So of course. A lot of things are going very well with PCI for, for our business. Obviously, it works. For instance, um, in the previous slide, I, you can see on the, on the poster that we have the river ice and the floods. But something of interest is it's the fact that the secret sauce in the ice breakup processing is the ice classification module developed by uh, Dr. Jos van der Senden. Okay, so there is a lot of history. My last point on this slide is, uh, is there is a long history with, between CCRS and PCI. In addition, many other CCRS scientists have contributed to this imagery processing software. In the previous uh, presentation, you had mentioned uh, Rida Tuzi, but also Thierry Toutain, uh, Bert Gaidon, to name a few. Like a lot of scientists from CCRS really contributed deeply with, with the, the, um, the, the software. So here's an overview of um, what happened over the, well, since 2006. We have one outliers, 2011. So um, the level of effort obviously varies from years to years. To, in the 2011, um, it was a, apparently a challenge. I wasn't there in 2011, so it was not. I was not part of this team in 2011. But um, I've been told that it was a challenging year with. Um, uh, natural like floods in three separate province and that year the team the team had to process a 226 radar set set image and for instance since the team is growing and since we have more and more um, possibility of being activated by the province and territories uh, we had developed a forecast and for this year in 2016 we are expecting processing something like 450 images so it just to say that it's it is growing the business is growing and now the um, the yellow bar here means that we included we started to include the all all the ice uh, breakup so how the EGIS products are used? Well, it's used to support public safety, as I mentioned. So at the public safety, they have a special office called the Government Operations Center, the GOC. So whenever the, the GOC requires the imagery, then we'll provide the imagery. Uh, it's used for real near real for near real time uh, emergency response, situational awareness, uh, local and ground decision. Because uh, you know at the GOC, when they get the the information. They also have an office for first responders. So they will have an office for the Red Cross. They will have an office for, you know, a community group uh, that are of concern for a specific uh, natural disaster. And we have other uh, international clients, like for instance, um, for the Red River and the uh, Suri River, we supported the US Fish and Wildlife uh, Service in uh, 2011. The US Army Corps of Engineer, the US Department of Homeland Security, NGA, and USGS and it's also being used in uh, in uh, media briefing as well and we have to provide like a regular updates whenever they, uh, they are uh, such event so here plenty some images this one I it's been chosen because it was um, on two it was crossing the border so radar set images often we need what we need is obviously several mosaic together it can provide a useful synoptic coverage that stretches Many hundreds of kilometers north and south following the satellite orbital path. Here on this slide, it shows an optic of uh, a capture of uh, four radar sat scenes mapping the flood over a 400 kilometers from, from Winnipeg across the border to the south, to North Dakota. So this is a, an example. Oh, this one is the, the one of the, from the last uh, peak season. 
So this one it was taken in um, St. John River. At one point, we were activated by the province of New Brunswick last, uh, last spring. So we had to produce uh, this map. And from this map, then we decided wh where exactly would uh, be the uh, evacuation first. So it's really being used to protect life and critical infrastructure. So at the beginning, the very first presenter, yeah, someone mentioned, that, hey, we'd like to hear about your success story. Well, you know, I'm, I'm kind of reluctant to say this is a success story because there's a lot of people who are living like great distress. They have to move. So, like some years we have to explain, okay, now it's time to evacuate an hospital. It's like there are many actions that are ta that, that being taken from those from this intelligence that we're providing to public safety. And it's not only a, a question of success story, it's really a question to protecting people and critical infrastructure. So I, I have this all this human aspect in mind and uh, it's, it's really important for me to, to make sure that when we send a product, we, it must be the most the fast, like most robust, faster, and uh, with with the most intelligent we can extract from it. And also, this is done with the support of PCR. So, for the icebreaker condition monitoring. So, for instance, um, here uh, I have two pictures, two pictures of different uh, ice uh, texture: the sheet ice cover, which is a smooth, and the rubble ice cover. So the ice cover products discriminate between water and three classes. Each for ice cover condition is identified as sheet ice or rubble ice. Sheet ice covers are characterized by smooth texture, where rubble ice cover covers have more rough texture. So curiously here I have the legend, but the map is on the next slide. So for the rubble ice, basically what I'm saying is the rubble ice that we have to watch. So we have smoother, rough texture rough texture, rough and rough texture for the rubble ice cover. So here's an example. What happened in uh, on Moose River, not far from Fort Albany. So in magenta here on, on this picture, you see, um, you see a, 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 a location, a segment of the river that is the rougher rough ice, that represent the rougher rough ice. So that means what? That means that there is a possibility, a great possibility of a, of a risk of a jam. And actually, if we look a little bit further where we see Musini, you'll see um, on the uh, on the map, on the image, sorry, you'll see, well, airports in this, uh, in this area are critical infrastructure. When we sent this information to public safety last spring, they called the Musini Airport and they said, now it's time to put your sand back. It's happening now. You will get flooded. It's happening. And with this information, they were in situation to change the flight schedule to make sure that those who needed to be evacuated, they had to do it right away. They had the, uh, the, just, just the time to protect the infrastructure. And uh, that was um, how the image and the intelligence was used in, um, in this situation. And now I would like, as a um, for my last portion, my last segment of my presentation, talk about the EGS future state. We have some projects that get some external funding. We have some projects also that are ongoing internally. So um, one of the projects that uh, for which we got an external funding from CSA, it's the one of the government-related uh, in initiative program, RIP. The purpose, of, the goal of this uh, project is to improve our algorithms, um, our methods to better target flood and ice jam. What we've done so far, uh, we've we accomplished uh, many components, but we have, um, for this particular project, we have put a contract in place with C Core and 4DM, and I believe that I've seen some of uh, potential, like some of the contractor in the in the audience. Um, that we are working on this project right now. So we have three segments for this project. So one, one component is to improve the flood polygon extension. A second component is to um, improve the, um, the algorithm for the water depth. And the third component is the algorithm for uh, the river ice. And when I say a CSA contribution, it's, it's also 
important to mention that NRCAN is putting on energy and effort as well in, in this project. So it's not only money that we use from CSA, it's a lot of uh, NRCAN and CCRS effort as well. Another project for which we get uh, external funding is the, uh, the DUAP, the Data Utilization and Application Plan. So the goal is really to make sure that our, our algorithm will be uh, it will be fit with the uh, RCM, so we have to test. Uh, we have to test it, uh, test the um, the RCM application, and make sure we are will be ready. For instance, uh, because of all the activities that took place and all the floods that happened uh, last uh, spring in um, in New Brunswick, this year what we did is uh, there was a team who went to install camera. Uh, on the uh, St. John River so we can get uh, this imagery and then we can improve uh, our algorithm in particular for the DUAP and get ready for RCM. We have many other uh, internal activities that are going on, like the, uh, we want to improve um, the imagery for urban, for flooded, uh, flooded vegetation, the geo-intelligence wildfire. I couldn't skip the federal geospatial platform, but I would like to conclude this presentation with this uh, project, the Volunteer Geographic Information Project. The Volunteer Geographic uh, Information, what is it exactly? It's, it's, it's to initiate or to make sure that we engage the people on site. So it's not only about imagery, it's about also the people. Uh, data acquisition from the people, data validation from from the people who are affected but impacted by this uh, the, those disasters. So this is truly changing the business of Earth observation for us, um, because now the sensors it's everyone with a cell phone. What we we got the money from public safety, some contribution from public safety to, in order to develop. Uh, this uh, project and in particular to support the mitigation aspect of it. This presentation mainly focused on the response aspect, but there's also the mitigation aspect that is really important to consider. And someone who's in the room today, Mr. Shoma, told me that in fact this is our big kahuna. So I was like, okay, what, what's the kahuna exactly? And I've been explained, I've been explained that the Kauna is something that is truly changing fundamentally the way the science is being generated, produced, engaging. So it's really important for me today to share this information with you. And my question back to you as a word of conclusion is what is your big Kauna in your business? How you will really deeply transform your business, how you will engage the people in your business as well. And if you have questions, like, it's now your turn. Thank you very much. So I'll open the floor for questions. If anyone has any, I've got a question, so don't go away. Oh. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Okay, so um, I had a question about, you mentioned that the last part of your presentation on the volunteer geographic information, that's really interesting. Have you had any experience, do you know of any transformation of your, I'm assuming these are like PDF style products, have you seen any of its surface in social media? Do you have any plans there? Could you yeah. talk about that? Yeah. Okay, so the, um, the plan for that is uh, we have two major components. So, one aspect of it is to develop this app and you know for a government it's really like opening the door to something else to take up to develop an app and take pictures of the flood and then we put a contract in place with esri okay there was a call for proposal esri bidded on the on the call for proposal and got awarded with a contract and i know there's uh, some esri um, representative in the audience today so uh what we're developing is yes there will be Picture will be taken and then we will we'll be in position to validate the information in the algorithm. Yesterday, or the day before, I, I was talking with the, um, a Norwegian um, cell representative and he was explaining to me that they were doing something similar actually with Navigator because they were doing a navigation in the Arctic. They were asked asking the navigator to take picture of the ice constantly, send it back to Norway. There was a Norway 
for this particular project. And then they, they were in position to adjust the algorithm, to improve the algorithm. So it's not necessarily like a completely new, but this is new for the, business, the government business to, to try to get the information from the citizen scientist. So this is one component. Second component, we develop another contract. This one is with a uh, UAV company. I know there will be a presentation about UAV later, so I will be eager to, I'm eager to listen to this presentation as well, because um, now everybody can have a drone, okay? And everybody can play with a joystick and, you know, drive their drone. So what we are doing, okay, we, I know, like we need some training, we need to figure out how it works, and, but we can collect like really precise information with drones. And we have communities that are, they, they really need this information. They need to know what exactly is happening in terms of um, floods and ice jam. So what is happening next week, we're going, a team, again, led by uh, George Shoma, is going to Fort Albany. And we have a contract in place to provide training and capacity building with First Nation because, um, you know, Earth observation didn't just start last week. So, and the Aboriginal and First Nation, they're expert in Earth observation as well. So it's really key, it's really important for us to include this knowledge, to have this knowledge sharing. So this is the second component. And then we'll go uh, a couple of times in, in the spring to test the application and see what, how we'll collect this information. Well, well, the full deal, like all the, all this, this project. And of course, this is a pilot project. So um, it's exploratory it, and I'm sure there will be some improvement before an official launch to everyone. Right now we're targeting trusted user. I know that Monica in the room uh, is probably working uh, yeah, on the, all the process as well. So all the fine details. Do you have another question? Thank you okay. so much. Thanks. So I, I uh, my first experience in remote sensing was this topic. I was a satellite acquisition planner at MDA and uh, I was one of the people that figure out the conflicts between the different users and uh, send the information to CSA for tasking the satellite. So that's really exciting to see that, how, how far it's come in terms of operationalization. So our next presenter is Andrew Lipchuk. Andrew is with uh, Blackbridge, which is a Planet company, as you may know. Uh, Blackbridge was acquired by Planet, which is that uh, um, innovative company based in, uh, in, in California that's uh, building these really small... Uh, Micro satellites, and so Andrew is going to talk to us about uh, how they use uh, technology to uh, to create large scale mosaics, and also I think he's going to give us an update on on his company. So, all right, thank you, Kevin. Um, perfect. We're good to go. No, I'm okay. Um, so thank you for the great introduction. Uh, thank you, PCI, for having me here. It's always exciting to come to one of these events. Um, being a longtime PCI user, I love to come to see how the technology is progressing, what's coming up, and uh, all the, the new toys. Um, moving on, um, I've been with Blackbridge for five years now, and uh, the company's really changed over time. And Terry really said it great. I mean, it's been a partnership between Blackbridge and PCI to develop products, develop, uh, help us develop our solutions um, and really move forward. So a partnership of innovation. So I'll, I'll touch on that. Uh, I'll discuss a little bit about RapidEye, how we've been using PCI GXL technology, um, and then the future of content. How do we see data coming out and how is that gonna work with companies like PCI? Uh, so going back, way, way back, um, we first worked with PCI as Ionctus, and we basically bought the distribution rights to Spot. Uh, we built a ground station in Lethbridge, and we started downloading large amounts of, of imagery here in Canada. 
we went to PCI uh, to help us develop uh, an easy way to orthorectify and get that imagery out to you as the users. Um, so that was our challenge in 2006. Um, PCI helped us put together the processing chain, um, basically gave us the ability to produce uh, the national imagery uh, program. So all the spot data you see on GeoBase was processed in partnership with PCI and IUNCTUS at the time. And that was a really huge uh, leap forward in technology um, and a great leap forward for Canada and public data. So that was the development of ProLines, which is the, the founder of, of GXL. Moving forward, in 2011, um, IUNCTUS became Blackbridge, and we had the opportunity to acquire the Rapid Eye satellites. So that's a constellation of five satellites that, that collect 5 million square kilometers of, of imagery every day. Um, it's a great system. It's, it was innovative at its time. Uh, it's cost effective and, and really a, a nice piece of technology that, that brings a lot of imagery to users. As a product portfolio, um, it's got standard image products, so ortho images, scenes, uh, that kind of stuff as well as mosaics, which again, we went to PCI, we turned to the, the leading technology of the time uh, to help us build that solution. Um, on top of that, with all the, the large amounts of data that RapidEye can collect, we've started to build monitoring pro products and programs. So things like um, capturing imagery for agriculture or forestry, uh, emergency response, uh, change detection, these kinds of applications. Um, but really, I mean, it's it's the basic products that are the foundation of any imagery or content provider. So things like the ortho product. And again, this is a, a PCI-based solution where we've turned to their great uh, satellite modeling to help us produce large amounts of data. So David touched on earlier uh, a project that we do in Mexico. This is a, a program where we acquire data twice a year of the whole country. Um, Mexico then takes their GXL system and produces mosaics from that data. I think David said there was 25,000 images that went into uh, evaluation before creating a country mosaic. And that's all the data that we've been providing to them. And then it's the PCI system that's able to handle that, that terabytes and terabytes of data uh, very quickly to produce something that their um, decision makers can then use to, to do uh, actionable results. Um, one of the things that we've had to do to help that whole process along is increase the accuracy of imagery. So I think the, the, the layman's term is garbage in is garbage out. Um, we've invested a lot of time, money and effort to improve products so systems like PCI can easily take that data source and then do something with it. Um, here's just a representative of our journey uh, through that, where we've gone through using Landsat as GCPs to building um, a global reference data set based on digital globe technology. So that's a, a great way where we've, again, partnered with other companies to leverage their strengths to help us advance. That results in our data being better than 10 meters accurate. And again, that flows directly into what PCI is able to do with our imagery, really take all of those 25,000 images, uh, evaluate how they work together, assemble them, and then create products for their users. So really great results. Um, another example, um, Korea, a very difficult data set for us. Um, different seasons of imagery, uh, coming together to create mosaics. Um, but PCI GXL is able to, to come past that and build a, a usable product for customers. So again, really easy, um, fantastic system. So some of the advantages of our mosaics as well as the GXL system is it's always accurately georeferenced. PCI takes great care in modeling the imagery properly. Um, it becomes a GIS ready format. So taking raw data from satellite orbit models and creating a usable product that, that your customers um, 
the public uh, decision makers and, and so forth can use right away. Um, and making that a very you know, quick and efficient uh, process. So just another couple examples of mosaics that we've built using GXL um, in Saudi Arabia, Oman, um, Mozambique, Somalia, you know, all around the globe. Happy users, you know, using PCI technology, things like uh, automated GCP collection, um, easy mosaicing. This makes uh, life easy for, for everyone. So one of our other challenges has been, um, as we've grown as a company, um, basically, how do we unify as a company? Our systems in Lethbridge that are based on spot imagery versus our systems in Germany based on rapid eye imagery, again, we've turned to PCI to help us unify our, our production between various uh, sensors, uh, various uh, production techniques, and whatnot. I think the biggest key here is uh, the way PCI is moving forward with programmable interfaces, um, ability to use Python, um, scripting, and all these tools. This is really going to advance into the future uh, as we move into more and more uh, stacks of imagery, as, as David mentioned. So kind of looking into that future, how is Blackbridge transforming into Planet Labs? Really, that's, that's taking um, the traditional tasking system and moving it into a monitoring system. So no longer are we going to be doing point-and-shoot collection. Um, we're going to be always on satellites. We're going to be constantly collecting data all of the time. And again, it's critical that companies like PCI and are, are aligning with us um, coincidentally. Um, on these kinds of efforts because it's going to be systems like PCI with that automated Python programming that are going to handle these large amounts of data. So I'm not sure if you're all familiar with Planet Labs, but the, the mission of the company is to image the entire Earth every day. So we're not going to be imaging just sections. We're not going to be taking tasking orders. We're going to collect the entire globe on a daily basis. And then we're going to provide universal access to it. Um, and that means we're not going to hold our data on tapes. Typically, if you order a, a satellite image, um, perhaps aerial photography as well, um, you're placing an order. That data has been archived. It needs to be recovered, processed, and delivered. Our data is going to be available all the time, 24-7. Talking about the technology, um, here's a, a glimpse of, of the satellites themselves. So really, we're changing the business model in space. Our satellites are roughly this big, the size of a loaf of a bread. Um, they're all built with consumer components, so they're very cost effective. And we're testing these components in space. So instead of doing a traditional aerospace uh, business model where we test components on the ground, we take things, we take them to the space station, we throw them out the window, and we see if they work. <laughs> one way to do it. Um, you know, contrary to, to that traditional aerospace technology, here we have an example of, of Landsat 8, which is a great satellite, um, but it's $800 million. It's a huge endeavor uh, versus our Planet Labs Dove satellites, which are many orders of magnitudes less. Um, kind of looking at those closer, this is kind of what it looks like up close. It's very small, it's tiny. Um, it's got iPhone components inside. It's got a digital camera from, you know, consumer electronics. Uh, the telescope has been designed custom now, um, but it's all, I mean, it's powered by AA lithium ion type batteries. It's, it's pretty extraordinary. You know, the, the great thing about testing in outer space is we've done 13 versions of these satellites over the last three years. So we've really advanced the technology from something that we didn't know if it would work to something we know does work. Um, this year, we will be launching oops, 150 of these satellites. So after three years of research and development, after three years of tossing satellites out of the space station, we've come up with a design that works, something that's as good as RapidEye. Uh, something that, you know, consumer electronics actually functions properly in outer space. And this is really exciting. 
What this means as a company is we'll build 150 of these satellites that'll give us the ability to image the Earth daily. We're putting in ground stations to support the downloading of all that data. Uh, we're working with Amazon Web Services to host the imagery. So roughly 11 terabytes will be downloaded and processed every day. And then we're going to have that universal access through APIs. And we're doing this as an API first, platform first uh, solution. So I think one of the big barriers to remote sensing has been that ability to access imagery. When you have imagery stored on tape, you can't, by a whim, try an algorithm. You can't do a change detection. You can't quickly go look at what has changed. Um, by having data online all the time on Amazon Web Services, you'll be able to take things like PCI software, call up imagery, test out a, a theory, and see the results. You won't be waiting, you won't be worried about placing orders um, or worried about having to rerun results. So that's really the, the whole concept. Global coverage, fresh data, 24 hours access through APIs. This will lead into many applications, agriculture, impact, energy infrastructure, forestry, government, the, the whole gamut, I think we all know many of the applications of imagery. As a quick example of, of what can happen in a day, we've got fields being um, harvested, we've got fields being burned, uh, this kind of goes on and on and on. I think jean Viev did a great job of talking about how we can uh, address issues with imagery, uh, respond to them and save lives as well as with social impact beforehand, you'll have imagery available to see what is going on, what is leading up to that issue. Uh, you won't be worried about having to task data anymore. So it's contextual, it's fast, it's frequent, and it's companies like PCI with their Python programming that are gonna be able to tap and deal with this kind of large amount of data. And with that, um, Thank you everybody for your time, and uh, I'm here for questions. <laughs> yes, Jeff. So the Dove satellites are current. Um, the the question was what wavelengths is is going to be the data? Planet Labs satellites will be blue, green, red, near infrared for this first constellation of 150. Um, the beauty of the concept of Agile Aerospace is we can put other sensors on there. So if customers come to us, we want shortwave infrared, we want thermal, we want a particular wavelength, we can build satellites to meet that need. And it's not going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Yes. Uh, what, could, what kind of GPS technologies on the satellites? Um, we have on board on the satellites consumer grade GPS technology. I don't know the manufacturer. So that gives rough positioning of the satellites, but they also have star cameras on board now as well to help position um, where they are. At the back? The pricing on the data we haven't come up with yet. Um, it's very, I would have to say off the bat, it'll be similar to RapidEye. The Planet Labs data is roughly five meters in resolution, same as RapidEye data, five meters resolution. So uh, on a scene by scene base, similar to RapidEye, um, but I think with this large amount of data, we're probably going to move to uh, other business models of subscriptions, refreshes, um, you know, data use cases, you know, these kinds of things. Um, if, if you ever uh, inquire into RapidEye about change detection, we sell a change detection product uh, in partnership with McDonald Detweiler, uh, MDA, where the change detection itself costs less than the image. And that's because the imagery is not released to the customer. Uh, the imagery stays between our two companies as a partnership they create the change detection map and that's delivered to use the customer. And it's been um, through you know, working with customers, they've identified a price point 
where change detection has a certain value and that just happens to be less than the cost of imagery. Yes. Um, that was a long question. I don't know if I can repeat all of that. Uh, I guess the question was, in summary, uh, are we going to have the ability for developers to get on the platform to create things? Um, absolutely. As a content company, we're primarily focused on making sure the data is good quality, making sure the data gets delivered timely, and then it's easily accessible. So you as a, as a user or developer will be able to get the raw pixels and process it in your software of choice from PCI to Esri to whatnot um, because it is an API first delivery system. That will be your choice as a user. Um, Amazon Web Services is open and our API is open source uh, based, I guess is the best way to say. Um, so if your PCI GXL system, for example, is hosted on Amazon Web Services, which I do believe you guys do, um, you can process right there and then, or you can bring it into your own infrastructure behind a firewall, your choice. Yeah. Can I add something to that? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. I just I'm trying to connect people in the room. So uh, the guy that's standing at the back there, John Bennett. Yes, I'm pointing at you, John. John is with Secor uh, and uh, uh, Des Power, who you probably know who Des is. Uh, they have the API and they're playing with it. Um, so you might want to talk to John about that. We have access to it as well. We've pulled a bit of data off. Uh, there's a gentleman who's coming this afternoon. His name is Guillaume Morin. He's with PCI. He's been playing with the API a little bit as well. So uh, if you want to ask uh, those those people about, uh, you know, I, I think it's it's uh, important to get eyes on imagery and understand what the data looks like, and and also the API, how you could work with it. It's a pretty innovative concept, is just to have all this data at your fingertips that you can transform on the fly. It's a pretty uh, amazing uh, concept. Yeah. Super. Any other questions? Great. Well, thank you. I think it's lunch. Yes. Not yet. Not yet. OK, so um, we're, we're going to break for lunch. But before we do that, I just want to give you a little bit of a teaser as to what's happening this afternoon. Um, so uh, uh, this afternoon, we have some, some, some great presentations. We're going to start the afternoon um, with an educational showcase. So uh, Dr. Andrew Davidson from Carleton U and Agriculture Canada is going to get up here. And he's going, we're going, to, sh he's going to showcase uh, some really um, uh, uh, some really great projects and some uh, graduate work that's being done by some students at Carleton University. Um, and then we have another case study on UAV. So uh, Eric Apedale from Apedale Environmental is going to be giving a talk on that. And then we have a specific session where uh, we're going to be going through the developer uh, edition. And um, we have a special offer that's uh, only the people in this room here today can can take us up on. So, if you want to take up take up that offer, we'll have more details later on. And um, so, we look forward to spending the rest of the afternoon with you. Enjoy your lunch, and we'll be back. Uh, sorry, we'll be back for uh, for one o'clock. So, enjoy your lunch, everyone.
Tell stories, you're good at that. Yeah. 
Uh, do, 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 do. No, I was going through and I had like 60 slides and then I was tearing it all down to the 25 slides. But really, you know, like, that's the thing, it's, it's the story. Yeah. I, hopefully you trying to do, but it's cool the, the guy from Carlton, because I don't know him, but I've heard about him. Which guy? The, guy from, the education guy that's done remote sensing stuff. Oh, uh, Andrew Davidson? Yeah. yeah. So There's a whole bunch of students from Carlton who are doing things with UAVs uh, that you should talk to. They're all sitting at the table there. A girl named Karine Millard, she's going to give a talk. She's using UAVs in the Alfred Bog. Oh, yeah. To do uh, hydrological uh, studies, like the micro level uh, surface uh, changes and impact on hydrology. She's her PhD thesis. Um, so there's, yeah, you'll see some cool stuff. Do to do to do. Didn't didn't pop in. Is that one? Is it like, should I use this instead of that? It's just power, extra power. Okay. I'll try a different uh, side. Probably not going to work, so I'll just put one. Very not. You might want to turn this so I can't even see down there. You have a laptop on you? Yeah, that's really slow. Is your presentation on your laptop? Maybe. Well, it's not Will this work on your laptop? Yeah, this on my laptop. I don't understand why it's not. Uh, I don't know. It's a because I use connection maybe or I had this connected on my PC, so I wasn't using it on my. I'm not sure how to do. Are you connected to the internet? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just go, okay. uh, just go, whatever. Grab I'll it. Download it off the box. We're live, by the way. You're live. Say hi to the people on the internet. Hello, people on the internet. Other people on the internet. I mean, this is a live broadcast. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're still They're looking at me right now. Yes. Thank you for that. Thank you, us. Can we see what I'm typing on the screen? Passwords and key yeah. capture. Key capture. It's a world site there. We don't want to remember my password. Do we? It didn't work anyway. Oh, that's why. It's not logged in. The cat box is in. Oh, All right. Now let's look. There we go. Yeah. So right click, download. I guess it'll just go to the default download. Isn't that awesome? Same file, doesn't matter. Well, I've got a folder going, but anyway, let's see what happens. Yeah, I'll go to it now. I'll just move, move it to my uh, folder on my desktop. It's kind of a good one with pictures on Good pictures are good. Good little music. Text is one. Pictures are good. I did this whole. Uh, uh, this guy in Ottawa, his name is Penny Dubarry. And uh, in my uh, MBA, he came in and gave a talk. Is he the car guy? No, I, I had the same question. He has a company called Save It Like Sully, and he does presentation coaching. 
really. And so he came in and gave us a whole hour and a half long. We just open them? No, uh, open just, just browse the folder. Okay. Um, I don't know how to do that in here. I'll get it. So that, that's it there? That's what you called it? Uh, I think so, yes. So that didn't work. You should wait, 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 what do you mean? Oh, this no, thing. No, that thing didn't work. It's going to be a lot. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's just check that it opens up. What's going on? Got right, Jason's computer. Oh, it's a good machine. So it's dead dry. Perfect. So if I uh, is there is there anything there? It's thinking. How, how many megs is this thing? Yeah, there it is. It's not that big. That's good. It looks like it's there anyway. So. Okay, have some lunch. Yeah. I didn't get some beer. Yeah. Getting yeah. hammered. Oh, you're telling me about the presentation guy. Yeah, so uh, it was all about it several rules. Uh, one is a guy is a guy named Guy Kawasaki. Yeah. And uh, he's a you can might as well just sit down like a Kawasaki please. Different guy. This guy's a BC guy. And so he developed a rule, 10, 20, 30 rule. So um, the uh, 10, the 10 was not. Yeah, 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 I'm learning all sorts of I forgot the 10 was. The 20 is your presentation should be any longer than 20 minutes. And 30 was the font size. It shouldn't be any less than 30. <laughs> It's okay. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, it's all good. It's okay, I'll read it for people that can't see it. Okay. Yeah.
So just a quick little announcement. I guess uh, if we could start to make our way back to the other side of the room, uh, we're going to be starting in a few minutes. Oui, c'est ça qui était, qui était pour vous. C'est tout correct? Ouais, oui, tu as eu la chance de parler oh, ouais, à tout ton monde. Mm -hmm. et, ça ça vous dérange pas. Je te remercie beaucoup pour être venu. Tu as, as fait une belle job. C'était bien. Okay. C'était bien. Non, c'était très bien. Mm -hmm. Puis, euh, c'est ça. J'ai eu quelques questions. Why didn't John talk? Parce que 
Oui, mais c'est ça, mais John, il peut répondre aux questions. Oui, puis on, on, a, on a mentionné qu'il était dans la chambre. Tu sais, qu'il était là. Il y a eu beaucoup de conversations. Euh, ouais, je parlé avec les... Moi, je l'ai pointé dans la direction de John. Je ne sais pas si Laurie White, elle a parlé à John parce que Laurie White, Laurie White elle veut savoir qu'est-ce qu'on fait pour une soeur. Tu okay. connaissais qui, Laurie White? Oui, oui, j'ai parlé On a matin. fait du trekking ensemble. Ouais. Merci, Gabriel. All right, folks, we're going to get started. So I'm going to uh, encourage you to please uh, move over to this side of the room again so we can get the next session started and stay on time and get you home on time as well. All right, thank you. So this, this next session is, uh, is, is really interesting. Um, PCI, because we're here in Ottawa, uh, we, we try to leverage as much as possible the, uh, uh, the relationships that we have with our, with our customers and, and in particular with, um, with the universities here in, in, uh, in our city. Um, there's quite a few of us at PCI who have been through the universities, uh, whether it be the University of Ottawa or Carleton University. And uh, myself, I'm a graduate of Carleton University, and I've certainly kept uh, a good relations with uh, uh, some of the key professors there, including Doug King and, and uh, Andrew Davidson, who's going to be uh, taking the floor in a minute. And I think it's uh, really important uh, that we 
maintain these ties. Uh, as you'll see, uh, a lot of, or as was mentioned earlier by uh, Geneviève and, and others, uh, there's a lot of core technology that ends up in our software that we take to market on the global stage that is developed in partnership with uh, scientists uh, right here in Ottawa. So I'm really excited to hand the floor over and give complete control over to uh, Dr. Ed, uh, Andrew Davidson. Dr. Uh, uh, Davidson is the uh, Operations Manager of Earth Observation at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and he's also an adjunct professor at Carleton University. Well, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, before we start, I just have one announcement, one shameless plug, and that is for the Canadian Remote Sensing Society, Ottawa. Um, I don't know how many of you know about CRSS. Uh, CRSS Ottawa is the local branch of the Canadian Remote Sensing Society. Uh, we have uh, a couple of events coming up, uh, but this uh, just quick announcement. Uh, what I would like to say is that every month we have an e-highlights uh, newsletter, which you can actually subscribe to if you're interested. Uh, to do so, send an email to crssottawa at gmail.com. And the two upcoming events, which I think will have interest uh, to people in the room, on the 22nd of February, uh, there's a meeting with Jim, uh, Jim Fremantle of York University, uh, is going to be talking. Um, this meeting will be held at 5 p.m. at 615 Booth Street, um, so at the Canada Centre for Remote Sensing. Uh, and the talk will be on enhancing smart data. On the 21st of March, uh, there'll be another meeting, again, of interest to others. Uh, Judith uh, Bosse, and she is the ADM of the Earth Science Sector and Chief Scientist. She's going to be talking again at 615 Booth Street. And that will be an open dialogue with the Ottawa Gatineau Remote Sensing Community. Uh, if you want more details on this, like I say, please subscribe to the eHighlights newsletter. But you can also talk in person to Peter White. Peter, can you just wave your hand, please? Peter is one of the four people in the room here with a ginger beard. Uh, probably the, better, the best looking of the bunch. Um, so if you actually need uh, further information, please don't hesitate to talk to Peter. Okay, so uh, without further ado uh, to this session, um, first of all, I would like to thank PCI Geomatics for actually inviting me uh, to chair uh, this session. Uh, PCI has a long history of supporting uh, the geomatics community here in Ottawa, uh, and especially at Carleton University where I'm cross-appointed as adjunct research professor. So on behalf of the Department of Geography uh, at Carleton University, and especially uh, some of the professors in geomatics, such as Doug King, chair of the department, who sadly couldn't be here today uh, to make this acknowledgement himself. Um, I'd like to thank PCI for their continued support of geomatics education um, here in Ottawa, Carleton University, and, and, and nationally. So today, uh, this session, uh, right now, this session is dedicated to showcase and celebrate some of the work that's going to be done by the next generation of geomatics scientists. Uh, primarily uh, scientists from here in the city of Ottawa, but obviously, as you're well aware, this type and quality of work is being undertaken by undergraduate and graduate students at universities and colleges across the country. And it is people like uh, the students presenting today who are going to be pushing uh, Canadian geomatics forward into the future. To this end, the role of industry uh, and their partnership with education will continue to be important by facilitating uh, the development, research and opportunities in technological development, but also providing students with real opportunities to build real work skills. And to the students, I would actually say this, it's a really exciting time to be in remote sensing. Uh, with unprecedented access to remote sensing information, new sensors and other geospatial data, along with evolving IMIT infrastructure, it gives tremendous opportunity for the future. And from my perspective, EO technology isn't going anywhere. It's going to be here to stay. OK, so without further ado, I'm going to pass this on uh, to our first presenter. Our first presenter is uh, Corinne uh, Millard. She's a PhD student here at uh, Carleton University. Sure. And she, her uh, topic of research is she is uh, uh, looking at wetlands hydrology with optical, LIDAR, and radar data. Karim, the floor is yours. Thank you. 
Okay. How's that for sound? Good? Okay. Uh, so I'm a fourth year PhD student at Carleton, and uh, I designed my talk today a little bit differently, not so much on the research focus, but on the data that I use and on the software that I use, um, because I do definitely use a lot of PCI geomatics, but I definitely have to go outside PCI sometimes. So I'll just start by showing you um, my study sites. I started off with actually five sites. I narrowed it down to three. And then now that I'm in my fourth year of my PhD, I've actually decided I'm only actually working on one. And that is Alfred Bogg, uh, which is the one that's closest to us and the one that I can get the most data uh, from in the field. So my thesis has four components. I'm just going to really briefly talk about um, all four components. Uh, the first is peatland classification. and uh, I use LIDAR for this because uh, the different peatland classes are separated by their vegetation structure, but also in their elevation. So LIDAR is ideal for that. Um, but I found that um, the package that I, or the, the software that I like to use for classification is actually not in a remote sensing software package at all, but is in R. So R is an open source statistical package and uh, anybody can download it for free and you have to be able to script to use it. So I've developed scripts uh, that do random forest classification. I was really excited uh, to see Dave Stanley's presentation earlier where he said that SVM and random forest were gonna be in upcoming versions of PCI because um, I would like to not have to go outside of one software package. It's, it's more uh, easy to work within one than to be constantly switching between different packages. Um, but that said, I also don't use PCI for any part of this part of my thesis. Um, I'm using last tools for processing LiDAR data, and I use uh, Sega GIS to uh, produce a lot of the LiDAR derivatives. So I'm going to skip over this section really quickly because it's not very PCI heavy. <laughs> um, this is actually a picture of uh, the resulting classification, uh, and you can see that beyond doing the general classification of the peatland, I actually focus on a very small area of Alfred Bogg. Um, and the, the red square that you can see is the, uh, is the study area. And so for the last three years, I've spent what feels like my entire life out at Alfred Bog, trudging through the bog, uh, putting in instrumentation and collecting data. So the red triangles that you see are water table level loggers. We, we measure uh, how the water table fluctuates. And then and that happens uh, or that can happen uh, automatically. So we record every hour what's happening with the water table. Uh, but the black triangles you see are soil moisture monitoring stations. And those I actually have to physically go and visit to collect data every time I want data. So the reason that the area and the scope of the project is so small is because it takes two teams of people more than eight hours to trudge through this very small section of the bog to collect these measurements. So that brings me to the second uh, portion of my of research. And that's that I'm, I'm using uh, radar set to synthetic aperture radar uh, polarimetry data to uh, try to understand how changes in soil moisture, water table, and vegetation are uh, are uh, mapped out or how they change in polarimetric response as well. So when we have a change in hydrology, how does that affect the change in polarimetry? What if we also have a corresponding change in vegetation water content at the same time? How can we separate these things out? And so um, obviously for that, I've done all of my processing in PCI Geomatica, the SAR polarimetry workstation. Um, and I still work in EASY. I haven't quite converted over to the Python stuff yet. Um, and obviously orthorectifying everything with ortho engine. But then once that's done, I actually take all that data out again and go back to R. So I do most of my um, analysis in, in R itself. And so what Gabrielle was saying about uh, doing everything in inside PCI was also really exciting. <laughs> um, so this is just an example of uh, some polarimetric parameters. They're coded with, uh, with numbers of channels instead of putting the full name up there. Um, but what I found was that I have something like 44 different SAR polarimetric parameters, and there's a lot of overlap and a lot of redundancy, and I don't need them all. So what I'm doing is trying to determine which are the best ones for uh, teasing out uh, responses in vegetation, responses in hydrology, um, and which ones are telling me what about what part of the peatland. I imagine this probably doesn't show up very well on that screen, um, but what you can see, there's a, a rain uh, gauge data, so that measures when we have rain, which is a huge effect on um, the SAR, not only because uh, the soil is wetter, but also because there might be water on the vegetation. Uh, water table level measurements, so that's the distance from the water table to the surface. 
uh, and then soil moisture measurements. And then on the other side, you can see a couple of different selected polarimetric parameters. And what I think is really interesting about these graphs is that you see change in water table, you see change in soil moisture, but there's a lot of overlap in the SAR parameters. And so finding that signal within the noise is what I'm trying to do here. So the third sort of aspect of my um, thesis after I figure out which of these parameters is actually useful and which aren't, is to try to do soil moisture retrieval. And so I'm doing this from a statistical point of view. So again, everything is processed in PCI. Um, and then I go out into our statistics to do my analysis. One thing that I'm throwing in, um, I tried to uh, understand the vegetation component by using LIDAR, uh, which is spatially variable, obviously, throughout the peatland. But I'm also starting to use uh, UAV air photos and uh, digital surface models that are created from structure from motion. So for that, I'm using Agisoft PhotoScan. Uh, but I know I've been talking with Jean and talking with lots of other people um, at PCI about the new capabilities in the in the UAV department. And so that's kind of exciting because uh, Agisoft PhotoScan is sort of a black box software. So you don't really know what's going on behind the scenes. It's not, um, it, there are not a lot of things you can control. So if something goes wrong, you don't know why. So I'm trying to use really high resolution site level digital elevation models to tease out that vegetation response in order to better understand the, the effect of, of soil moisture. And you can see from these three pictures here that uh, there's variable vegetation. We have really wide open areas in the peatland where there's shrubs, we have um, short tamaracks, and then we have tall forest like trees where there's, where there's peatland, peatland, peatland beneath. And so in these different areas, it's going to be very difficult in some cases to actually be sensing uh, soil moisture or water table. So it'd be nice to know which ones those are. Um, from the measurements that I've taken over the last couple of years, we do have a bunch of polarimetric parameters that are useful uh, and do produce high correlations. But when you take a single polarimetric parameter with a high correlation, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get a good relationship linearly. Um, an R value of 0.8 gives you an R squared value of 0.4. So that's not a very good model. And so I've been looking at other techniques, um, uh, multiple linear regression, taking several different SAR parameters and trying to model uh, soil moisture. And then now I'm looking at um, mixed effects models as well. So uh, this is all, these are all very hopeful numbers, but it's nowhere near finished. And then the fourth uh, aspect of my thesis is to try to use SAR interferometry to uh, measure water table changes. And this is a little bit different from what people like Brian Briscoe are doing, uh, because in a peatland, the water table is normally not at the surface or above the surface. You don't have a lot of standing water. What you have is uh, sphagnum moss that is completely saturated at a certain level, but might be completely dry at the surface. And so as the water tables go up and down, the peatland actually rises and falls with uh, the changes in water table. It's not necessarily an exact one-to-one -one relationship. Uh, and it hasn't been tested a lot itself, the relationship between just water table and surface elevation. Uh, but I'm trying to use interferometry. So again, using these same radar set to um, images. And, uh, but I, in, in order to do this right now, I have to use gamma. And I had to teach myself how to use gamma. That was really not very fun, because gamma is not very user friendly. So I really look forward to the, the SAR uh, interferometry stuff in, in PCI. Um, and so this is just some, some results. Um, in the middle image is the one that you probably want to concentrate on. It's a coherence image. And yellow means good coherence, and blue means no coherence. And so we want good coherence. We want, between the two image pairs, we want a lot of uh, uh, similarities. So you can see that in May, there's not a lot of coherence. And that's because between these two dates, there was probably a lot of vegetation change. May to June, still not a lot. We have uh, a couple of what I call lobes of the bog that are showing um, uh, high coherence. And that's because those are open um, sort of shrubby areas. As you progress through the season, you start to see really high coherence appearing. And so this is really good. It means that the technique probably um, will work at least at some point during the year, if not all times. So uh, that's my thesis in a nutshell. And I think PCI was put in my hands at a very young age. So uh, I appreciate the time to, to talk about um, my work, but I also really, really look forward to some of the cool stuff that you guys have been talking about today. Thanks.
Yeah, okay. Technology. All right. Thank you very much, Corinne. Um, the next person who's uh, going to speak to us today is Neela Farah Labi. She is a PhD student uh, at Carleton University in the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies. And her work is looking at biodiversity modeling with, multi with multiple temporal and spatial scale optical data. <coughs> Okay, uh, so hi everyone. My name is Nilofar and I'm working with um, Doug King, my thesis supervisor. Um, so I'm presenting today my uh, thesis, which is on modeling by diversity response to the habitat heterogeneity in agricultural lands of Eastern Ontario. So, and I'll be using uh, multiple spatial and temporal remote sensing data. So my work is a work in progress. Um, so um, I don't have my hand, but I will um, generally go over my um, uh, my thesis and uh, the objectives and um, the kind of concepts behind um, uh, my thesis. Um, so the liberal background, I'm not going uh, through a lot of like um, theoretical backgrounds on um, the project, but um, basically we know that uh, due to human activities, including the, um, the uh, agricultural anticipation uh, by diversity has declined. So we are specifically in this case, uh, focusing on the land, um, the farmland by diversities and which are affected by the uh, by cultural intensification. Uh, so uh, on the whole landscape heterogeneity hypothesis, which assumes that um, if we increase the heterogeneity in agricultural lands or in farmlands, um, the, uh, the by diversity or the farmland species are going to be uh, positively affected. Um, so um, we are testing this uh, hypothesis on our agricultural lands. Um, and I'll be using the earth observation um, data to model the biodiversity um, in those lands. Um, so uh, uh, we are testing the, uh, the, the, hypo, the habitat heterogeneity hypothesis, uh, which is kind of correlated with the spectral heterogeneity. So we are supposing that if we have the like, uh, um, uh, if you have a higher spectral heterogeneity, that is a driver of the um, the, the spatial heterogeneity, and hence uh, that is a, um, a that is showing the um, kind of uh, that is a driver of biodiversity. Um, so in this study, I'm using the discrete um, maps and I'm comparing the discrete metrics of uh, heterogeneity versus the continuous metrics of heterogeneity, which are derived by the satellite images. Um, so the main objective that I have is to um, find out the response of biodiversity to habitat heterogeneity at multiple spatial and temporal scales in mixed agricultural landscapes. So I want to see what is the response and if there is any positive correlation between um, between habitat heterogeneity and uh, biodiversity. So I'm using uh, different uh, spatial and temporal scales remote sensing. Uh, and I'm going to find out if the high spatial and low temporal resolution imagery like MODIS and low spatial and high temporal resolution imagery like Landsat could be used to create robust biodiversity models that reflect the actual response of different species groups to habitat heterogeneity. And um, when I was doing my uh, literature review, I found that there is a gap in the literature in doing uh, multi-spatial, multi-temporal um, modeling using different taxes. So all the, uh, all the studies have either focused or have either used only one type of um, imagery um, during different times um, or they have used uh, different uh, images with different spatial resolutions um, but only in one date or they have only modeled one taxa. So my goal is to kind of do a multi-spatial, multi-temporal remote sensing for multiple taxa in farmlands. Um, so my study sites are, um, it's an agricultural region in Eastern Ontario, and it's the, the area is around like 15,000 um, kilometers. Um, so there are different, uh, uh, the different uh, uh, crop types are grown in this area, um, but they're mostly like soybean, wheat, um, and different cereals, uh, corn, or other like, uh, or some other, um, some other crops. Uh, so we have approximately 100 uh, uh, sample sites, which are one kilometer by one kilometer. And we have a range of heterogeneity, uh, which is, comp uh, we have compositional and configurational heterogeneities, which uh, uh, we kind of, uh, like in here, I look at 
the crop diversity as a uh, as an indicator of uh, um, composi uh, compositional heterogeneity and low mean field size. Uh, mean field size is a um, kind of indicator of um, config configurational heterogeneity. So we have a range of uh, the low compositional, low configurational, um, the high compositional, low configurational, high compositional, high configurational, and so on and so forth. So this is my um, sites with the, the range of their um, heterogeneity, compositional and configurational heterogeneities. Um, so I'm using um, the biodiversity data that has been collected by the biology team in this project during 2011 and 2012. Um, so half of the sites has been um, surveyed during, during 2011 and the rest are during 2012 and seven taxa groups have been recorded which are including uh, birds, plants, butterflies, zipid bees, beetles, spiders and so on and so forth and the alpha and gamma uh, biodiversity indices are calculated and these are the ones that I use to model them against the landscape uh, metrics. So the data that I'm using, the remote sensing data, um, I'm using time series of MODIS, which have uh, which we have the record since um, uh, almost 1999 or 2000 onward. Um, so I'm using right now um, uh, MODIS 16 days, but I'm also considering using all these seven days um, NDVI and DVI um, data, depending on which one is getting the best results um, for my purpose. Uh, I'll also be using the Landsat data, which we have there, um, which we have their history since uh, 1982. Um, so there's also uh, this 40 centimeter resolution aerial photos which have been taken during the field campaigns in 2011 and 2012. Um, uh, I will also consider using them um, as either validation data or um, maybe I'll use them for uh, further modeling if I want to take it further. Um, so I will use the, uh, some discrete variables which are taken from the, um, from the maps. Uh, from the land cover maps, which are mainly the compositional and configurational uh, metrics. Uh, there are different metrics that have been um, chosen on different studies in this uh, project before, uh, including for composition, they're including uh, crop type variability, patch richness, amount of suitable species habitats, and so on and so forth. And for configuration, we have mean patch size and edge density, or mean patch shape variability, or other, um, there are other variables that I might be using in the future. Um, so uh, for the continuous remote sensing variables, and this, uh, this is the main part that I'll be using uh, PCI software to derive these um, variables. So I'll be using either the original spectral bands or the band combination, which includes the vegetation indices, which I'm working at right now. Uh, we also use the band transformation techniques like principal component analysis and tesla cap transformation. And I'll also do a spectral mixture analysis. Um, so for the temporal analysis part, uh, to derive the time series, this is the part that I'm working on right now. I don't have like solid results to present, but I'm just the primary um, results um, uh, section of my uh, research. Uh, I'll be using um, MODIS and Landsat, but MODIS because of the high temporal resolution could be used for um, the within seasonal um, variation analysis. Um, but I'm also looking back in like the past 15 years or, um, or whatever the um, the data that we have to find out the temporal trajectories of um, uh, crop um, crop phenology, which can affect the present or the current situation of biodiversity in the lands. I'm also be using Landsat for the interannual um, time series analysis. So the, the, the expected results, um, I'm expecting to um, find a correlation, a positive correlation between the landscape heterogeneity metrics and the response to different species groups. Um, and I'm expecting to find out that um, the biodiversity models derived from the selected continuous landscape metrics can display this correlation and create robust models and explain the response of different taxa to these models. Um, so I expect to find out that MODIS and Landsat time series will be able to detect the temporal trajectories of past phenological changes in the mixed agricultural landscape. So yeah, as I said, I'm expecting to see that some of the past events in this um, uh, region can have affected the current situation in the biodiversity. Um, and um, I'm expect to identify the optimal operational and conservational scales at which each species group responds to habitat heterogeneity in mixed agricultural lands. So uh, because I'm looking at different um, spatial, um, spatial scales, I'm expecting to um, eventually find out the best um, spatial uh, scale for all those different um, types of groups. And that's it. So thank you for listening.
Thank you very much, Nilfar. Okay, so third, let's find the mouse here. Third up is going to be Alex Foster. Uh, Alex is uh, an MA student uh, at Carlton University. Uh, he is, uh, sorry, Alex Foster is an MA student in the Department of Geography at Carlton University. Uh, he is looking at the wetland delineation and hydrologic analysis with using historical imagery, and his study site is Alfred Bogg. Alex. All right, uh, thanks for the introduction, Andrew, and thanks to PCI for giving me the opportunity to present. Um, so yeah, what I'd like to discuss briefly is the uh, use of georeference historical era photography in my project to uh, delineate boundary changes of Alfred Bogg over the past 60 years. So I'll uh, introduce you to that blog, uh, give you a little bit more context before jumping into the benefits and disadvantages historical era photography presented to us in this project, as well as comparing two of the different approaches that we took, first manually referencing the photos and then using the automated referencing approach. Finally, I'll share with you some of the early results of the work, most of them are still pending, uh, and then summarize. So for uh, those of you that are unfamiliar, Alfred is 75 kilometers southeast of Ottawa and the better known and better protected but smaller Maribel blog. To say Alfred is historically and presently the largest peatland in southern Ontario is true, but understates the dramatic alteration in land cover and reduction to one third of its original size over the past 200 years, going from over 120 square kilometers to roughly 35 square kilometers a day. Anyways, we know that there are various processes such as those that are listed that have driven this, but we don't really know the relative influence and there are inconsistencies in its reported size over time. So one of the ways that we elected to get around this was to map the boundary changes ourselves of the bog between 1800 and 2014, ultimately producing 11 land cover maps. These land cover maps will be then used to roughly quantify three ecosystem services over the same time span. Uh, anyways, the time span of the study required that we use multiple data sources. Uh, we used a whole bunch of different data sources prior to 1927, but what I'd like to talk to you about today is our use of historical aerial photography afterwards. So we isolated every relevant photo of Alfred Bogg that we could. We digitized them on a normal flatbed scanner at 600 dots per inch. And then we georeferenced and mosaiced the air photos. Using those mosaics, uh, clipping those mosaics to the original extent of the bog, we then delineated land cover changes, uh, classifying the whole image into one of the nine following classes. Rather than remake a similar map 11 times from scratch, after making the first land cover map, we opted to reuse the same shape files and just make the appropriate edits to create subsequent land cover maps. And that also gave us some uh, boundary consistency so that it wasn't impacted by potentially small little positional errors in the uh, air photo mosaics. Finally, although we haven't done it, we expect that we'll be able to extract digital elevation models from the air photos. And this will help us mainly estimate the peak volume lost to extraction over time, but also potentially capture any uh, changes in the height of the dome of the bog or vegetation changes along drainage ditches as an indicator of uh, peatland degradation and oxidation potentially. So the main advantage that historical aerial photography presented to us in this study, considering its time span, was the significantly lengthier record over which aerial photography has been collected compared with other remote sensing imagery. For example, uh, at Alfred, the earliest photos, uh, air photos begin in 1928 and go all the way to the late 1990s. Uh, whereas, you know, Landsat begins in 1970. And that brings us to the next point, which is that for any given period that we were interested in delineating, aerial photography tended to have a higher spatial resolution than that was afforded uh, by other remote sensing imagery. However, there were some disadvantages. The physical storage means that you have to isolate all the relevant photos in all the different levels and branches of government. Uh, and it also means that it's subject to wear and damage over time. Uh, also, the process of digitization can actually introduce or exacerbate uh, errors and complicate georeferencing later on. Uh, also, there is, uh, you know, the resolution over which photos, or the resolution at which photos are collected, as well as the spatial coverage and time interval between those photo sets is inconsistent. But what I would say is the biggest detractor is really uh, the significant time and labor that it requires to make air photos readily usable in modern GIS. So I'm sure you're all very familiar with what georeferencing entails. Uh, we first uh, did man manual georeferencing of all our photos. So uh, two things impacted our ability to do that, which is the age and the resolution of the aerial photography. Obviously in a highly dynamic landscape where landscape structure and cover are changing quickly, 
uh, older photos have less common features to use as a reference than more recent photos. And also, by the nature of covering a smaller area in higher detail, higher resolution air photos also have less features, but which you can reference at a higher precision. There were uh, two ways that we got around that, but that's not really that important. What I really want to illustrate is this table at the bottom, which shows the dramatic rise in effort that was required to get higher resolution imagery of the bog. So for 1947, there were one in 12,000 scale air photos. I referenced 125 photos. Uh, and that covered an area just over half of that covered by only five photos in 1954. So that just emphasizes that there, when manually georeferencing, there's a lot more effort that's required to get that higher resolution imagery. And also that sometimes you have less points to do that with. Uh, and that, that this, uh, the available ground control points based on scale uh, or resolution uh, is just illustrated by this figure here where you can see I had three uh, ground control, or maybe you can't see, I don't know. But uh, I had three stable ground control points for one in 12,000, which are delineated by the little orange circles. Uh, and those same three points are also in the one in 50,000 uh, image there from 1994, along with many other reference points that were available to use, and they're delineated in blue. So luckily, PCI was uh, kind enough to offer me a trial of their new historical air photo processing software, which essentially automates the referencing process. Uh, it was really easy to use. You just collect some basic uh, information about the flight parameters, the center coordinates of the photos, the focal length, and some other easily retrieval information, and you run it through uh, this software, which is integrated with the use of Ortho Engine. Um, basically, by running the initial stages of the program, we were able to broadly place the photos, and then you just run the alignment stage of that program iteratively, removing any ground control points that had excessive error, um, and incrementally improving the overall model. Using this process, we were able uh, to have the rooming square error of our models uh, prior to Mosaic can be all less than one pixel uh, for all the photo sets that we used. And mainly what I want to say is that it significantly reduced some of those previous barriers that I was talking about to making historical air photos usable uh, in modern GIS. Uh, so to reiterate with my own personal experience, uh, manually referencing, uh, we took about two months of the summer uh, collecting about eight to 12 ground control points per photo. Uh, and during that time, your focus is totally involved on georeferencing. Uh, comparatively, it took us about two weeks to reference all of our photo sets using that automated approach. And uh, it collects hundreds of ground control points and time points per photo, obviously outdoing a summer's worth of effort in a much smaller time, which was kind of sad. And good. I, I don't really know how to feel about it yet. Uh, but um, ultimately, uh, with the automated process, sometimes assisted by a few uh, manual points just to improve the overall model, we had a greater positional accuracy than that uh, that we got using the manual referencing approach. So uh, th this here, this first image is a manually referenced um, mosaic from 1964, which is slightly transparent, showing the reference 2008 image below it. As you can see in the left-hand rectangle, um, there was actually a, a little bit of error in the stitching of adjacent photos from 1964, as you can see by the displacement of the drainage ditches uh, as you head northward from the road. Also uh, of concern is in the other rectangle there. Uh, there is actually a misalignment between uh, the 1964 manual mosaic and the reference imagery, both of which would complicate your ability to consistently delineate land cover changes in a spatially explicit manner. However, when I flip to the one that we got using the automated referencing process, you can see there's a drastic improvement in the stitching of adjacent photos, as well as uh, the alignment with the actual reference imagery. So uh, here's just a few of the early results from the work. Uh, there's the 1954 mosaic. As you can see, the northern uh, arm of the bog is still largely intact. But as we go uh, further towards the present, uh, the whole arm of the bog literally disappears and that northern section will continue to do so up to today. Uh, just in this final photo, what's nice about the incomplete coverage is that you can see that the alignment uh, between the roads in the reference 1994 photos and the reference image itself are, are quite strong. And anyways, using that, we were then able to create this uh, changing extent map uh, with, after 1947 using the aerial photography. 
Uh, and I just want to note that uh, within the first hundred years, the bog has reduced in over half of its extent, but that's partially related to the profile of a raised bog and potentially to the fact that it's easier to burn peat away than it is to process and package it. Not really sure. Anyways, and this uh, are the land cover changes that we were able to manually delineate using uh, the historical maps at first, but then 1947 onward using the uh, air photos. So the peatlands in uh, pink and the red is commercial peat extraction, yellow being farmland. To summarize, uh, historical era photography is an incredibly valuable historic data source that is incredibly underutilized. And as it was alluded to earlier, uh, these wear and damages are only going to get worse over time. And so why not get it into a digital medium sooner than later? Uh, obviously, the reason that they're underutilized was the amount of effort that was required to make them readily usable in modern GIS. But there are increasingly new softwares that facilitate that, such as the HAP software. And it really promotes wider accessibility and application of these photos beyond non, two non-traditional geomatics disciplines. And there is lots of interest in reconstructing past human environmental interactions, whether it be from a me uh, resource management perspective, trying to assess uh, the efficacy of land use, past land use policies, identifying appropriate restoration targets for wetlands, for example, or creating future scenarios. Anyways, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alex. So the final presentation of the session um, is going to be from Emily Lindsay. Emily is an MSc student in the Department of Geography at Carleton University. Uh, she is working with Agriculture Canada and uh, looking at mapping Canada's rangeland and forage resources using Earth observation data. Well, this microphone's a little short. Um, so hi everyone, I'm working on a project, does it go up? <laughs> That's okay. You're just going to have to lean over. Okay, I'll lean over. All right, so I'm working on a project with Agriculture Canada on mapping Canada's rangeland and forage resources using Earth observation. I'm a master's student at Carleton University and I'm supervised by Dr. Doug King and Dr. Andrew Davidson. Some of my uh, research objectives were to explore the potential methods and data sources useful for distinguishing between forage land cover types and to use this knowledge to produce a cost effective and accurate methodology for distinguishing land cover types with it, within Canada's rangeland and forage resources using remotely sensed imagery and geospatial data. Uh, five of my sub objectives, uh, which were included in my methodology are to utilize the classifier random forest uh, and to see how the implementation of this advanced pixel-based supervised classification might improve uh, over existing methods. Uh, also within this, I'm analyzing the output of variable importance as well as comparing the out-of-bag error to uh, using an independent validation. Some of my optical data sources, I'm using Landsat mostly, um, also some RapidEye. But from the Landsat imagery, I'm extracting vegetation indices and phenological variables from time series. And I'm testing the use of these additional variables derived from optical imagery to, and to see how they enhance overall accuracy. I'm also using uh, available SAR data from uh, the Radar Sat 2 satellite, which uh, is available from the Agriculture Canada Department. Um, it's wide beam mode polarimetric SAR. I'm also testing the influence of acquisition timing on uh, uh, different accuracies, as well as the training data. So I have two sources of training data. One is from the provincial crop insurance data set, as well as a field survey, which was conducted last summer. Uh, as some of you may know, the Agriculture Canada already produces an annual space-based crop inventory for Canada, which uses a decision tree methodology uh, utilizes optical imagery from Landsat 8 as well as Radarsat 2 where cloud coverage uh, permits. And the overall target accuracy for this data set is 85%. Uh, 
Uh, this means for uh, seeded forage and rangeland classes, uh, overall accuracy targets are much lower than 85% because it's an average across all the provinces and all classes. So my two study sites for my research, one was in located in uh, Brandon, Manitoba. It's a Landsat scene coverage, uh, as you can see in Manitoba, and in Lethbridge, Alberta. I collected data using a GPS-enabled ArcPad tablet. Uh, I collected data on class information, cover type, uh, dominant plant species uh, using a windshield survey. So I just uh, drove around in a car and collected data from at the field level. Some of my classes I used, uh, I mean, I basically simplified crops into one class and isolated rangeland and seeded forage as their own classes, and also included a class for range or forest and woodland because it does have potential to be grazed, as well as an other class which includes surface water, bedrock, industrial, and urban. The imagery data that I used for my classification, uh, I used three dates of acquisition for Landsat 8 for each site. Uh, these dates were chosen mainly based off cloud cover, but each site has a spring image as well as a late summer image. And the Manitoba site has a fall image and the Alberta site also has a midsummer image. I also used uh, RadarSat 2 images collected from July to late July, uh, which were mosaic together. Some of the phenological and vegetation index variables that I calculated from optical imagery included uh, NDVI, uh, NDSVI, which is a normalized difference senescent vegetation index, as well as a modified normalized difference water index. Uh, I'm also using tassel cap wetness as a predictor for plant moisture and soil moisture and uh, soil adjusted total vegetation index just to compare uh, soil adjusted vegetation index compared to NDVI. An example, I calculated tassel cap wetness on a site in Alberta. Uh, as you can see, do I have a mouse here? No. Oh. No. For the seeded forage class, it's much darker uh, in the spring image, whereas cropland classes are, have much lower tassel cap wetness values and rangeland is somewhere in between the two. So I'm using these vegetations to highlight the differences between the classes. So the classifier has a better chance of predicting. Uh, for phenological variable, I, uh, using an NDVI time series of the three images, I extracted metrics such as mean, minimum, and standard deviation. Uh, for this example here is the standard deviation across all three images. And as you can see in cropland classes, the standard deviation is much higher than in rangeland classes. I uh, use the random forest classification method, uh, which involves uh, taking all the optical and radar variables and putting it through the classifier using two thirds of my test set, which then outputs a classified map which is then fed into an accuracy assessment using a remaining one third test set. And from that, I'm reducing the variables to see which model uh, produces the highest levels of accuracy. So some of my results, these are very initial. I am in the results stage right now. So I just calculated these values yesterday. <laughs> but uh, this is a map of a section of my site in Lethbridge using uh, the three multispectral Band, or sorry, three dates of multispectral variables, as well as three dates of the vegetation and sea variables, as well as the phenological metrics and radar. And from this, uh, we're getting very high overall accuracy of 94, 94%. For the cropland class, I'm getting between 97 and 91% for, uh, sorry, cropland class, I'm getting 97 to 96% of producers' accuracy and users' accuracy. Uh, for rangeland, I'm getting in the high 90s as well, and for seeded forage, I'm getting in, in the 90s. So pretty much over, basically overall very good uh, results compared to using the crop classification results. Because I think it's simply because I am isolating cropland as a single class instead of trying to uh, classify all crop types, which is reducing confusion between the classes. Uh, 
uh, for Manitoba, uh, significantly less rangeland in Manitoba. So only a few sites which we focused on training, uh, training sample collection. But for this <clears throat> classifier, we use the three multispectral bands, uh, vegetation indices, uh, phen phenological metrics, and radar, and received overall accuracy of 88%. So just an example, I ran many classifications for each site, uh, 36 total classifications. The best single date classification, which used only one Landsat scene for Alberta was a combination of the multispectral variables, the vegetation industry variables and radar produced 90% overall accuracy. Uh, for Manitoba, the single date image, which produced the most uh, accurate and most, the highest level of accuracy was a combination of spring variables with 87% overall accuracy. And as you can see, as the more dates were added, the accuracy level increases. But for Alberta, with two dates, oops, with two dates, a multispectral variable plus vegetation indices and radar uh, was the best when used with spring and late summer variables. Uh, in Manitoba, it was the same thing, but using spring and fall images. Uh, for the three-date imagery, uh, the best three-date classifier for Alberta was the, a combination of vegetation indices, phenology, and radar. And as you notice, multispectral, the best classifier, I think that's simply to the random forest classifier overfitting. Uh, some next steps for the project, uh, once a model has been confirmed and validated, and uh, we kind of pick out the best results from which classifier worked the best. We're going to scale up the project to a prairie-wide project using provincial crop insurance data as uh, training data. And that's all. Thank you. Okay, so that almost concludes uh, the presentations. Uh, PCI wishes to acknowledge and reward these students uh, for their excellence in furthering the art and science of remote sensing. So I'm going to actually ask uh, Karine, Nilufar, Alex, and Emily to come to the front, please, uh, whereby there will be a small presentation. Uh, and, and we'd like to take the opportunity to, to take uh, a couple of photographs as well. In the meantime, so uh, everybody, um, thank you. Uh, I'm sure you'll join me in saying thank you very much to the four students for presenting their work. Thank you. Okay, so uh, first of all, Kareem. <laughs> we'll, we'll go in order of presentation, we may as well. You're about to shake somebody's hand. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Neelu Farr. Alex. Last but not least, Emily. Thank you very much. What's in the frame? There's a very nice certificate, and in the envelope, I'm actually not sure what's in the envelope. Free tuition for a year, who knows? What's that? Yeah, you did, you put them all down there. All right. Thank you, Andrew. No problem.
So in the envelope is a, a modest uh, financial uh, contribution towards their studies and whatever else. Um, so at, at this point, um, I will... Uh, <laughs> So that was, uh, hopefully you enjoyed that. I, I certainly uh, uh, enjoyed seeing the presentations. We've uh, been in touch with a lot of these students and provided uh, a lot of assistance. Uh, some of the people uh, within our team have been working with uh, Alex in particular and uh, Kareen to uh, make sure that they're successful in getting uh, uh, results out of the software and for them to you know, spend time on the research as opposed to you know, struggle with getting the processing done. The processing is, a, is the means to the end. Really what's important is the research that goes into uh, their uh, graduate projects. Um, so our next presenter I'd like to quickly introduce. Uh, this is a topic that uh, I think a lot of us are uh, certainly uh, interested in and uh, hearing a lot about. And uh, uh, those of you who are maybe lucky got one of these for Christmas, don't know. Um, but uh, our next presenter is Eric Apedale. Eric is, uh, he, he's a non-geospatial person and, I, and I'm, uh, uh, I, I think it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a great perspective to have uh, in this room. I think most of us in this room are uh, some, some sort of geo background. Uh, Eric is actually has a background in um, agronomy and soil science and uh, he can tell you more about that, but uh, he sees great potential in the use of UAVs, both for his business, but also to help his customers uh, do a, a better job at managing their, uh, their agricultural resources. And um, his, his talk is going to cover the operational experience that he has had working with UAVs. He's gone through the process of getting uh, the proper certifications and so on. And also he's gonna talk about the importance of monitoring agriculture with UAVs and, and the, uh, the method of, of, doing, by, of doing so. And really the, the key uh, part uh, that, that Eric's gonna cover is uh, how this technology, which is a, uh, a great new technology in our remote sensing world can help control agricultural inputs and make better decisions about uh, farming in general. So come on up, Eric. Why your presentation is buggy? I don't know why it's buggy either. Oh, there we go. Thank you, uh, Kevin. Um, yes, I don't remember agreeing to all that stuff, so uh, I hope uh, I hope I cover some of that information. Um, as Kevin said, I'm not a geo uh, science person. I'm not a remote sensing person. Um, I was listening to the uh, first presentation talking about uh, SAR data and I was confused because everybody knows that SAR is the sodium absorption ratio. Um, so fortunately I had my cell phone, I could look it up on Google to see what they're actually talking about. Um, so basically I'm going to talk basically a little bit about who I am, uh, why I got interested in UAVs, a uh, few words about maybe some cautionary notes about flying safely and legally, um, and how we started our project and some of the next steps that uh, I see coming. So as Kevin said, I'm a professional agrologist. I'm a specialist in soils and uh, crop production. And I also have a background in statistical analysis. Uh, my practice for the most part is focused on the use of organic wastes. Um, things like sewage, biosolids, uh, the solids left over from wastewater treatment, the use of these materials on agricultural land. So why UAVs? Why did I get interested in this? And it all started out with nitrogen. Um, biosolids or sewage sludge is highly in demand with farmers because it contains a lot of nutrients, mostly nitrogen and phosphorus, which are two of the three uh, key macronutrients that uh, plants need to grow. Um, corn production requires quite a bit of nitrogen and uh, with the biosolids application we can apply almost all of the requirements for the corn. The only drawback is that most of the nitrogen in the sludge is in an organic form and um, I was telling Kevin that 
uh, I had like 60 slides because I went through this whole process of explaining all the really cool stuff about the nitrogen cycle and the bugs and all that stuff. And I realized that you guys aren't really interested in that. And uh, I don't want to be up here that long. Um, but essentially, the organic nitrogen has to be converted into a form of nitrogen that the plant can take up, ammonium or nitrate. And so uh, that uh, rate of mineralization, the change from the organic nitrogen to the uh, mineral nitrogen, is highly unpredictable. It's dependent upon a lot of factors, but mostly soil moisture and temperature. So some years we may apply, apply sludge and you may only get 10 or 15 percent mineralization in other years you may get 40 percent mineralization so initially i wanted to look at being able to fly uav over a field and predict how much of uh, the nitrogen had been mineralized so then we could go to the farmer and provide him with a recommendation in terms of whether he had to add additional nitrogen and if he did how much would he have to add the alternative is you have to go out in the field and collect a lot of soil samples, analyze the soil, and you've got a very narrow window to do that when you can actually side dress or put on the additional nitrogen. Um, so it's all based upon the fact that corn, um, when it's deficient in nitrogen, it's not as green as corn that's got a sufficiency. So the leaves will be less green or more yellowy. So I have setbacks and it's kind of complicated, but um, the technology that we're looking at, like the uh, um, you know the the flight systems, the sensors, um, and I have to confess we don't use uh, PCI's products. Um, we're familiar with them, but if in order to make an investment, we have to be able to recover that investment, and it's very difficult to convince farmers to pay you enough to fly their fields in order to be able to recover that investment. Um, so things are expensive. We tried using a uh, converted uh, camera to collect near infrared, uh, just a consumer camera that had been converted to uh, get part of the near infrared spectrum, but it didn't work all that well. Um, there's a lot of things that are expensive that we just can't afford to do um, because we can't recover that from our from our farm clients. And it's you know as we get deeper, we find it gets way more complicated. But ultimately, our goal here is to figure out how to make this technology viable so that we can provide value to our clients. Uh, there is a lot of technology out there that's being sold to farmers, um, both really nice commercial systems that probably cost twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 to you know, the lower end systems what I'm flying. And they're being sold to farmers, but the people that are providing these haven't really figured out that uh, value proposition. So farmers will fly, or you'll fly a field and you'll get a one snapshot in time and people will try to make decisions based upon that one, one snapshot. And as you probably know, it's more important to look at you know, temporal variability, things that are happening over time in the field, as well as trying to look at some spatial relationships. And you can't just look at pictures, you have to collect a lot of other data to understand what you're seeing. So Kevin asked me just to say a few words about um, flying legally and responsibly. Um, there's a lot of people that are buying drones and, you know, especially at Christmas, there are a lot of came out. Um, uh, people got a lot of these presents and um, there's not a lot of enforcement of the rules. And I, I mean, I have competitors that have purchased systems and they go and fly and they, and they don't have insurance, they don't have uh, flight certificates, etc. And people have asked me, and they said, you know, like, why should we bother with all that? Because we're never going to get caught. And you know, my response is always that, you know, like, if we're looking at, say, uh, PCI software, why bother pay for it? If we can, you know, get a cracked version of it. I mean, we do these things properly because that's the rules and that's what we have to follow. Uh, I don't always agree with all of the rules and stipulations that are in there, but it's important to follow those rules. Um, so UAVs are regulated by Transport Canada um, under the aviation regulations. Um, there's different various levels of permission that you can get to fly. Um, essentially though, if you're flying commercially or for research, um, you either have to get a flight certificate or you have to fly under an exemption to the regulation. 
And initially I tried to fly under exemptions, but I discovered that there's nowhere in Eastern Ontario where you can legally fly under an exemption because you have to be five nautical miles from any built up area. And there wasn't any areas in Eastern Ontario like that. You have to be eight nautical miles away from an aerodrome. And every, every hospital, like in Elmont, there's a hospital that has a helicopter pad on it, and that's an aerodrome. So you have to maintain these distances. So, um, so there are processes that you can go through to be able to do it legally. Um, these are just some of the general requirements. You know, to be trained, have insurance. You can only fly under visual uh, line of sight, under uh, visual flight rules. You have to be able to communicate with air traffic control. Um, you have to have permission to fly over private property. Um, if you don't have a flight certificate, you can't fly closer than 150 meters from people, livestock, buildings, vehicles, overpopulated areas, um, near large groups of people. You're not permitted to fly drones over national parks. Um, but the main thing is to not be stupid. And there's a lot of stupid people out there. There's uh, finally someone charged under the air, air regulations in Calgary for flying their drone next to the Calgary International Airport. And, um, you know, these are disasters that are waiting to happen. And UAVs are a really excellent tool for us to use in our work and your work. But if they become a hazard, then it's the regulations are going to become a lot stricter and more enforced. So it's important as we're developing these capabilities that we work within the regulatory envelope. You can get all the information you need about it from Transport Canada. So this is just their website here, um, tc.gc.ca, safety first. And the guys at Transport Canada are pretty good. You know, they'll talk to you and they'll talk you through the process um, if you're applying for a flight certificate. Um, they're very, very helpful. They really want you, if you're using these tools, they want you to be using them properly. So a few words on how we started. Um, just like a lot of people and started flying and probably wasn't flying within the regulatory envelope as I'll call it. So the next thing was to learn how to fly properly and did some training. Uh, and then we developed a bunch of accountability systems uh, so that we could demonstrate due diligence to Transport Canada. Um, so we developed flight logging systems, maintenance and inspection schedules for our um, vehicles, um, flight checklists, flight planning uh, tools, etc. And very importantly, we got liability insurance. Um, there was recently a situation in Belleville, I think shortly after Christmas, where uh, somebody th uh, flew their Phantom into the front end of a car on the highway. Um, so this is the unit that we're flying right now. It's the 3D Robotics, um, basically in their X8 mapping unit. So it's uh, the, the complete package is about $5,500 US. So that includes the, uh, the vehicle, includes ground station, includes camera and basic license for PIX4D. Um, just to replace the airframe costs, you could probably replace everything for about 1500. Uh, I've heard tell that the comparison between say a DJI system and a 3D robotic system is that DJI is like Apple and 3DR is like PC. And it is true to a certain extent. Um, DJI is black box, you know, like you get a unit and uh, it's all proprietary, whereas 3DR is completely open. Uh, but the biggest benefit to me for, for flying this unit is that uh, if I crash it on site, God forbid, uh, I can basically replace and fix anything on site. So we have a big investment in time just to get out and mobilize to a site and get everything set up and start flying. If we have a, if we have a problem with one of the motors or a problem with one of the systems, we can't fly, then that's a big problem. We have to go back and start again. So one of the big benefits is that we can you know, it's, it's relatively simple for us to keep it up in the air. It has eight motors on four axes. It's a very, very stable um, platform, and it, um, uh, it uh, can carry about a kilogram of payload, even though we don't, you know, our camera's not that heavy. Um, the PixHawk flight control system. If you see a lot of these uh, commercial systems out there, like the, uh, I think even the EB and stuff like that, 
they're basically offline on the uh, Pixhawk, right, the open source uh, uh, flight systems that were uh, developed uh, in the US. Um, so our max takeoff weight is 3.6 kilograms. We have uh, out of that, there's a kilogram payload that we can carry. We typically fly between five and 10 kilometers an hour. Um, it can spin along at 60 kilometers per hour, but um, it's kind of useless to do that if you're trying to capture imagery. Our typical endurance is about 15 minutes. Um, we collect about six to 10 hectares in a flight segment in that 15 minute time. And so it takes us about with the takeoff landing and taking images off the machine and changing batteries, it takes us about uh, an hour and a half to uh, fly 40 hectares. Uh, we're using uh, the uh, just a Canon point and shoot with a Canon hack development kit. The Canon hack kit just is a, is a, a hack firmware that um, basically allows you to run scripts on the camera and the camera then is connected directly to the autopilot. So the autopilot controls the exposure and the shutter as it flies. Uh, the GPS data from the, uh, from the GPS on the uh, vehicle is, um, is, as well as pitch, yaw and roll, is appended to the uh, met, uh, metadata of the individual images. Uh, we collect about 200 to 400 images for flight. We haven't optimized that. I think we can collect a few less, but we were collecting too few initially and then we couldn't get decent mosaics out of it. So we started to over collect a little bit. Uh, each of our images about five megabytes and it takes about four to nine hours for Pix4D to process 100 acres of imagery. Now we don't have the best computer, you know, if you had a bit of a faster computer, it'd probably go a little bit faster. Um, but again, Pix4D is not super optimized, so it's not really makes sense to put the fastest Intel chip and the, you know, just like gobs of RAM into the machine because it won't necessarily uh, speed up the process of PIX4D. So there's kind of like a sweet spot um, for it. Um, but it is, uh, as was mentioned, it is a bit of a black box, uh, like uh, photo scan. Um, so you don't have a lot of control over uh, what it's doing with the images. Um, we upload our, we store all of our images on the cloud and it takes quite a bit of time to uh, upload those as well. So there's a lot of data that we have and it's a challenge, you know, in a small organization like mine to manage all that data and to be able to use it. So these are just an example of uh, some pictures uh, and the mosaic and, you know, zooms in a bit. The, the software suggests that the pixel um, resolution of this is about three centimeters. I don't think it's quite that good, but um, it is fairly good resolution that we get from these flights. And the mosaics uh, that we get out of this are quite, you know, they are quite good. Um, we have experimented with putting ground control points in, um, but they are, they are hard to see from the, in the photographs, like you actually have to find them in individual photographs. So it took a lot of time and I don't think it gave us anything extra in terms of the, uh, uh, the ortho mosaics. Um, they probably would be, I, I haven't had an opportunity to do this because I don't have an RTK uh, system. I think they'd be useful to, um, you know, get better, more accurate uh, uh, DEMs out of it. So I don't know quite yet how accurate the DEMs are that we're getting. Uh, PIX4D, as you guys probably are all familiar with it, um, it, it is a very good product for putting these mosaics together. Um, you know, as Kevin was saying when we were talking about it, he says, but, you know, like we're not dealing with high quality photographs from a radar, uh, sorry, a satellite system or from, uh, you know, a very large format aerial photography system. We're dealing with, you know, a tiny little sensor, a tiny little camera um, and relatively small photographs, but, you know, we're flying close to the ground. Um, and PIX4D is pretty good at putting them together. Um, it does have a variety of outputs, as you probably know. Uh, we do get a license with the uh, that $5,500 included a basic license for PIX4D, um, but it limits us just to ortho mosaics. Um, it's, we have played around with it doing the vegetative indices and we have played around with um, taking mosaics from different of the same place, you know, over time and trying to overlay them 
it doesn't register them very well on top. Um, so, you know, again, Kevin was telling me about, you know, the product they're developing that really helps to register to put those pictures over top, those mosaics over top of each other. I think that's something that, uh, you know, I think we'd be very interested in having allow for that sort of temporal analysis that we want to do. So, I mean, our next step is uh, we're recruiting farmers to uh, who are willing to invest in this a little bit. It's it's a bit of a long-term proposition. Uh, there are companies that are selling systems to farmers, um, as I think I mentioned, and they produce data, but I don't think anybody's really really develop that value proposition yet um, and it to me it doesn't really make sense for farmers to collect lots of data and put it on their computers and make pretty maps and look at them uh, right now there's lots of guys that have bought combines and they've been convinced to buy the yield monitors on them and every year they generate very nice colored yield maps and they put them in the binder um, I think you know, I'd like to overlay that yield map information with, uh, you know, our aerial mosaics um, and, you know, put the soil information with it. Uh, we have soil chemistry uh, uh, data. Um, and those are the kind of relationships you want to look at. Uh, ultimately, I think, like, to me, the holy grail thing is to figure out the, you know, the figure out what we can do with those air photos so we don't have to collect that all, all that other information. Figure out how we can use the aerial imagery to predict outcomes such as yield. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's about managing the risk for the farmer in that sense. Um, how can we use that aerial imagery to take the step to knowing how much nitrogen is available in the soil without having to go out constantly and sampling the soils? That is that's a step that we need to take and it's 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 not simple and um like i was glad to see the the folks from carlton university because i've heard about them you know i hear this whispering about this gis group at at, at carlton and and i think i mean i was reminded in um you know in the one case and i can't remember your name I'm just gonna look down here it's andrew or something Anyway, the Alfred Bob guy. Yeah, Alex. What I was really thinking when I was listening to your presentation was, geez, man, like, gotta remember, like, graduate student labor is really cheap. I mean, <laughs> I can't imagine how much time you had to take to, like, scan those images and do all that manual rectification. I mean, I mean that that's really cool to do, but those kind of research things are important but what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to take that step to make it on the practical end for the farmers and you know it's very difficult because like i said it's expensive it's very time consuming and it's difficult to convince somebody to you know pay five ten fifteen dollars an acre if you can't guarantee that they're going to get you know ten twenty thirty dollars an acre back as a benefit from that investment that they made so we'll continue to work away on it. I have my contracts in sludge management that kind of subsidize this a little bit, much to my wife's consternation, but we'll keep working at it. And I'm really happy that Kevin invited me here to meet some of you people. I met um, Hari, who's uh, working in Nova Scotia, for, and he's from India, who's sort of developing some of the same kind of things I'm interested in. And, and, and those are the important synergies to have, is to you know, find you know, people with different areas of expertise. So, I'm grateful for this opportunity, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Or I'd be happy to go home to have a drink. <laughs> yes, cream. Pardon me? Well, we we have played around with ground control points, but um, one of the setbacks I have is I don't have access to an RTK GPS. So really, you know, we're using our uh, WASP GPS, and um, in the end, I found it was kind of pointless. And it, and it is, you know, we had we had our ground control points were, you know, about a meter squared, and still they were difficult to find in the individual images. 
So it was kind of time consuming and I don't think they uh, gave us better uh, mosaics. But I do think, like I would like to be able to use ground control points to really see how good the, uh, the DEMs are. Um, and also, you know, one of the other applications is to do volumetric measurements. And, um, you know, I'm not confident that those are accurate without having some sort of uh, ground control points on it. Pardon me? Isn't it? Yeah, and you guys have all sorts of cool equipment too. Okay, well, we'll talk. Yes. Do you use the model to derive nitrogen optimization from image rewards? No, we don't have a model yet. I mean, this is one thing I want to look at. I've, I've read the literature, I've talked to some of the researchers, there's some guys in, uh, I think at McGill, McDonald College that have been working on it. Um, and, you know, I'm really, the, the information that I've seen, I'm not really comfortable with it being that good. And it's, there's, it's so complex, right? Like, I mean, it's not as complex as phosphorus, phosphorus is crazy complicated, but I mean, we're not gonna have a one sort of relationship for all soil types, you know, like, You've got such, you know, so many different soil types. You've got so many different, you know, you know, little microclimates, soil moisture, temperature, all those things. So, I haven't seen it yet. No. We'll have to look at scan model. Who's who's uh, working on that? Okay. Okay. So that and, and I mean that's part of the thing too, right? Like we're we're starting to collect um, imagery, and uh, like this coming year, I'm hoping to collect at least fifteen hundred to maybe two thousand hectares worth of imagery in eastern Ontario, ideally. Ideally, I'd like to see, you know, flying a field twice in the season, you know, once when the when uh, nutrient uptake really starts to kick off and once when nutrient uptake is sort of at the maximum. So, um, I mean, like, I'd be really happy to find people that, you know, have stuff on the other side that we can put that together with to try and answer some of these questions. Great. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That, that sounds like a conversation that, that sounds like a perfect conversation to have at the break. So we'll have another quick little break and then we'll come back. We've got two presentations left and then we'll send you on your way. So uh, back in uh, 15 minutes. Thank you. 
Yes, I am just setting myself up so I don't have to do that stoppage again because my computer needs to be restarted. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, if I can uh, just quickly ask everyone to start making their way back. Uh, that way we can try to end on time. We've got a couple of short presentations left. So if I can ask everyone to uh, take their seats, please. Okay, we're going to get started with uh, just the last part of our uh, session today. Um, I'm going to get out from behind the podium because I'm sure you're sick of uh, having someone to stand there all day. The court isn't very long, but I'll do my best here to move around. Okay, well, I don't uh, need to introduce myself, I think you know who I am now. Uh, I'm giving this uh, short presentation here. And uh, what I want to focus on today is uh, customer support and our academic education, academic program. So I'd like to ask people in the room here what you think this represents. What does this data represent? Any guesses? I know you can't read the numbers, but what does that tell you? What is, what is this, what, what is your guess as to what this tells you? Sorry? Jobs in the federal government for you. Jobs in the federal government. All right, that's, that's a good guess. Any other guesses? <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to repeat that because it sounds funny. Number of ArcMath users here today? Or? No, over time. Over time, okay. Okay, so this is central to my message. Uh, and it's, it's what I want you to remember about this uh, short presentation. This is something that we at PCI uh, really are not happy about. What this represents is the number of posts and replies on our discussion forum over time, okay? So it starts in 1993 on the left, and it ends in 2010 on the right, and it peaks at something like uh, 800 or 900 in the good years in the late 90s, and then it dies right down. So this is something that we want to change, and uh, that's what I want to talk about here uh, today.
Okay, so the three key items I want to cover are number one, I want to impart to you the excellent customer support team that we have. Uh, I've had some comments already from many of you in the room about the quality of the customer support that you've had from our team. Uh, so I want, to, I want to just quickly tell you about that. The second item I want to tell you about is what it means to build a community and why we should do it and, and the benefits of that. And the third thing I want to impart uh, to you today is uh, the efforts that we're making towards building compelling materials that make learning fun and engaging. Okay? So the next thing I want to do is I want to tell you a story about me and customer support and customers in general. Um, the story goes something like this. Uh, over the last two, three years or so, I have made a conscious effort to lug around with me everywhere I go when I have an opportunity on a business trip my super heavy and cumbersome video making equipment. And the reason I do it is because it, it gives me the opportunity to interact with our end users, bring back the story of how they're being successful with our software. And so here what we have is uh, myself in a couple of different places. So in Dubai, in Boston, in uh, Lawrencetown, Nova Scotia, those of you who know about Cogs, uh, right here in Ottawa at Carleton University. And so uh, although this is a, a, a bit of a pain in the butt to carry around these big heavy tripods and cameras and stuff with me when I travel around, uh, really what, it, what, what is uh, important about it is the ability to uh, tell the story of how uh, customers are being successful with our software uh, around the world. And they really are. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. This is only where I've gone. Uh, a lot of people in the room who are here from PCI do the bulk of the traveling, I don't do the bulk of the traveling, and they meet with our customers around the world, and uh, they hear a lot of stories about uh, how uh, successful they are with our software. So the first quick little thing I want to cover is our customer service team. So I was talking to someone earlier today, and they couldn't quite recall the name, so I thought I would put them up here. Uh, and amazingly, it's a team of three people, that's it. They sit in a small uh, office space in, in, in Markham, in our Toronto offices, and they are probably the best in the industry. It's certainly the feedback that we've gotten from our uh, customers and, and some of the people who are customers of, of, uh, of our competitors, and they cons consistently say that the level of service, the speed with which they get answers, the, the depth that, that is provided in terms of the uh, answers that are provided, even you know, data gets sent to our customer support team and they work through a workflow, they find workarounds. Uh, it's just the, the leading customer service team in our industry. So the manager of the department is Ross Downey. Those of you who uh, have uh, interacted with our customer support team have probably got really long emails from Ross um, uh, with uh, some helpful tips. There's uh, Christina Abulas and Sarah Thompson. So, these three individuals are very passionate about making you successful, and it's what they do every single day. So the second thing I want to talk about is building a community and the importance of building a community. So as I, as I mentioned in, in the start of my presentation, we want to reverse the picture that you saw with the drop-off in terms of the uh, actual engagement with our with our end users. Um, why do we want to do this? Basically, we want to do it because we make tools. You use our tools, so we can't develop good tools unless we know how it is that you're using them, or what problems you're encountering, and what it is that you would like to see improved. And the number one way that we can do that is to stand up a place online, stand up a community, build a community where we can have those exchanges. So today is, a, is, a, is an exceptional opportunity to interact directly with you and have all those nice conversations over coffee. And we're all going to go back to our desks tomorrow, and then we won't be able to have, uh, have this level of interaction. So 
Um, this is this is really important, and it's something that at PCI we've dedicated a lot of attention to in the last couple of years, and most recently in the last year. And we want to, with you together, you can see the you know we, you can't raise a, a wall like this on your own. You have to do it together. So we're there with you. We put a lot of investment in, a lot of time in to make the tools uh, available in our online community. But um, obviously we can't do it alone. We need you to, uh, to join us. So uh, there's, there's one thing I'd like you to do or remember about this presentation is this uh, URL or this web address. Very simple to remember, support. PCIGMatics.com. I'd like you to head there today, tomorrow, this week, and register to create an account to become part of our community. What you'll find if you go there is a plethora of resources that are at your disposal already. We spent a lot of time to make the material available. We uh, we put our tutorials in HTML format so that you don't even need to necessarily go here. The search engine optimization from Google, if you're entering search terms, will redirect you back to here. So we we put all of our tutorials in HTML format. We, we've run some videos over the last uh, few years. We have uh, sample uh, workflows that you can work with, and and most importantly, there's the discussion forum that uh, we'd like you to join and to become part of our community. Another thing here is. Uh, some of you may have noticed if you've been to our website is we have this uh, online chat. So those three amazing individuals at Markham are standing by to uh, you know field your your request, and uh, they'll direct you in the right place if uh, if you need further assistance. Uh, but those are the people that are standing by to help you. So you can just head to our website. That chat window will pop up, and you can start talking to Ross or Christina uh, through the chat window if that's what you want to do. The actual interface itself is really fantastic. We're using an industry standard uh, customer support platform known as uh, it's, it's Zendesk, for those of you who know about this, uh, these things. So Zendesk is, uh, is one of the best uh, tools out there for doing customer support. And it's a great platform. We have uh, fully searchable uh, help right inside the, uh, the interface. So here I did a quick search for vegetation and it found 20 results. It can be a tutorial, it can be an in-depth uh, white paper, uh, you know, tons of resources are coming up. As you can see, though, the community search results are empty, which is not good. We're trying to change that. So, had there been discussions regarding vegetation in the forum, it would actually pick that up and display on the right. Some other things that we've done in terms of uh, making our software more accessible for students is uh, we, we've actually been very aggressive with our pricing. So we have, as you know, uh, the GMATIC Total Education Suite, which is uh, which offers significant discounts for education customers. We also have for students the ability to purchase a uh, uh, fully functional version of GMATIC for $150 Canadian, which is peanuts um, compared to the obviously the commercial price. Uh, so this this is available if you haven't found it. We have a you can basically go straight to our uh, education part of our website, and you can uh, provide your uh, student authentication information. Typically, they require that you scan your uh, photo ID of your, your student identification. Once you complete that step, you uh, pay the hundred fifty dollars, and then we give you a license in Geomatica. So that's a great benefit. It's maybe something that people didn't know about. Uh, we've had that for uh, for just about a year now. So, in addition to making the software more accessible from a price point of view, we've also dedicated internal resources to create teaching and learning materials, as I mentioned, that are fun and engaging. So, this is just a um, a diagram that shows the, the the way that we've created the material. We essentially have beginner, intermediate, and advanced level. And then at each one of those levels, we have labs, we have assignments, and we have term projects. So if you go to that support support.pcigmax.com website, what you'll find there is the beginnings of these teaching and learning materials. We completed the, uh, the initial part, which is the beginner modules. 
So you'll find quite a few modules there. Uh, you'll also find links to data. And the intent there is to make it easy for students to learn remote sensing and also to learn how to use our software. Uh, as Andrew mentioned in his presentation, to be able to give those students an opportunity to become proficient and develop skills that they can use to sell themselves to, to get a job in the workforce. This is just a quick example of uh, one of the tutorials or one of the uh, learning modules. I realize it's too small to read, but uh, so this is a, this is one of the labs. It's uh, I think it's a thirty or forty page document. It has step-by-step uh, -step examples of how to use the software, with tips on remote sensing, kind of. Uh, it, those of you who know the CCRS uh, learning tools that were developed for a few years, kind of in that style where, you know, concepts of electromagnetic spectrum, those kinds of things, little tips to uh, explain the theory and then apply the concepts in software with some kind of data. So that's all I wanted to cover. What I hope to do is to achieve this. I don't know if it's a realistic goal, but I would like to blow the, uh, the previous uh, numbers out of the water. Um, we can't do this alone, and um, we definitely need you to, uh, to join us. So in closing, go here today, tomorrow, this week at some point, create your account, and join our community. So thank you very much. Hello again, everyone. Thanks for uh, for sticking with us. I got to talk to you earlier this morning, and uh, now for the last presentation of the day as well. All right, I'd like to talk to you about the developer zone. Uh, so we hinted at uh, this this morning. Uh, Sean will be doing a uh, actual. Uh, live demonstration or showing what the developer zone actually is. It's an online resource uh, for you to uh, to get the support you need to to build and develop uh, applications within Geomatica. Um, but I want to give you a bit of a background of how this came about, uh, the platform that that uh, supports all of that, uh, and some of the tools that uh, that are available. So let's talk about the uh, the platform for a moment. Uh, the platform is uh, the developer environment, the software developer kit that we've now included with uh, Geomatica. This is a recent addition. It's built upon our expertise in the remote sensing software, tools you've been using for, for years. It's accessed through a Python interface. And what this allows is for subject matter experts to integrate third-party tools or build their own custom applications, custom workflows, and new functions, bring these into the Geomatica environment. There's four key pillars that are supporting this idea of the platform. Uh, we've got automation. We want to be able to automate, uh, want, want to be able to allow or help enable you to uh, automate your workflows and your scripts. Uh, we do this through the Python programming language. Uh, not everybody is familiar with Python. It's free to download, it's free to learn, and there's a wide variety of tools available online already uh, where you can, uh, can brush up uh, and a very active user community to support uh, Python programming as well. Uh, the second pillar is integration. Uh, in this case, we're talking about integration with third-party libraries. So by choosing the Python platform, we immediately have access to hundreds or thousands of libraries that have been created by, uh, by third parties uh, in support of this programming environment. So it includes, for instance, ArcPy from GIS with spatial functions. It includes uh, NumPy with uh, statistical functions that are available. It's all open source, and it allows you to bring additional tools and additional knowledge uh, blend them together with the PCI spatial expertise uh, in a single uh, environment. The third is the creation of your own customized workflows uh, and interfaces. Uh, so just as there are programmatic tools, there are also interface tools that are available in this way. Being able to build interfaces, being able to, to have an interface uh, or, or present a, an application uh, 
uh, with the buttons and the menus that, that you need that link to the underlying PCI functions and these third-party libraries. In, in essence, building an application in this environment with the power and the, and the scope of all of those other packages. And finally, extending Geomatica capabilities with your own functions. So just as we have over 550 discrete algorithms that are used within uh, you know, various aspects, we saw SAR, mosaicing, uh, ortho, DEM, uh, polarimetry. Um, if you have your own expertise, your subject matter, act, subject matter experts, you know your business and you know the science, you can turn uh, this into actual functions within the PCI environment. Uh, and that includes access to uh, the files at a, at a lower level, uh, import and export, um, and being able to, to link all of these things together. So we envision that there's, uh, you know, this could be used in so many different ways. We've kind of narrowed it down to, to four, again, keeping with the, uh, the theme. Uh, the first being a user or a customer uh, of, the, of the platform. So this is anyone who's already using Geomatica Prime. Geomatica Prime includes the software developer kit by default. So if you want to develop scripts or applications using all of these tools, you want to improve the efficiency or productivity, you have access already to those modules that, uh, that you've purchased or that you're already using. This is uh, sort of the, the first level. Um, it's uh, a personal use of the, uh, of the platform. From here, um, maybe you've developed an application for your team or within your, uh, within your company, within your organization, within your branch. You want to share this with, uh, with others, uh, maybe uh, inside uh, your department. Uh, you can export or you can uh, use the same applications and the same tools on any of the Geomatica platforms provided the licenses are in place. So if you've got the SAR module, somebody else has a SAR module, you've written a new application, uh, with uh, right at the Python level to automate some of your filtering or your polarimetric analysis, you can you can share that already with uh, anybody who has that Geomatica license and the and the SAR module, sharing your knowledge and the uh, and the expertise. The next step up would be the external sharer. So again, we're talking about uh, the use of uh, the Geomatica commercial version, writing and creating these scripts, but in this case, going outside. Uh, maybe you want to share these on an open source uh, forum. Uh, you say, hey, I've, I've created something here. Maybe it's going to be useful to you. All you need is this uh, script that I've written, this application I've developed, whatever it may be, and the Geomatica license uh, that, that goes along with it. Uh, this is completely up to the, uh, the creator of this app or the script, whether it's going to be uh, a free giveaway that you're sharing, whether it's something you'd like to commercialize. Uh, so as part of the overall program, we have some uh, some plans and some guides in place to help if you'd like to make a transition into uh, uh, into a develop active developer role. And maybe you're a subject matter expert, but your specialty is actually the development of these applications. That's where we've recently added a new uh, package, the Geomatica Developer Edition. So this is a lower cost entry for those of you who wish uh, only to do the development uh, of an application. It provides access to each and every module and function that we have within the geomatic environment, giving you full reign to test and build and create, uh, work this together, um, but without uh, the, the initial outlay of the full geomatic production uh, system, the commercial system. Uh, and the only stipulation there is that it is for, uh, for development. Once you commercialize, uh, that application would go to your users uh, and then they could uh, they would contact us for the, uh, the licenses and uh, again there are some business arrangements that uh, that we have in place and some guides to to help make this uh, transition or or to uh, take advantage of this for for everyone involved. So talking about the Geomatica Developer Edition, so the concept there as as I just mentioned, uh, all Geomatica users are by default developers uh, already or, or can be developers already, but not all developers want to be uh, commercial users of Geomatica. That's, that's why we've entered, uh, uh, added this new package. Um, so for uh, the people that are receiving these applications, obviously new capabilities, new opportunities, developers get the tools at an affordable price. Again, full access to all of the modules uh, and some, uh, some collaboration there between the, on the distribution side uh, of, the, of this application. Should it be sold to a, to a larger marketplace, we can, we can help with that. So as a developer, what do you get? Well, with the Geomatica Developer Edition, you get the software developer kit. Uh, so the tools, the resources, the documentation, and the developer's own access that, uh, that Sean will be showing you. 
Uh, and again, this is included with uh, with Geomatica Prime as well. So some of you are already in a position to take advantage of this uh, immediately. Obviously, there's the license right to use the Geomatica Developer Edition or to take advantage of the platform for developer use. We've got startup support that's available. This is above and beyond the fantastic support that Kevin already mentioned. Uh, this is uh, sort of a second tier specialist who can help, for instance, with, uh, as an example, debugging a Python script, maybe having some consultation on, on best practices, trying to get you guys up and running and, uh, and going with, the, with your own development tasks. Uh, you can see the rest that are, that are on there already. I know there's uh, quite a few words on this. We'll move to the uh, the live demonstration in a moment. Uh, in particular, at the end there, uh, the developer zone with all the great resources that you'll see. Um, I guess I'm uh, hitting this one over the head again and again. You get everything. Developer zone uh, and all of the tools and, and all of the functions. Um, again, just to clarify, so if an application is created, uh, and the, uh, the user requires additional modules or additional licenses. That would be something that is coming from PCI. The actual application itself uh, that, that has been developed is in full ownership, uh, IP and everything uh, belonging to the, to the developer, to, to any of you. Now, I mentioned it was a low-cost uh, entry. In terms of pricing, it's an annual subscription. Uh, this allows us to keep everything up to date keep the content up to date online, uh, all the packages, the support is included in that as well. So not only the 10 hours, but your regular uh, Geomatica uh, maintenance and support. And maybe thinking for those of you in education already, um, you know, how do I get access to this? You may already uh, have that. There's, there's really not a specific need for Geomatica developer edition uh, if you've already got the education license, you've got it already. With the exception of one or two modules due to uh, sort of external licensing, uh, again, you've got full access to all of this. You can enroll, register, support.pcigematics.com on the webpage. You'll be able to find links to the developer zone, get you in the right place, and start, again, uh, joining this uh, community of developers and, and sharers and, and subject experts, which, I mean, that's what we've got in the room here. Okay, so that's sort of the uh, the preamble. I'll just give you an example uh, of how this uh, how this could work, how we envision this working. This is Carl. Carl manages the stockyard. Uh, he needs to know about inventory: how much is in, how much is out, where is it being moved to within the stockyard, uh, and where is it going out. Um, so he needs a solution to be able to manage this. The work that he's doing is very time consuming. Uh, requires a lot of external validation. He knows he could automate this. He knows some spatial stuff. He's got a strong background here. So in essence, he is uh, already somewhat of a subject matter expert. In this case, we'd say he's a user. So this is someone who would need the uh, Geomatica license, not only for the development aspects, but also for the commercial uh, aspects. So by merging together the imagery and the software, uh, software we provide and imagery that he needs, uh, whether it's coming from UAVs, aerial, satellite, online, uh, hard copy, whatever it might be, create that custom solution. And ultimately for him, this is going to be about saving money. So this is uh, sort of a, you know, a, a one example at, at, the, at the small scale. But talking of scale, it does, uh, it does expand. If we're looking now at uh, many people uh, who need the same or, or similar solution, uh, now maybe Carl is an internal sharer. Maybe there's other people at the company with other stockyards. Maybe uh, he wants to license this to other companies to be able to uh, take advantage of that. Maybe Carl isn't uh, a developer per se. He wants to remain a user. Uh, maybe you're the developers. Uh, be able to build this repeatable solution, save lots of people lots of money, uh, make, make uh, money on the application uh, that you've developed in the process. There's a lot of opportunities and a lot of options with this, uh, with this platform. So the question is, what would you like to do? Uh, where do you see yourselves fit within this uh, environment? Are you Carl? Are you a user? Uh, are you building a custom solution? Um, do you see yourselves as uh, developers who are going to focus on the applications themselves, creating something new, bringing something new to the marketplace, integrating and bringing, this, uh, bringing these pieces together? Uh, so I'll leave you with that thought. I'm going to take, actually, if there are any questions now, uh, let's do that. Sean's going to set up for the, uh, the live demonstration, and then we'll, uh, we'll come back with a, a, a bit of a wrap-up. So on that note, right. I know, no questions. George, I know you had some, uh, some questions. I'm not going to put you on the spot, but if anybody um, uh, wants to ask a question, 
to know more about the development of the Yes. Um, how is it different from the Yes. Yes. Okay, so uh, the question is how is this different than the Florida CK offer? So the Florida CK uh, was an attempt at a, uh, for what? For an attempt. We had a um, uh, developer environment. So I think it wasn't quite a full developer kit. So we didn't really have the support and the resources and the program in place. It was uh, essentially a programming interface that would allow access. To uh, that function, it was prototyped. It was licensed completely separately from uh, any other model. It kind of, kind of sat on its own. In essence, from a historical perspective, it was a transition as we moved from the desktop processing into the full automated processing that you see within the machine itself. So the GNI developer edition and the platform itself is a domestic case. It's based on the desktop software that you're already using, uh, all the same functions. Uh, same interfaces, and with all that support that I mentioned, the documentation, uh, the online support, everything is online. We've also uh, migrated, for instance, uh, for the uh, last call to the So we've lower level functions that allow direct file access to the DVD. The DVD program is a specified which handles sentiments, database operation, and very low level uh, data into the software. That's all been moved over now to Python, which expands the use of that. Uh, outside of the EP environment, outside of the source of the environment, both of which have uh, overhead to action for the program perspective, uh, and bring that into the environment. Uh, so we, uh, so we have the Python environment or the general application, whatever it may be, just doing a quick uh, license check to the uh, software, and then running the CI function. Uh, the there was some uh, commonality in terms of creating your own function, and that was all in EPS. Uh, that ability still exists, but now it's much more portable. Instead of being only within our SDK environment, um, you would be writing Python functions that you can call again from starting uh, places or pathways and portions of the program. So, certainly, you can sort of the whole thing. But, yeah, they did. The SDK was big, heavy, expensive, and rather close, and the SDK is likely to quick and it's very, very open. Yes, another question here. Yes. Thanks. Kill the live stream. I'm just going to leave off the computer. So with the developer license, uh, every single module available within uh, the PCI software, the full suite, every package, SAR, mosaic, productivity tools, uh, pen sharpening, uh, EDM extraction, everything is included in the developer environment for, uh, for developers. So uh, should you wish to experiment, create, uh, build applications, all the tools that you need are there. And the responsibility then goes to the user. Whoever's going to be using this application that you've developed, whoever's going to be using it commercially, the responsibility is theirs to, uh, to make sure they have the correct licenses to be able to run that application. So as a developer, again, lower cost and, and complete freedom uh, in terms of what you would like to develop. Uh, and then we can work, uh, as I said, we've got some, uh, some business uh, uh, some distribution plans in place uh, to facilitate that uh, those users getting the uh, additional licenses that they need. Yeah, thank you. So that fire solid, like, is any license or is uh, like the product license? Right, so the question is, uh, is that an annual or a, a permanent license? That's an annual license uh, for the developers. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, this allows us to keep uh, everything up to date, make sure that all of our developers are working with the current version of the software. As we saw this morning, we're going to focus on aggressive innovation uh, not only has the uh, technology improved faster, our release cycle is short. So in the past uh, two years, we've had four releases 
plus the uh, GMAC uh, developer edition. Um, for those of you who are long-time DCI uh, users, you'll know that this is uh, accelerated from uh, from our release schedule in the past. So with the annual subscription, we allow that. Um, eases that, uh, again, keeping everything up to date uh, and uh, providing all the tools that, uh, that are needed. Okay, I'm going to, uh, if you have any more questions at the end, I think Sean's ready to go to talk about the, uh, the developer zone itself. Uh, and I'll talk to you in a few minutes. All right, thank you very much, David. So uh, basically, I'm here. I'm going to no more PowerPoint, so we're done with that. Uh, I'm going to show you. I'm going to take you on a tour of our developer zone, and I'm going to show you some of the capabilities uh, that we can do with our Python API. I'm also going to uh, basically just drive you through what we've been working on for the last uh, couple months to basically create useful resources so that you can learn our API and actually be able to develop some very useful applications, uh, whether you're just starting off in Python or whether you're an advanced user and want to do some advanced architecture work such as parallelization. So this is actually the official relaunch of our developer zone. So to access our developer zone, you can simply go to dev.pcigeomatics.com and then you can go to the developer zone here. Another way is from our website. It's our main website. And you go to resources, GDE, and then developer zone. So those are the two primary ways to access the developer zone. So this is what the developer zone is all about. It's a simple landing page that provides you with all the resources you should need access to our community so that you can learn about uh, developing with Python and Geomatica, as well as gain help for developing your specific applications or work within our community. So let's just take a quick tour of this developer zone. So the first thing you should see here is we have a getting started. So this is ideal, it's a blog style getting started tutorial that is ideal for people who are either brand new to Geomatica or brand new to Python or both. So we click here, as you can see, it's a blog style. It's really just meant to get people to begin what we say, I guess, like crawling with Geomatica. So just to learn the basics, the ins and outs. So it's everything from, uh, so we have our table of contents here. So it's everything from an installation, just shows you the steps for installing the uh, Geomatica with Python, which is really just the same as installing Geomatica. A tour of the development environments, uh, Python basics, so this one's actually kind of cool, I'm going to explain that in a second. Uh, developer resources, um, then we have some tutorials for helping you develop your first geomatic of Python script, so very basic, simple, quick tutorials, and then some best practices at the end. Everything here too, so majority of our sections, it's a mix of written and video guides. So some people we know learn better by watching, other people learn better by reading and following, and some people like a mix of both. So this is kind of one of the formats and styles that we've come up with that we want to be consistent with a lot of our tutorials and a lot of our material. So one of the things I'm going to go down to is the basics of Python. So this one's really cool. We basically had this Python introduction tutorial, which was developed by PCI. And the way we kind of look at it was developed by a beginner for beginners. So a lot of the times when you're, someone's building up resources, we often find that when you're developing tutorials for beginners, if you are a very experienced programmer with Python or with any language, uh, oftentimes you forget the struggles that a beginner goes through and you go too quickly or you focus on areas that you think should be very simple and basic but may not actually be the case for someone who's beginning and you forget the, tr the, the challenges of starting off with something brand new. So we decided to create uh, sort of a beginner guide written by a beginner, which I think is really cool. And we give you links to like other great resources that we found are very useful for us for uh, learning concepts in Python, uh, just as you as you go forward. Then uh, basically this video here, relevant documentation of resources, just same thing as a link to our documentation to useful resources that will help you along the way as you begin to program. This video is almost the same as what I'm doing right here. It's a tour of 
our developer zone. Then we have some basic scripts. So we have our running just a simple geomatic algorithm, just launching a geomatic algorithm in Python. Very simple. We click on it. It's just we have data package for it, explanation of the tutorial, and then it's within literally it's like seven lines of code that you're writing. So it's really it's got a full explanation of what's going on. So it's really uh, quite simple to to help you learn how to crawl. So with the first one you're like basics of crawling, and then by the third one you're crawling a little bit faster. And then finally we have best practice tips. And these are some very important tips that can help you build powerful scripts, powerful programs and solutions, but also do it in a, uh, in a manner that's going to save you time and save you effort. Uh, so I'm not going to go through all the details of these ones. So going back to our developer zone, we have documentation is now, all of our documentation is now online. So we have two documents that are useful for Python developers within Geomatica. We have our lower level, or our, I guess as David called it, our intrinsics functions. So this is for doing, if you want to build your own custom algorithm, like access the individual pixels and run your own routine through the individual pixels, which we call pixel-wise processing, or, access, or create your own custom moving kernel or window to do various analysis, you can access this API and it provides you with a variety. It's a little bit more advanced, so you should, if you're a beginner, probably don't start with this. Uh, and this, but this allows you to basically do you create your own custom capabilities. Then the other side of it is basically access to our geomatic uh, algorithms, or what we've also called our PPFs. So this is uh, similar to the online help that you'll get if you install Geomatica. So it's got all the different algorithms, so over 550 algorithms that you can access uh, through through uh, Python, so for example, Accor, and it gives you all the documentation about what the parameters are, how to set up the parameters, how to run it, an example. So it's just basic documentation there. Then we have our Geomatica cookbook, which uh, is basically just full of useful recipes. This is also a great resource if you're learning the Geomatica library, as it shows you how to chain certain things together, how to run certain processes. It's broken down by uh, particular function area, so like satellite photogrammetry, aerial photogrammetry. You know, for example, if you want to do batch processing, GCP collection refinement, it just shows just that little snippet. So it's easy for you to copy and paste it into your script, and then just simply hack it to get it to work with your particular uh, data or in your particular environment. And then uh, going here, so the developer blog. So this is kind of fun. Uh, this is really for us to communicate with you. So check here if you want to see updates about uh, what's new. Uh, this is a way for our programmers, our developers, our product management team, myself, to reach out to the community, let you know some things that we've maybe added to the developer zone or to the developer edition recently. So we did our first post on it just today, which is basically launching the developer zone. Uh, so thank you, David, thank you for doing that. Uh, it's got a link to it. So. Uh, this is just uh, an area for you to learn about what's new and what's happening within our development of our API. Tools and workflows, so this is something that's coming down the road. Uh, this is some, an area, it's going to be like a script or code exchange. Uh, for now it's going to be mainly stuff that we're going to put up, but it's a good way for us to create abstract, uh, abstract uh, layers in the code to say simplify certain things in our API or create workflows where if we want um, you know, if we have, say, uh, certain workflows that we want to expose to our customers that we think are really useful and can be used by a variety of people, we'll put them up here and you can quickly download them. And then we hope to eventually make this more of a community page where people can upload their own solutions and, you know, who knows where it can take off from there, maybe a marketplace, but that's obviously just me spitballing. So this is the areas that we've really, these three are the areas that we've worked the most on especially tutorials. So this is really the area that if you're, if you're really keen on learning development, this is where I recommend you, uh, you go. So this is everything from getting started to some beginner workflows and tutorials, showing you some very basic stuff to some a little bit more advanced workflows or tutorials to you know, some a little you know, advanced stuff. So 
I'm going to actually come back to this in a moment. I'm going to show you an example of a few of those tutorials uh, in a moment. So video, same thing. We have a playlist uh, with a whole bunch of our useful videos. So if you're watching, if you want to learn more about uh, the tutorials or learn more about the development and how to do certain things like integration with ArcGIS, we've created a variety of videos around it. Uh, we've created a variety, a variety of videos associated to our tutorials, and they'll all be accessible through here. And lastly, now this is also goes back with Kevin's message about support. So our developer forum is beginning to take off a little bit. Um, so we already have quite a few posts. We're, we're being very proactive in this, that if you post, we our goal is to try to get to you within 24 hours. Uh, so if you have questions, say you're a student, or if you're, uh, you maybe don't have the proper level of support, but you want to develop, uh, say you are just you just want a quick answer, this is a great way to go. So sign up to our support page, sign up to our forum, and ask through here. It's a great, and then if you know the answer as well, like it's meant for people, our community can answer other people's questions as well. So we really want to jumpstart this uh, this community, this, uh, these forums. So while this one is associated to the development, we also have uh, threads that are specific to other aspects of Geomatica. So back to the tutorials. So as mentioned, we have everything from a simple getting started to some beginner workflows. So our general tutorial tutorial workflow or um, format is all it's all up on the issue or off on the web. So we have a quick overview with a graphic to explain what we're trying to do. And this is the other aspect is that while we're also providing the written tutorial, we also have the ability for you to watch the tutorial. So I personally found that to be a very useful thing when I'm trying to learn something new and I, I like to read through the tutorial, but if I get confused at certain steps, then I like to watch a video of somebody showing me what they're doing in that particular step. So whether it's your, you want to use a hybrid of the two or you want to uh, work, you, you know, or you prefer watching a video first and then learning the specifics uh, in a written tutorial, this is kind of all set up for you. So we explain the benefits of the tutorial, prerequisites, things that we recommend you to kind of know or to have. And then really cool too, another thing we've really emphasized on was we don't want to put up any more tutorials without providing you a data package to work through the tutorials. So every one of our tutorials comes with a data package with the data to follow along step by step, as well as we also give you the download of the full script. So if you just want to run it and see what it does, you can do that before you follow along with the tutorial and actually learn how to build the code and what the code is doing. And then we go into the step by step. We try to break it down. We give you the snippet of code that you can just copy and paste into yours, explain line by line or at least important lines, and then continue doing that until the end of the tutorial. So I'm going to show you. So I'm going to show you now um, one of the tutorials that I is it, it's. We consider it an advanced tutorial, but it's actually quite simple. It's not very long, but it just requires a little bit of advanced knowledge of uh, multiprocessing. So the one I want to show you right here is basically in our advanced section, and it's parallel processing with geomatic algorithms. So what this allows you to do is to take some of our algorithms. Now, this is very useful for algorithms that are particularly uh, uh, not multi-threaded. Um, or if you're building your own custom functions, this can be a very useful concept to improve performance. So what we have here is just an example on one side where we're doing serial processing with just one data and sequence at a time, one by one, where we're only using, in this case, half of a thread. And then when I launched in multiprocessing and taking a batch and running the whole, you know, or a number of the uh, images at the same time, as you can see, it's now maximizing CPU usage. So same thing, we go through the benefits. There will be a video associated to this one, we just didn't have time to finish it. We got some prerequisites. There's a data package, which is the one I'm gonna work through. So you can download it, follow along. Explanation of the tutorial, the specifics of what we're gonna do. And this is really what it comes down to. So we have three images in the batch. So we have, if you're launching in sequence, and you're just a standard Python script, it's gonna run the first image, and then when that one completes, we'll run the second and then the third. Well, we're going to run image one, two, and three at the same time using that and take advantage of the thread. And you probably can't see this, but 
Our first one, or when we run them in sequence, it takes a minute 20, or sorry, uh, 121 seconds. And then when we run it um, in parallel, it took 47 seconds in this example. So you can see, you know, extrapolate that out to a large batch and you can start to see the time savings that you're going to benefit. And we go through here. So um, let's actually work through this. So the first thing I'm going to do, we're running basically just a uh, unsupervised class, fuzzy uh, k means classification on uh, three Landsat images. So here are the images here. And what I'm going to do first is I'm just going to launch. So in the data package, I give you both the script for running it in sequence and then running the same workflow with multiprocessing. So when I run this one, you can just take a look. So it's running the first process. And you can see that our CPU usage, well, it's not, not overly uh, uh, overly used at this moment. So we have, you know, it's down, it's using one thread essentially for the single for the single process. So maximizing really with this individual process, it's going to be using probably no more than 14% specific to the Python um, thread that we launched. So what you can do with the tutorial is we would be able to work down. So unfortunately, my screen real estate is quite limited. But as you can see here, we explain step by step. So we start off with just simply importing the necessary modules. So we have every step what these modules do. And we actually provide you with links. So you can click on a particular reference of a module, and it's going to take you to a link where it goes into the actual documentation of that module. Then same thing, we go in uh, number two. It goes further down goes to the next steps. And you can see we're creating a simple generator to collect the batch. So it shows you the code that you can copy it or paste it into there. And then basically explains to you what each line of the code is doing. And it continues along that approach all the way down the script until you get to the end. And then ultimately the products we're creating is, as mentioned, a unsupervised classification. So we're letting this one process. So the reason I'm doing this is I wanted to let the serial one process so you can see how long it takes to run this one. As mentioned, you can see it's really not using much CPU. So it's on its third process now, so just give it a couple more seconds. And then we'll launch the multi-processing one and we'll see the difference both to the CPU as well as the processing time it takes to run here. Funny when you run these things on your when you're doing practicing and you look at it, it's like, oh, it takes a minute or two minutes to run. It seems like no time uh, in a presentation, but when you're standing up here with nothing left to say while it's processing, it's, <laughs> it's kind of like, wow, that two minutes takes a while. Yeah, I know. I promise you that it's uh, there we go, finished. So I don't know if you can see this, but it took 167 seconds to finish this process, that batch. So I'm now going to run the same process with multi-processing. So the first thing, so you can see it launched all three at the same time. So the next, the next thing you can see is our CPU usage is way, way up. And if I had a larger batch, I could launch more. I could launch maybe, well, I got eight CPU threads here. So I could theoretically launch, well, I could launch you know, hundreds of multiple processes, but to take advantage of uh, the performance, I can launch basically eight uh, parallel processes with this. And then even in this code, we even go in and we explain to you some concepts about how you can create a simple manager that can look at how many cores you have or how many threads you have, look at how many images you have in your batch and come up with a good number of uh, jobs to launch in parallel. Now, I also just need to give you a little caveat or a little, um, Okay, so it finished, by the way. So that's 47 seconds to do this. So less than 
There's almost like one third of the time, which is kind of what we would expect for this kind of a process. Uh, so that is just one example of, anyways, of the uh, tutorials that we have available for you. So I guess what I really want to emphasize, the point that I want to emphasize with this is that we didn't just try to stand up content so that it looks full. We put a lot of effort into the richness of this content to make sure that it's very useful uh, for you. So the last, uh, the last one that I'm going to show you is a workflow that I built. Yeah? OK, was well, there? OK. I guess I'm not going to show you this workflow that I built. <laughs> There were, a, yeah, there were a couple additional questions we just wanted to uh, to get clarified. Uh, thank you very much, Sean, for the uh, <laughs> I should have brought my, uh, my hook or my crook or something, but that was good. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, just to, uh, to wrap up, so there were a couple of questions that came up after the, uh, the presentation about the developer edition. Uh, that I wanted to clarify. So one of those questions was, so if I want to develop with PCI, I got to buy a developer's license. I'm already a, I'm already a Gmatica user. Uh, no, you don't need to buy the developer requirement. Uh, the Gmatica, with Gmatica Prime, we have all of the programming functions are available. Uh, the only difference is, uh, if so, if you're already a Gmatica user, you can start programming and running. Any of the licenses, any of the packages that you're already uh, licensed to use. Uh, if you're not interested in being a commercial user for Geomatica or with Geomatica, uh, you still have access specifically to this developer edition at a lower cost to provide uh, access to all of those functions without having to, uh, uh, to buy the full commercial uh, software at full price, which as a developer you may not be using. So for many of you, most of you, uh, you already have Geomatica, you can already start programming. Uh, in some in some way, uh, should you wish to expand that, you can add those additional modules uh, onto your existing licenses. You don't need to, to purchase a separate license of Geomatica Developer Edition. Now, the second uh, question that came up was uh, uh, about the what, can can I actually process uh, imagery and, and is it fully functional? Uh, I made the comment that with the Developer Edition, you're uh, restricted from uh, using the software for commercial use. That's not a technical limitation. That is a uh, the software license agreement, the developer agreement that you sign uh, when you purchase uh, GMAC and developer edition. It uh, prohibits you from using the software specifically for commercial use. The software itself uh, will process and work uh, in the same fashion and the same capacity as the full commercial release. So that restriction is based on the licensing and the agreement uh, that we have between uh, developers and, and, and PCI. Right. Any any other questions or clarifications come up before we move on? Yeah. Uh, I, I just want some clarification. So basically, what you need is, like, for example, you could buy a uh, dramatic prime license, uh, but we can use it, and then we run doing this kind of development. And as long as we don't use it for commercial purposes, is that right? Ah. Okay. So if your question was, if you have Geomatica and you're doing development, is that uh, restricted for commercial use? No. So the answer is no, it's not. If you have Geomatica, the commercial version of Geomatica, and you're using the SDK that's already included, that is fine for any commercial use and development use that, uh, that you'd like to use. So the developer edition, um, again, is, is uh, really just a, uh, a lower price package for people who are not doing commercial use. If you're going to be doing uh, any kind of commercial work, whether that's development uh, or production or application, any of that, that's all great under the, uh, the standard commercial license. It gives you full reign to do uh, whatever you need, both for business and for development, and personal, and, and whatever you like. Uh, developer edition, again, just because of the price. Um, you know, to, to purchase the, the full Gmatic suite for five thousand dollars and then use it to uh, you know, as your as your company software uh, or your departmental software uh, that is that's not allowed under the, uh, the agreement. But that's why we already have the commercial version. That's that's uh, uh, provides that, that full capability. Um, and again, no restrictions on the, on the commercial version for development or for 
yeah, and, and the use of our version. Okay. Now I'd like to draw your attention to the half page uh, GDE promo card that's, uh, that's in your folder. This is not just uh, an information card that explains what you get with the developer edition, uh, although it is. It's got the information that uh, was included in the presentation itself. Uh, but if you look, you'll notice on the front there is a silver seal, and on that silver seal, you will see a promo code. So, this is a special thank you uh, for those of you who joined us today, uh, and only for you. This is, a, this is an exclusive offer. Uh, and if you call Freddie Bayam or email him, so we introduced Freddie this morning, he's our um, representative for, for the Americas, and he's, he's got a representative for all of you. His business cards are on the, uh, on the back table, or you can, you can contact him right now. Um, if you uh, contact him, you can redeem using this uh, program code uh, a exchange for a one year developer license. So, the GMAT developer edition that we've just been discussing for the, for the past uh, almost an hour. Uh, that promo code will give you a one-year subscription to try that out, to test that, to use that, to try development uh, with, uh, in this case, given that you're all uh, GMAC users, with all those additional packages uh, and see what you can do with them as well. Right. Okay. So, to wrap things up, uh, we'd like to uh, have a quick celebration. We'd like to mark this occasion. This is the official launch of the developer zone. Uh, all of this uh, support and the community and everything that we put in place in support of the development platform. Uh, we'd like to mark this as another milestone on our shared journey. Uh, and with this launch, we'd like to restate our commitment to providing you with the geospatial and now the programmatic tools uh, that you use in pursuit of your own successes. Uh, and finally, we'd like to, uh, to thank all of you for your continued commitment to PCI, uh, to innovation, and to uh, shared success. So thank you all very much for coming and sticking with us uh, all through the day. Uh, to innovation and to the future. Cheers. All right, looks like uh, we'll invite Kevin up just for a few closing remarks. Thanks. Yeah, I just want to thank everyone for uh, for spending the day with us. Uh, I certainly got a lot out of it. Um, as I mentioned uh, this morning, all the presentations are at uh, are, are on our website, uh, pcigmatic.com slash UGM2016. Uh, there's a few that we need to groom a little bit before we put them up, but they'll be up there probably by tomorrow. Um, so let's keep the conversation going. Don't forget, support.pcigmatic.com. Register today. Thank you. Thank you. 